Well, good morning, everyone. It is 8 a.m. on day last. Um, we have our usual day last agenda items as well as two salmon agenda items uh, we're carrying over today. Um, let me first go to Executive Director Chuck Tracy for any announcements. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so you're correct. We have uh, we have two salmon items to to conclude. Uh, we still have D5 open <clears throat> from earlier in the week. Uh, we're expecting some final guidance on that. Uh, we're hoping that we can uh, start off this morning with that, but uh, it's kind of nip and tuck. So we will we'll just uh, see what happens in the next few moments. <clears throat> um, if we can, we will take care of that and then conclude uh, salmon uh at the end of the day with the uh, uh, final action on the management measures um, if we're not able to uh start immediately with salmon then we will move on to our regular administrative uh, business uh, we've got an update on executive order 13921 we've got <clears throat> the continuation of legislative matters um, so we opened this up on tuesday there's some guidance from council to uh revise uh, two letters that uh, were part of that package uh, those have uh, those drafts have been revised they are on the uh, posted on the website and dropbox um, since there are some changes to the letters we will uh, reopen public comment for that agenda item to see if there's any additional comments on those uh, on those letters on the revisions to those letters um, and then uh, then we move on to membership appointments and operating procedures and future council meeting agenda and workload planning. So uh, so that's our plan right now. That's what I know. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, I haven't seen anything um, uh, definitive about uh, salmon starting off. So Mr. Chairman, at this point, I'm thinking that uh, we should uh, move ahead with uh, our uh, administrative matters, update on Executive Order 13921, and proceed through those agenda items until such time as Salmon is ready to come back, and then we will interrupt um, so that we can take care of that. We do know that there's going to be some, like I say, some uh, there will be some additional modeling needed, so we would try and give as much uh, opportunity for the SDT to take care of that before they come back for a uh, final action uh, later in the day. So that's my update, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. Any questions for Chuck on the update? All right, I, I will hand the uh, virtual gavel off to Vice Chair Pettinger uh, for agenda item H2. All right, well, thank you, General Nick. And, uh, good morning, everyone, to be last. And, uh, We'll get started here on H2. Uh, Jim, start us off, please. Yes, good morning, uh, council members and uh, Mr. Vice Chairman. Um, so this is an update on the executive order uh, entitled Promoting American Seafood Competitiveness and Economic Growth. Uh, it was originally published uh, last May, um, and it required in Section 4 that the council submit a prioritized list of recommended actions to reduce the burdens on domestic fishing and to increase production within sustainable fisheries, including a proposal for initiating each recommended action within one year of the date of this order. Uh, so pursuant to that direction, then last uh, fall in September, uh, you had your advisory bodies report and then drafted a letter uh, to the uh, uh, back to the Secretary of Commerce uh, with your recommendations, and uh, that letter is provided uh, as uh, attachment uh, two to your briefing materials. The executive order itself is attachment one. A synopsis of the content of the letter you'll see is in the situation summary on the on the first page. Um, items directly within the immediate scope of the uh, the, the council and the. Uh, and the Secretary of Commerce are listed first there. And the two that you identified in the letter were the mothership sector utilization issue uh, and non-trawl area management. 
Uh, then beyond that, uh, you also included a request that National Marine Fisheries Service contact the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service about reclassification of squid and sea urchins to uh, ease export uh, uh, regulations and, and processes and costs. Uh, you identified a number of uh, funding and coordination uh, needs uh, related to electronic uh, monitoring, which has been a topic uh, that may have already been uh, addressed at the previous meeting. Uh, groundfish trawl surveys and requests for full funding there, and the salmon creel survey uh, surveys and the need for some uh, leadership and coordination and funding support uh, for those. Uh, there were also a number of uh, recommendations you made around the uh, aquaculture policy uh, aspects that are covered by the executive order. Uh, in particular, there is a the order uh, includes in section six uh, removing barriers for aquaculture permitting, and the idea of a uh, some, a nationwide Corps of Engineers aquaculture permit, and then aquaculture opportunity areas are covered in section seven uh, of the uh, uh, of the executive order. So your letter had these uh, six uh, requests, mainly focusing on on process uh, around the aquaculture policy. I'm not going to uh, to uh, go into those. Uh, right now um so uh that was the that was the scope of your letter and then uh you'll be receiving a, a report from national marine fisheries service an oral report uh on uh providing some response i think on, on some of these other uh, areas that are outside the that mothership and non-troll area management issue so with respect to the mothership issue as you know that's you're working on that uh that's on the um on your year at a glance planner. Uh, at this meeting, you're also uh, been working on the non-trawl area management issue. Uh, and, however, that uh, issue has not been added to the year at a glance planner uh, at this point. Um, yeah, so I think that pretty much uh, concludes the, uh, the overview. Um, your action here is just to review the progress. It's sort of in the spirit of uh, the idea that uh, in the executive order that uh, the proposal for initiating the recommended actions within in one year and, and following through on that. So this is just a, a check in on that process. No specific action is is required that uh, that I'm aware of. That uh, concludes my overview, Mr. Vice Chairman. If there's any questions, I can take them. If not, uh, then we turn to the National Marine Fisheries Service next. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, questions for Jim on his overview? Okay, seeing none, we'll uh, look to NIPS and uh, Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, I will provide a brief update here on Executive Order 13921. Uh, for the priorities that uh, were recommended from the Council, uh, that are priorities for the Department of Commerce uh, regulatory action, um, uh, as to know that you got your council is already working up through these. Uh, and from NIMS perspective, we have, or we will uh, add uh, those to the unified agenda <clears throat> when the council takes final action. And appreciate that the council has, has scheduled these and, and has them moving forward. For the recommendations that are related to uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, in general, <clears throat> the recommendations that are that were made through this executive order to the Department of Commerce uh, for other agencies, those are being collated <clears throat> at headquarters uh, and compiled and, and will be shortly passed on to other agencies. Um, although I will note, obviously, the Fish and Wildlife Service uh, representative on this council is, <clears throat> was aware of this as well. Uh, when this recommendation was, was formed and, and went through and may have additional information. For the funding and coordination recommendations, uh, as you heard early, <clears throat> as you heard last week, uh, NIMS continues to prioritize getting all surveys um, back on the water this year. Turning to the aquaculture um, recommendations, <clears throat> For the Southern California Aquaculture Opportunity Area, um, the, uh, our, our National Center for Coastal Ocean Studies at, uh, with our National Ocean Service is working to finalize modeling <clears throat> and complete the draft atlas. 
Um, we heard a little bit about that at a previous council meeting that that draft atlas will go out for peer review at the Center for Independent Experts this summer. And we expect the final atlas to be published online this fall. Once that's published, NOAA will um, publish a notice of intent to prepare the programmatic environmental impact statement that will be associated with that. That NOI will also request public comment regarding what NOAA should include in the PEIS. And then, of course, once the PIS is drafted, that document will also be published in the Federal Register uh, with a review and comment period. So uh, NOAA will continue to announce these publications to the Council. As we've stated before, we would encourage Council review and comment, especially during these comment periods. Uh, and for that reason, we are striving to have the public comment periods for both of those documents coincide or overlap with future Council meetings. Of course, recognizing we can't completely control uh, everything about Federal Register publication dates. For <clears throat> the concerns regarding the, uh, the Corps of Engineers, uh, as, as Stephen noted, uh, Section 6 uh, of the Executive Order directed the Corps uh, to develop new nationwide permits for offshore fin fish and macroalgae aquaculture, <clears throat> in addition to the existing Permit 48, nationwide permit 48 for shellfish. So those have been completed. There are now three nationwide permits in place for aquaculture and the public can apply for, for one of those. Although to date, none of those three nationwide permits have been used or, or applied for in California. So if there are any questions and comments on that, I, I will probably have to just go ahead, collect those and, and, and transmit them to the Corps of Engineers. And that completes my update, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, questions for Ryan on the NIPS uh, update report? Uh, Pete Hassmer, Pete. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, just can you repeat those three permits that were available? I heard one, the macro algae, but what were the other two? Yes, to the Mr. Vice Chair, to take speed, let me. Sorry. Um, the three permits, so they, there was an existing permit for shellfish. That was nationwide permit 48. The two new, new nationwide permits are for offshore fin fish is one and macro algae aquaculture is the other. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Pete. Um, for the questions uh, for Ryan. Okay, thank you, Ryan. All right. Um, looking for some uh, other comments? Any guidance that needs to be provided here? Anybody think that? Okay. Seeing none, no. Nope. Pete asked me, Pete. Thanks. Mr. Vice Chair, um, I, I probably should apologize for um, dragging this on. It seems like there's no comments, but um, I, I do want to express a concern, and it, it's not with the letter and, and uh, that was put together. I understand what it needs to re respond to, but just in light of what we're going through, I, I have a feeling we're really missing opportunities to promote some of the promote actions that would help to rebuild the infrastructure for our fisheries on the West Coast, whether it's fillet lines or processing plants or, or ice and that. And as I looked through this, I, I went back and I reread the purpose of this executive order and, and you get to the last line of it and it, you know, through these various actions, we can protect our aquatic environments, revitalize our nation's seafood industry, get more Americans back to work, and, and put this food on the, on the tables. And it's all being taken through what I view are, are sort of indirect actions that we're looking at reducing some of the regulatory burdens. And it, if you think about what we did, yesterday in some of our work on, on the gear switching issue that there's an expectation that if we cap or we eliminate gear switching that that's going to lead to 
more harvest in the trawl fishery and that's going to allow the markets to develop and for a, a number of things to follow up after that. And we never have this opportunity to focus on direct activities that would help to re rebuild that. Um, as part of my research, I look back at uh, Salt and Stall Kennedy grants that were awarded on the West Coast here. The most recent uh, awards I could find were 2019, but I scanned about four years and there wasn't a single grant awarded in that category of uh, promotion, development, and marketing. That, that doesn't mean to say that there weren't proposals submitted that um, weren't awarded, but in at least four years, there was nothing looking at that. Um, in response to maybe the, the permits that are available nationwide, um, I, I believe this is related. Um, I don't know if others saw it, but when I was turned on my uh, Netflix account to do some streaming, uh, this show documentary showed up that was Seaspiracy. And um, what they were doing was going through and really looking for sustainable fisheries across the world. And as I went through that, and I hope I characterize this correctly, but um, the closest they got on the West Coast was even Oceana was thrown under the bus for their efforts working on the West Coast to develop sustainable fisheries. And the bottom line message in that documentary was, um, if you want to get to sustainable fisheries, quit eating seafood. And then they went into, you know, and, and it's certainly a good food source, but they went into some of the macroalgae and, and those things that are developed as protein substitutes rather than harvesting fish out of the ocean. So that's what we're competing against. Um, so here's this executive order that focuses on reducing the regulatory burdens. Um, and, and then there's other efforts out there to tell us not to eat seafood. So maybe the bottom line, I, you know, I'm, I'm rambling here, but at some point we have some language together or a package of actions um, that would assist others, whether it's moving towards Salt and Stall Kennedy or other grant opportunities or things that could be done or putting language in letters like this that indicate what's really our major problems on the West Coast, some of the loss of the, the processing infrastructure that would really directly help to rebuild the fisheries. So maybe down the road, we'll get some input from some of those marketing um, groups along the coast on how we might be able to be poised to respond and be proactive in, in promoting these things rather than, than being reactive and, and putting together what I view as a list is the regular actions or our day-to-day -day duties in the council of taking these actions and with the uh, maybe the hope that um, they're going to improve seafood production. So it's thinking about the future and how how we can be better prepared to get a, the message addressing some of these other problems that directly affect us. So thanks for the opportunity to state that. Well, thank you, Pete. I think you make some good points. Um, I see Bob Dooley has his hand up. Bob. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Vice Chair. And Pete, thanks for those comments. I, I really appreciate that. I, I would just wanted to note that I think it was a couple of weeks ago we heard a, that news conference by the Secretary of Interior, Secretary of Commerce. I forgot who else was there in that, that there were four of them and promoting wind energy around the country and fast tracking it in a, in a way and also funding it in a way that is, is alarming almost to us, absolutely on the West Coast. And so part of their conversation was, if I understood it correctly, they're going to make funding available to support wind energy at an 80% subsidy rate loans to, uh, to build wind energy infrastructure in the ports. 
at 80% subsidized rate, which is a lot of money being poured into that. And, you know, it made, got me to think about how much, one, how much they're pouring into that. And two, how our, our seafood infrastructure is going to compete with that type of flow of money coming in. And, you know, if it's teetering now, and we all know it is, that it could be uh, preempted and gone and not to come back because of the big influx of money. And it would sure be nice to have a similar flow or a request of that, since money seems to be flowing pretty freely these days in the, in the, uh, you know, from the government. So if, if that's the case, we ought to be making our case that we need uh, at least measure, measures to make us competitive to build our infrastructure as, as seafood back. And I would, I would agree. And I, I, I just wanted to bring that point up that, uh, and I don't want to waste a bunch of time. We've got a day ahead of us. So thanks, Pete, for those comments. And I, I support your, your thoughts. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bob. Uh, anyone else? Okay. Oh, uh, Marcy, let's go. Marcy? Yes, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, thank you for the discussion, everyone. Um, I guess I just want to acknowledge that in my review of our October letter, um, I was, um, I think, um, really um, happy to acknowledge all of the progress I think that's been made since that letter was written. I mean, it was only in October. And gosh, I think um, a lot has been done um, with regard to the content we identified at the time as, as being a priority for us. Um, we've made uh, progress on the two items that uh, we listed specifically as within our purview, um, the non-trawl RCA item, as well as the mothership utilization item. Um, looking at uh, some of the, the recommendations we had uh, for NIMFS with regard to um, getting, um, getting things back rolling, um, like our survey work that's so critical to our stock assessments uh, and our management. Um, I think we've seen a huge um, progress there with uh, regard to um, re, re revitalizing those surveys and getting them back on the water quickly um, while still maintaining uh, employee safety. So um, I, I guess I was um, feeling like we've accomplished uh, quite a bit um, in a, really a short amount of time in response to the EO. Um, I guess my question is for Ryan. Um, you've um, described some things and, and sort of ne next steps, but um, I think I, as I read in the EO, the request was for the councils to provide recommendations within 180 days, I think, of the EO. And um, then we'd kind of uh, report back on the progress within a year or so. But um, is are those... Does that mean that NIMS is not interested in us um, maybe refreshing our the content of our letter or um, just wondering what the council's role might be um, with regard to next steps? Right. Yeah, um, thanks, Marcy, for the question. Um, I, I don't have a, a specific answer from headquarters on that. Um, I, it was, it's my expectation um, that, of course, if the council wanted to refresh or continue to put forward recommendations that were consistent with this executive order, that NIMS, of course, would still take them into consideration. Um, at least that would be my expectation, but I, I and that, that's about all I can say at this point. Okay. Marcy? No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Marcy. Further discussion? Okay. All right. Um, I will look to uh, Jim. Um, since there's no action here per se. Uh, Jim, why don't you uh, round us out and see how we're doing? And um... 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. Right, I think we've uh, had our check-in here. You've had your check-in on uh, progress on items that are within the scope of the council uh, to move forward on, and and uh, you're seeing those moving forward. And uh, you've heard from Nashmi Fisheries Service on uh, uh, what they've been doing with respect to the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and uh, funding needs, as well as the aquaculture policy. I think that, that completes it as far as I can see. Okay. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, yeah, we did have some good comments there, I thought, and uh, something to think about as we go forward. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, hand the gavel back to uh, our esteemed chairman, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair Bettinger. Let me check in with Chuck Tracy to see if Salmon might be ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, uh, Salmon uh, appears to be ready. So if we could uh, move on to D5 at this point, I think that would be uh, help us get through salmon as quickly as possible. Okay, great. Uh, so we'll turn to D5. Um, we've had, as I recall, we had received some guidance from some management entities, but I think we need to go back to the state of Washington and uh, the tribal entities for their guidance. So let me confirm with uh, Robin that that's where we're at. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just stepped out of the STT room. It does look like we have um, guidance ready from a WDFW and uh, from the tribes and um, our STT chair should be walking into the room any second here to give you uh, their D5 report two. All right, well, um, if Dr. O'Farrell is with us, then um, we will uh, hear the SDT report uh, and then go on to, um, go on to the management entities. Mike? I see you there. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I, sorry, I was just dialing in and slow fingers. No, uh, we're um, very glad you're with us. It's a good <laughs> sign. Okay, thank you. Um, Yes, um, I will be uh, referring to agenda item D5A, Supplemental STT Report 2. Um, this will be very brief. Um, the one uh, change of note given the council guidance we last re received was that the Klamath River Falls Chinook stock uh, meets its escapement goal, uh, its 2021 escapement goal. Um, there were little to no changes for north of Falcon Chinook stocks and little to no changes for uh, all of the coho stocks. And um, that would uh, conclude my description of uh, the STT analysis. All right, thank you very much. Are there any questions uh, for Mike on his report? Okay, thank you very much, Mike. I don't have uh, any other, well, is there a supplemental? Uh, all I see is the STT report. So I don't have a report from the SAS. Uh, there is no public comment. So under D5, which is where we are. So um, at this point, then I will go to the remaining uh, management entities. Um, uh, and if, if uh, California and Oregon have any guidance, they should raise their hands, but I'm assuming not. So uh, Kyle Attix for the state of Washington. Okay, I don't see Kyle with us. That is a problem. Let's pause for a moment here and see if we can figure out where Kyle is.
Thanks, Mr. Chair. We'll, we'll uh, see if we can track him down. I did get notice of several minutes ago that he was ready. Um, so. Well, he, yeah. he is he is at the end of the list of panelists, um, but no microphone icon. So okay, I expect he either needs to call in or. Uh, perhaps we could uh, start with the tribal guidance and uh, allow Kyle some time to get his technical issues cleared up. Uh, that's a great idea. So, Joe Oatman, do you have some guidance on behalf of the tribe? I do. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, Sandra should have the guidance. Thank you. So my guidance is as follows. For the Ocean Treaty Troll Fishery, I provide the following guidance for analysis by the STT. First, uh, regarding Macaw Tribe, that would be alternative one, which is 40,000 Chinook and 26,500 Coho. Moving to QTA Tribes, uh, first would be alternative one, that's 40,000 Chinook and 16,500 Coho. Moving to alternative two, uh, that would be 40,000 Chinook and zero Coho. This reflects a single Chinook option of 40,000 across all proposed alternatives. The alternatives consist of a May 1 to June 30 Chinook directed fishery and a July 1 to September 15 all species fishery. The Chinook quota should be evenly split between the two time periods. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Joe, for that. Appreciate it. We're making some progress here. Are there any questions for Joe on the guidance provided on behalf of the tribes? Thank you very much, Joe. Um, and Mr. Like Chair? Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, if I may add some additional uh, comments to what I just provided. Of course. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I, I do appreciate the additional time that the tribes have been provided to make progress on salmon options, and I think we have a path forward. I understand there has been productive discussions in North of Falcon on trying to get to final ocean options. We appreciate the changes that uh, I understand that the uh, state of Washington uh, will provide under their guidance. Um, so the intent of these tribal alternatives uh, is to get additional modeling results. After review of those results, uh, it is my expectation that the tribe will be prepared to uh, offer a uh, final recommendation on D6. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, Joe, thanks very much for those comments. Um, I'm not seeing any hands for any responses so i'll go now to kyle addicts for the state of washington thank you mr chair and thanks again to the council for their patience over the past couple of days and for your patience this morning as i tried to get reconnected to audio i had the meeting up and just couldn't get reconnected to the audio portion i do have some guidance for non-treaty fisheries north of falcon which hopefully we can get on the screen so WDFW guidance for modification to management measures for North of Falcon fisheries as described in agenda item D5A, supplemental STT report two dated April 14th, 2021. On table one, page two, for the non-Indian fishery North of Falcon, reduce the overall non-Indian TAC for Chinook to 58,000 and for coho to 75,000 coho marked with a healed adipose fin clip and recalculate the recreational commercial allocation according to the FMP. Decrease the trade to 7,000 marked coho from the commercial troll fishery to the recreational fishery and 1,750 Chinook from the recreational fishery to the commercial troll fishery. New non-Indian commercial troll TAC of 30,750 Chinook and 5,000 marked coho. Split the Chinook quota for the troll fishery evenly between the May-June fishery and the July-September fishery. And change the landing and possession limit for the July-September fishery to 20 marked coho per vessel per landing week. 
on table two, page 10, the same changes as above for the non-Indian fishery north of Falcon, reduce the overall non-Indian TAC for Chinook to 58,000 and for coho to 75,000 coho marked with a healed adipose fin clip and recalculate the recreational commercial allocation according to the FMP. Decrease the trade to 7,000 marked coho from the commercial troll fishery to the recreational fishery and 1,750 Chinook from the recreational fishery to the commercial troll fishery. New recreational TAC of 27,250 Chinook and 70,000 marked coho. For the recreational fishery, adjust sub-area Chinook guidelines to correspond to the new TAC. And for the recreational fishery, allocate the post-trade recreational coho quota as follows. Nia Bay, 5,730, La Push, 1,430, Westport, 20,440, and Columbia River area, 42,400. And I'll just um, echo Mr. O Oatman's comments. I believe when we, uh, the STT models this with the um, options put forward by the treaty troll tribes that we will have a um, package that will be very close if not meet our conservation objectives when matched up with changes that are being worked on for inside fisheries right now. All right, thanks very much, Kyle. Are there any questions of Kyle? Um, okay. And is there any, any other action uh, under this agenda item, uh, Susan Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just, I, I, I guess I have a question for both Mr. Oatman and Mr. Addix um, for clarification. My understanding is that the uh, ad adjustments that have been made in part have been made to meet a revised escapement goal for Queets Coho of 31, of, of 3,150-ish. I was wondering if uh, either Mr. Oatman or Mr. Kyle uh, could could clarify uh, what the what if that is the case, um, kind of the basis for it, and provide a, a little bit of, of background. Um, I believe the FMP does allow this to happen. I, I'm uh, aware that the forecast for Queets Coho is well below the floor, uh, so uh, would like a, a little extra clarification if that's possible now or under D6. Uh, Kyle Addix. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Ms. Bishop. Um, the the escapement, you're correct, this should result in a spawning escapement right around 3150, which is below the, the FMP escapement floor. The FMP does allow for modification of that floor by agreement of the co-managers on an annual basis. So it is considering an agreement agreement from the co-managers to modify the escapement floor. The modification was intended to make sure that we are being consistent with the Pacific Salmon Treaty Agreement and an exploitation rate limit in all fisheries of 20% for the stock. So I think this modeling will put us um, right at that escapement level and right at the 20% um, exploitation rate ceiling limit from the COHO chapter of the Pacific Salmon Treaty. So. Hopefully that um, answers your question. I can address it again later when we move to final action as well. Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Addix. Um, uh, that does uh, answer um, that does answer most of the question. If you have the opportunity to, I think the l last piece of this is consistency with the rebuilding plan. Queets Coho is under um, a rebuilding plan currently. Um, and uh, my sense is that the, this move or the results of the modeling would also be consistent with the rebuilding plan. But if you could speak to that uh, either now or D6, that would be uh, helpful as well. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again, Ms. Bishop, for the question. I'll, I'll speak to it a little further um, in D6. The, the rebuilding plan did leave this flexibility um, to look at escapement targets consistent with the FMP on an annual basis. Um, so I do believe it is consistent with the rebuilding plan, but happy to uh, address it um, in a little more detail in D6. Thanks, Kyle, and thanks, Susan. Further uh, discussion on agenda item D5.
Uh, Robin, have we done our business here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, the STT has received guidance from WDFW and the uh, tribes, uh, so they will uh, go ahead and do that work. Um, I didn't hear any requests for any uh, special modeling, so they will uh, move forward with that. Um, it usually takes the STT around five hours to um, do their analysis, so um, we will let the council know uh, when uh, the STT is uh, ready to um, provide their analysis when that work is done. So with that, I think that yes, we've completed our work under D5. All right, thank you uh, very much, Robin. And thanks to the folks who worked really hard to bring us uh, to some sort of closure, hopefully on north of Falcon. Um, it's an annual challenge, I appreciate. So um, with that, uh, we'll move on to agenda item H3, legislative matters. And as a reminder, uh, the public comment portal is open if there's further public comment, uh, because we do have before us uh, revised, two revised letters, uh, one, to one regarding uh, 216A of the president's executive order and the other 216C. So let me go to Jennifer to bring us up to date on what we have before us on legislative matters. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. So as you just noted, we, um, we had, uh, the council had changes to um, Supplemental um, Attachment 3, which was a draft letter to the Department of Interior and Department of Commerce, and Supplemental Attachment 4, which was a draft letter to Dr. Paul DeRamus of NIMS, both on EO 14008. So council staff made changes to those um, letters and um, have provided Supplemental Attachment 7, which is the revised draft to the Secretary of Commerce, and uh, Supplemental Attachment 8, which is the revised draft to Dr. Paul Doremus. So I can go through the changes made in Supplemental Attachment 7. Unfortunately, it looks like Supplemental Attachment 8 does not have the, the changes highlighted in the new version, so um, I'm not sure how we want to to tackle that one. But first, I'm going to go through Supplemental Attachment 7. So um, basically, um, council staff added more detail regarding um, current bottom trawl fishery closures, uh, added details about freshwater habitat protections, and added a paragraph uh, added a paragraph about um, displacement of fishing effort by offshore wind energy projects, and then updated the map um, at the end of the letter. So if you turn to Supplemental Attachment 7, you will see those changes in um, uh, with new text underlined and old text crossed out. So I will stop there for now. All right, let me just uh, see if there's any questions from council members on those changes. And thanks, thanks for turning this around so quickly. Uh, Karen Braby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the quick turnaround and the improvements on the letters. And uh, since I made comment on this on Tuesday, I just wanted to say thanks and, and they look good to me. Thanks, Karen. Chuck Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, in regards to uh, atta Supplemental Attachment 8, uh, just to point out, the, the only substantive change was the addition of the second paragraph that starts, first, we note that to make fisheries and protected species more resilient, the root cause of climate change and ocean, ocean acidification must be addressed. <clears throat> so that, that's the only substantive uh, change to that letter. All right, Marcy Remco. 
Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Chuck. Um, I I just want to acknowledge the um, the work on Supplemental Attachment Seven and the improvements and the additional specificity, uh, and thank our public participants and advisory bodies that provided um, some very um, useful input. I think it it definitely um, strengthens this letter and I, I think it looks great. Um, on supplemental attachment eight, um, we had some discussion about this when we opened the agenda item on Tuesday. Um, I, I guess I would just flag that um, the additional new text in the second paragraph where we're encouraging NIMFS to emphasize to the executive and legislative branches that reduction of GHG emissions uh, is the way to increase resilience. Um, that's certainly true. <laughs> um, there's no, no doubt about that. But I just note that that's in paragraph two. And then I feel like the conclusion of our letter or the real the real point we're trying to make with this letter uh, really is in the conclusion where we think um, we're, we're thankful for the special project funding we've received from NIMFS to enable our work. And we then stress the importance of NOAA receiving budgetary and logistical support uh, so that we can conduct our monitoring and stock assessment work and manage our fisheries uh, toward resilience. Um, and we really stress the importance um, of us continuing our work um, all for um, the betterment of our natural resources and fisheries in, in the face of climate change. And so, I think what I'm getting at is now that I read the addition in paragraph two, um, I kind of take it as, you know, hey, we want to make sure that the first priority is that we tell NIMS to emphasize other agencies, you know, need to work on this. And then yet at the end of our letter, we're sort of saying, hey, you know, continue um, to fund our 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 basic work and, and help us do these things. So. Um, I, I don't I just point that out that um, I, I think if our if our message is really to support NIMS funding as the priority that um, the references to other agencies is somewhat uh, inconsistent with that recommendation. Corey. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I don't I don't are we in council discussion? I don't. I think we moved there and seeing that really big yellow arrow. I don't think we are, but the, uh, the I, I might have some responses for uh, uh, thoughts following up from Marcy, but and I'm just following up on Chuck's. I think I misheard Chuck, but you said there's only one substantive change to the letter and not bouncing back and forth between the two versions very well here, but didn't, didn't you add the, uh, wasn't there a change to the last paragraph as well about about the, uh, the the other the second part Marcy was just speaking to, and it, it was probably I just misheard that you said there's only one substantive change. Uh, Mr. Chair, yeah, yes, go ahead, Chuck. Uh, yeah, you uh, you are correct. I I uh, in looking at the uh, having to go back to the original draft. You're correct that uh, that uh, in the last paragraph. The uh, sentences regarding that uh, start in addition, all regional fishery management councils rely on NOAA's ability to conduct scientific monitoring. Uh, the, that that and the following sentences are also uh, new and uh, reflect the direction from the council to include that. Thanks for pointing that out, Corey. All right, thanks. And and I think uh, Corey, you are correct. I apologize. Um, yeah, at this point, we're um, presenting the uh, the revised drafts, and we can pose questions 
on the revised draft will come to council discussion after we um, have heard any public comment. Marcy? So are there any further uh, questions uh, of uh, Jennifer or anyone else on these changes to the letter? Um, all right, so have we received any new public comment request? Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, no, the comments that uh, we received have already, uh, or the signups are have already testified uh, on Tuesday, so we have no new uh, signups for oral comment. All right, so now we're back to, uh, now we're on council discussion. Um, so, Corey Niles. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And yeah, I want to echo the, the thanks that have been given to staff for the quick turnaround. And you're just trying to follow back up on, on Marcy's train of thought there. Um, and, and, and maybe I didn't follow it along, but I think the two points, um, and maybe not coincidentally, but there there's starting to be articles showing up in the news about the, the current administration's um, upcoming actions to address the, the 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 mitigation side of the greenhouse gases. You know, in the, the one I read this morning, uh, trying to warm up the brain was, you know, reminding us that, you know, if you know action's going to be taken, uh, hopefully. To, to reduce the rate at which carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are being put into the atmosphere. Yeah, even if we stop the breaks now completely, the are going to be in the atmosphere for hundreds, thousands of years, and warming is going to continue. So I think, I think there's, um, and if I'm not following Marcy's train of thought, I think I think there's the, the the two points I think we're making here is, you know, that's the root cause. That's one side of resilience. Um, is is the mitigation side the the other side of resilience is the ability to adapt to the changes if if possible. And so I think that's that's the second point. The conclusion is um, we can't do much about what's happened, uh, and we're going to have to react no matter what. And then and then our foundation for adaptive management is um, a lot of it comes from from the core work, the science work that. Uh, NIMS does itself supports for the states and the tribes and all of us. So that was that was my quick response to uh, to uh, I think Marcy's thought there. Um, maybe I got the, uh, didn't follow her point completely, but that's how I was reading this letter. And again, thanks to uh, Jennifer and Chuck for for the quick turnaround and responsiveness to our comments. All right, thanks for that, Corey. Further discussion on the letter? Any recommended changes? Marcy Remka. Yeah, um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Corey, for your response. I, I guess um, I'm interested in hearing other perspectives around the table, but you know, again, now that I read these two paragraphs uh, in the same letter together, um, one early on in the letter and then the second um, at the conclusion, uh, I, I guess I just feel like our, you know, our our normal behavior would be to support funding for NIMFs um, and maybe not comment on um, priorities for uh, others. And and I, I don't think we do that. I mean, I, I think the sentences are you know, not so clear that we're saying, you know, hey, um, fund work on greenhouse gas. But I, you know, I guess I, if, uh, it sounds like, you know, I'm probably in the minority here, but I, I feel like the letter is, uh, 
on more solid ground if we didn't include uh, the reference to the executive and legislative functions in the second paragraph. Colin Brady. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, I appreciate the comments and the and the train of thought uh, uh, that uh, Marcy has shared with us and Corey's response to that. I um, I continue to think that that acknowledgement of greenhouse gas emissions as being a primary um, leg of the stool, if you will, is important. Um, I think that there could easily be a, a very helpful transition sentence between uh, that one uh, in that second paragraph that says um, something along the lines of, you know, our council and uh, NIMFs in working with us, uh, working collaboratively with the council. Uh, does have a direct role in adaptation measures and the adaptive response to climate change is then the focus of the remainder of this letter. Um, so that it, and that was the end of, of that kind of transition sentence concept, uh, which would then um, acknowledge the issue, but then recenter uh, the focus of the discussion on what what is within the council's authority and primary um, responsibility. Marcy, oh, are you, uh, Marcy, so we have a suggestion. I think uh, a point first raised by Marcy and. And now, Karen, that um, the the mention up front of greenhouse gas emissions, over which we have no jurisdiction, perhaps uh, takes away the real thrust of the letter, and could be that paragraph could be revised to ensure that the focus is on the council's actions and work with NIMPS. So is there, a, is there any consensus on, on uh, revising that paragraph accordingly? Louis Zim? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I do support that uh, uh, proposal to revise that paragraph. I, I would like to point out that uh, our fleet in San Diego is having huge problems with trying to meet future uh, requirements from CARB uh, with old vessels that cannot um, install tier four uh, type engines. And uh, it's really a threat to our industry. So, um, and I also think that it's not the council's place to uh, advise on this uh, reducing greenhouse emissions. I think that is in the ballpark of other places. So um, there might be some thought of asking um, the government to support um, funding to find answers for our vessels to reduce greenhouse emissions. That's something to think about. Corey Niles. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Louis. Um, and I believe you were a, a active participant in the, in the climate change scenario planning workshops. And I think that would, if you didn't say that idea there, it, when it comes September, I think that's perfect. And you know, in that that kind of program come, could come through uh, Noah. Who knows in the future? But I was just quickly going to say that I think Karen was right on in, in her suggestion of a transition sentence. The transition and the point she was making was is the one uh, 
we had in mind and the one we included in our our, our WDFW letter. So yeah, it's it, it, the transitioning to that focus on, you know, hey, don't forget to, uh, the, you know, keep keep communicating. And NOAA does have a key role in in our in our in our government and in you know nationally, but internationally, a leader in 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 modeling the climate and and so it's it's perfectly uh, within their not NOAA fisheries necessarily, but the other the other parts of NOAA are, are very uh, are some of our greatest experts on on greenhouse gas emissions and their effect on on the planet. So I just I think Karin had it right on. What's just a quick transition sentence or two. Um, you know the remainder of this letter. I can't write out loud, but the uh, you know the remainder of this letter is focused on our ability to adapt and and NOAA Fisheries' ability to support that. All right, thank you, Corey. Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, had some trouble with my tech today. Um, I think I support your suggestion that you made earlier with regard to um, revising uh, the second paragraph. And I guess I'd just add specifically, um, I would prefer not adding another sentence, but modifying the second sentence in that paragraph to refocus it so that it flows directly to the content below. Um, I think the first sentence in the paragraph is, uh, is just fine, um, but it's the second sentence that I think um, would benefit from modification. Thank you. So we have one suggestion for a transition sentence and another suggestion that the, effectively that transition should happen in that sentence. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time wordsmithing this letter on the council floor, but um, there seems to be a, an agreement that paragraph two does need to be uh, revised in some way um, to maintain the focus on what the council can do with NIPS. So let me first see if there's any disagreement on that point and then see if the council uh, is willing to defer to staff to find the best way to revise that, that sentence slash paragraph. Or does the council want to spend more time on the floor discussing it? Uh, Karen Braby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I support uh, deferring to staff's best solution on getting this done. Uh, I think that we've uh, identified a, a gap here that there's a transition needed and whether it's in the second sentence of paragraph two or a, a third sentence is immaterial. It's it's conceptually, I think for me uh, that 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 transitions from greenhouse gas to the focus of the council and NIMS, uh collaboration with the council um, on uh, adaptation. That's that's the important uh, nugget here. Thank you, Butch Smith, uh, Mr. Chairman. I I, um, I think that's your um, best idea all week. Letting the council clean it up and. Uh, and and get it going i'm sure they're very capable of they've heard the discussion i'm confident that they're very capable of taking the comments and and getting it just right all right and uh, so that sort of seems to be the consensus um unless someone disagrees um so i i gather that is what we will do um i don't know if we need a quick response uh, following the remaining edits or not. Uh, let's see if the, maybe uh, Chuck Tracy has some input on that. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I, uh, I, I would hope that uh, the that, uh, addition of a transition sentence is not, doesn't constitute something substantive enough to um, 
uh, require a quick uh, quick response process. Uh, I would offer, I mean, as staff, we will uh, we will work with uh, perhaps Marcy and Karen to make sure that uh, they are both satisfied with the result. And um, we, we do have a little bit of time on this uh, on this letter. Um, there's no uh, particular deadline associated with it. Of course, we would like to get it out, you know, uh, fairly soon. But uh, unlike the uh, letter to the Secretaries of Interior and Commerce, uh, which needs to go out essentially tomorrow, um, uh, this one we've got a little time, so I think we can uh, work with, uh, with those council members if that's uh, all right with the rest of the council. I, th I think that... Uh... That sounds like an excellent plan. And I'm not seeing any anyone rushing to the raise hand feature to dispute that. So thanks, uh, Chuck. And um, we, we've had some discussion on the on one of the letters, uh, not much on the other. So is there any discussion on the letter on 216A, the one the letter that needs to be finalized and transmitted? Uh, very quickly. And I'm not seeing any hands. I think these were the remaining um, actions that we're holding over on this agenda item. Uh, and I, it seems like we have closure there. So let me turn to Jennifer and uh, see what I've missed. Yes, Mr. Chairman, um, you haven't missed anything. I think with, with these decisions, we can go ahead and uh, send these letters out. We will, um, like Chuck said, we will check with Marcy and Karen on the second paragraph of uh, attachment eight, but I think attachment seven is ready to send out tomorrow. Great, all right. Well then, that will conclude this agenda item H3. And we will move now into the next agenda item H4, membership appointments and council operating procedures and Mike Berner. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, council members. Good morning. Agenda item H4, membership appointments and council operating procedures. This is our uh, usual check-in with where we are with uh, appointments and our council operating procedures as of the briefing book. Uh, for this time around, we had no changes to council officers, members, or designees, and we had no nominations to advisory body appointments. So there is, there's no council business uh, that we came into this meeting with. Uh, we do, however, have a proposed change to a council operating procedure, that being council operating procedure 26 regarding coastal pelagic species methodology reviews. Recall in November of last year when the CPS methodology review came around, there was discussions uh, regarding this COP and the need to potentially update it and an assignment to the management team to work with council staff to come up with a proposal. So in your briefing materials, in your briefing book, under H4A CPS management team report one is a, a report from the team regarding their rationale for some changes along with uh, a strikeout and underlined version of that COP uh, for your uh, review. And uh, Mr. Alan Sarich is prepared to uh, give you a, an overview of that report when we get to that point of the agenda. So, council action here, uh, like I mentioned, uh, we don't have uh, any appointments that we came into this meeting with, but we do have that proposed change to the CO. Uh, regarding other uh, materials for your consideration here, we did get uh, supplemental reports from three other of our advisory bodies. Uh, we have a supplemental report under H4A from the SSC, uh, and that speaks to their review of the COP26 I just mentioned, and Dr. Galen Johnson is uh, with us to give that report. We also have H4A Supplemental CPSAS Report 1, again on COP26, and we have uh, Mr. Michael Gineski, uh with us to give that report. Uh, we also have, a, under H4A, a Supplemental GAP Report 1. Uh, Mr. John Holloway uh, is prepared to give that report. That is on a different topic. That is a bit of a follow-up from your business earlier in the week. Uh, under agenda item F2 on the humpback whale consultation is my understanding, and it's a recommendation from the GAP regarding representation on the ground fish endangered species work group. Uh, 
So again, your council business here is to consider changes to the COP26, uh, and then hear out the GAPS uh, request regarding ground fish endangered species work group and potentially take action there uh, as appropriate. Uh, that, that ground fish endangered species work group uh, has a meeting scheduled, I believe later this month. So that might be uh, something to take care of here should the council wanna go that direction. Uh, so I believe that uh, concludes my overview, uh, Mr. Chairman. Again, no appointments uh, other than to consider the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group membership uh, and then that Council Operating Procedure 26. Unless there's questions of me, uh, I would recommend that we move to uh, Mr. Alan Sarich to hear the CPS management team's proposal on, uh, on that operating procedure. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mike. Any questions for Mike? Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, thanks, Mike. Uh, and I should know the answer to this, but I'll turn to you because I don't remember it. Um, so we, in each, for each one of our advisory panels and teams and uh, groups that are formally appointed by the council, there are um, expectations uh, relative to uh, performance, behavior, uh, those types of things we recently, as my recollection is updated, a number of those uh, to bring them uh, more current with, with the council's expectations of people to participate in those types of groups. Like, if, assuming that is correct, uh, my question is for individuals that we may choose to appoint uh, that are not members of those uh, formally appointed uh, uh, or formalized groups and, and the, the appointments to them are, are done by the council. It is the same type of performance expectations, behavior, standards? Uh, do we have a cop that, that, is, uh, that, that would include the uh, individuals uh, such as we, we might be considering here in a few minutes uh, that are not members of of those uh, types of groups and committees. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Yes, you are correct that we did revise our COPs regarding conduct, uh, but you're also correct that my understanding is that the, the bulk, if not all of that language was specific to members of those groups. Uh, I presume you're speaking to the proposal uh, that came out of F2 regarding the ground fish endangered species work group. Uh, it's my understanding looking at that COP for that work group uh, and the terms of reference for that is that uh, what we'd be considering here today is a, a temporary assignment, a short term appointment to that group so that that stakeholder re group is represented on that committee uh, for a short duration. So. My understanding of that is should you take that kind of action here today, that person would, for at least the short term, be a member of that work group and subject to all of the conduct language in uh, COP3 in this case. Thanks very much, Mike. Any other questions of Mike? And not seeing any other hands, we'll move on to our list of reports. We'll first go to the CPS management team. Alan Sarich, welcome. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. So I'll be reading our report one and then summarizing the strike two version that we provided. So this COSA Pelagic Species Management Team report on membership appointments and council operating procedures. At the November 2019 and November 2020 council meetings, the CPSMT made recommendations about modifying the procedure for the council's consideration of methodology review proposals. The process is described within council operating procedure 26. Currently, COP 26 schedules the consideration of CPS methodology review proposals as a standing agenda item for the council's November meetings. The CPSMT notes that most years no proposals are submitted for consideration and the agenda item is canceled at the outset of the meeting. This results in a situation where council agenda planning and CPS advisory body meeting times, agendas and travel plans have already been set before knowing whether that agenda item will take place or not. The CPS advisory subpanel also made a recommendation in November 2020 
in which they requested that any modifications to COP26 include a clarified process for initiating review of existing methodologies. At the November 2020 meeting, the council directed council staff to look into the methodology review COPs for other fishery plans to identify sections of COP26 that could be made more consistent with the other COPs and to provide suggested revisions for council consideration. After conferring with council staff and reviewing the other methodology COPs, the CPSMT concludes that methodology review processes associated with each FMP are unique and should be designed appropriately to the schedules and natures of each FMP. The CPSMT recommends the council modify COP26 to require that proponents notify the executive director of their intent prior to the first day of the September council meeting for the council to keep the review on the November agenda. The council and advisory bodies would benefit from this new procedure by not having a November agenda item that is canceled with little notice time for discussion and recommendations when there is a review proposal. The CPSMT also recommends the Council modify COP26 to incorporate language that clarifies the process for initiating review of existing methodologies. The CPSMT offers a strike through version of COP26 which incorporates all these changes and that is attached to the document to the report in the briefing book. Um, so we made just a few additions. Um, the, the main changes made are in the, the objectives and duties section, and that's where we clarify the process for existing methodologies. And then we added language that the executive director needs to be notified by the beginning of the September meeting. Uh, we also made a few housekeeping edits here and there. Um, with that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Alan. Are there any questions of Alan on the management team report? Maggie Summer. Thank you very much, uh, Vice Chair. Thanks, Alan. And um, just to foreshadow questions and the other reports and again, get your confirmation here. Uh, could, could you just clarify for us again uh, exactly who the team means by the term proponents? All right. Uh, the the term proponents is well is this was already in the council operating procedure. We didn't change that part. We just continued using the same terminology that was already there. It is also in the the terms of reference for ground fish and CPS stock assessment reviews, which the SSC authored. So we're kind of assuming this is a well known term, but. The, the way the team views it is that the proponents are the people bringing the proposal, the, the people intending to, to use the methodologies. Thanks for that confirmation, I appreciate it. Uh, further questions of the management team. Thank you very much, Alan. Thank you. Now, go to the uh, SSC, uh, Dr. Galen Johnson, welcome. Good morning, thank you. Um, this is Galen Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission um, reading the supplemental SSC report. The Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed the changes proposed by the Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team to the Council Operating Procedure 26 for conducting methodology and data reviews for coastal pelagic species. Currently, any CPS methodology review proposals are scheduled on the November meeting agenda, and the agenda item is often canceled at the start of the council meeting since no proposals were submitted. The CPS MT revision outlines a schedule for methodology reviews that require notification prior to the September meeting so the council can consider their requests at the November meeting. The proposed COP26 revision contains the schedule and outlines responsibilities of the parties to conduct the review for approved methodology proposals. The COP26 revision also clarifies the process for reviewing existing methodologies. The SSC supports the proposed revisions to COP26. However, the CRP would benefit from clarification of the roles of proponents of a methodology review and the analysts who will do the work to be reviewed. And that concludes our statement. 
Thank you, Galen. Questions for Galen? Maggie Summer. Thank you very much, Galen. Um, can you give us a little more information on, on what the SSC would be seeking in terms of clarification of, of the roles? Sure, and I um, actually don't have the specific it's in front of me, um, but we had extensive um, discussion slash confusion um, that I think you're getting <laughs> um, about proponents who propose um, a methodology for review and the analysts who do it in that um, in some cases, it seemed like it was saying proponents when it meant analysts. Um, and as many of the folks on the SSC have been in the position of being the analysts doing the methodology, um, you know, they, they don't want to be seen as, as pushing a policy position. They're just doing the work. Um, so, and as um, Ellen pointed out, the SSC did write the terms of reference and, and probably could clarify its own language in places as well. So we don't push that responsibility only on other people. <laughs> Great, thank you very much. Uh, further questions of the SSC? Thank you, Galen. We now will hear from the CPSAS, Mike Okoneski. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair and council members. Um, can you hear me okay? Absolutely, good morning. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm fighting a little bit of pollen congestion here, so forgive me. It, I'll be reading from agenda item H4A, Supplemental CPSAS Report 1, Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel Report on Membership Appointments and Council Operating Procedures. The Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel attended a joint webinar with the Coastal Pelagic manage, Species Management Team to discuss the proposed revisions to Council Operating Procedure 26, which incorporates language to include a process for initiating reviews of, ex of existing as well as new methodologies. The CPSAS welcomes the additional proposed language as it now provides clarity on requesting a review of existing methods, such as our September 20, 2020 recommendation for a methodology review of a sardine habitat model and our April 2020 recommendations on research needs related to Pacific sardine stock structure. The CPSAS supports the CPSMT strike through version of Council Operating Procedure 26. The one suggestion we have is to clarify the term proponents in the scheduled September activity box, i.e. is proponent defined as the requester or the entity whose method is proposed for review. Thank you for your consideration of these comments. Thank you. Thanks very much, Mike. Are there questions of Mike? All right, thank you very much, Mike. Uh, now we'll have the gap report, uh, John Holloway. Can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. Our reading from agenda item 84A, supplemental gap report one. The ground fish advisory sub panel appreciates the thoughtful Pacific Fishery Management Council discussion under agenda item H2 about our recommendation to add a gap C to the ground fish endangered species work group, GESW. The intent of our recommendation was for a gap C to be created and that an industry representative who is best fit for the current priorities being addressed would occupy that seat at GESW meetings. As envisioned by the GAP, 
that industry person might or might not be a GAP member depending on expertise, experience, and availability. Our recommendation was based on our experience with the stock assessment review panel process where the GAP representative has been either a GAP member or GAP representative, whichever was the best fit. As for stock assessment review panels, the GAP chair would recommend an individual to serve on the GSW for consideration and appointment by the council. In the current situation, the priority issue to be addressed by GSW at their April 26, 28, 2021 meeting are the terms and conditions required under the current humpback whale biological opinion. The National Marine Fisheries Service also identified this as a priority in their presentation to the council under agenda item H2. The primary gear potentially affected by new management measures would be fixed gear, which means the GAP representative should have knowledge and experience with the use of this gear. This would include open access and limited entry, fixed gear, trawl, and gear switchers. The GAP discussed individuals to recommend to the council taking into account the priority issue, that is, unpack well terms and conditions, and the necessary experience and expertise that would best provide meaningful input to the GESW. Based on this discussion, the GAP recommends Mr. Bob Etter be considered to represent the GAP on the GESW at their upcoming meeting. Mr. Etter owns and operates FB Dimmy Boy, has fished with bot gear for over 40 years and has experience with longline gear. He currently participates in the fixed gear limited entry fishery with bots, as well as using bot gear in the trawl individual quota share fishery. Mr. Etter also has extensive experience with monitoring programs in these fisheries via both observers and electronic monitoring. He has served as an industry representative in an Oregon working group of scientists, agency staff, and industry focused on whale entanglement and season and gear modifications in the Dungeness crab fishery. He has served on the Tri-State Dungeness Crab Committee since its inception. Finally, Mr. Etter also has more than 20 years of direct on the grounds experience in collaborative research with scientists from universities and management agencies. That completes the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Are there questions of John on the GAP report? Uh, Maggie Summer, please. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, John, for the GAP report. Um, John, uh, were there, when you discussed uh, a representative to the work group uh, for the upcoming April meeting, were there GAP members who were interested in, in taking on that role? Uh, Mr. Chair and uh, Maggie, we did have a discussion about who to, who to have in the seat and the discussion took place with, I announced that we had one outside volunteer, but that GAP members 
would have priority if any of them wished to take that seat. And the completion of that was no GAP members came forward and there was unanimous support from the GAP for Mr. Edder. Thank you very much. Dorsey. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Holloway. Um, I think one thing that is uh, somewhat um, complex about this particular issue is that we're talking uh, first about a temporary appointment that basically will last the span of one meeting of the ESA work group, uh, the upcoming meeting in April, which is um, quite uh, different from, I think, the, the longer term ask of the gap, which was for a, an actual seat that would be uh, established for gap purposes um, as modified by the COP of the ESA work group. So um, I guess with regard to the particular, the appointment for this short term stint that would be a, um, a, a council uh, appointment to serve just for this one meeting. Um, it was my understanding from a discussion this morning in the California delegation that um, other GAP folks um, that may have been qualified to serve uh, have the right expertise, what have you, um, had other conflicts. Um, so maybe you can speak to that for us. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Remco, our intent on the gap is to have the seat be permanent, but not the assigned individual necessarily. We would like the flexibility of of replacing the person with a different individual, depending on what the agenda was at any given meeting of the uh, of the GESW. Thank you, John. Any further questions on the GAP report? Thank you, John. Uh, that concludes uh, all of our reports. I don't see any requests for public comment. So that will take us to uh, council discussion and action. Um, we fundamentally have two issues before us. One has to do with uh, COP26, and the other has to do with the upcoming meeting of the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group. So, with that, let's see if why don't we take those in order or whatever order folks want. Go ahead, Maggie. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I was going to go in order and. Uh, make some comments on the first bullet there. Uh, I think that uh, what we should do is um, consider any long-term changes to the uh, uh, seats on the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group uh, in June, or beginning in June, as we consider uh, our suite of membership changes, membership appointments, um, and today limit council, uh, potential council appointment to that work group just for the upcoming April meeting on a short-term basis. Um, and I would support the GAPS recommendation of Mr. Bob Etter, uh, noting the, the uh, discussion we had, the responses John just provided, and the, the um, information on, on Bob's qualifications provided in the GAP report. Great. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, further Discussion on our first bullet there. Marcy Remco. 
Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to um, fully support Maggie's uh, remarks on this uh, temporary appointment of Mr. Bob Etter. Um, I know our California folks felt like he was uh, extremely qualified and given the content of the agenda in the upcoming work group meeting, uh, he is uh, the right person for the job in their view. So um, passing those comments on and support this temporary appointment. Uh, thank you, Marcy. Phil Anderson, followed by Brad. I would, con I would concur with both Marcy and Maggie's remarks. All right, uh, Brad, followed by Louis Zim. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gerolnik. Um I've known Bob for over 30 years, um, and uh, he's just an outstanding individual to represent uh, the, that fixed gear uh, fishery, both the uh, for sable fish uh, pot um, and the uh, uh, Dungeons crab fishery. I mean, he's uh, he's about as good as it gets. Um, he served on the FHRC uh, with me um, uh, for a number of years um, and just did a fantastic job. So I think. Uh, the gap was uh, wise and, uh, and they picked the right guy. Thank you. Uh, Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I also uh, support this uh, direction that we're taking here. And I, I'd like to note that even though the council does not work with the Dungeness crab uh, fishery, that uh, the information that Bob could bring in uh, from his involvement on the Tri-State Dungeness Crab Committee uh, would, be, would be really, really helpful. I know there are other people that have been on this committee that have been involved, but uh, nobody that's actually from the actual uh, fishing fleet. So I, I think this is a really good way to go. I know when uh, others of us in the gap uh, were brought into the um, assessment process that the people on that committee really appreciated our input and it helped clarify a lot of issues. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Louis. Uh, Brad, do you have a further comment? Your hand is up. Heather Hall. Good morning. Thank you, Chair Grelnick. Um, I don't want to belabor this, but also want to um, share my support for um, the approach that we're taking here with this appointment specifically for the April meeting and um, support for um, appointing uh, Bob Etter. And for, for many of the reasons that Louie just mentioned, uh, work on the Tri-State Dungeness Crab Committee and the linkages there, I, I just, uh, I think it will uh, help the discussion in, in April. And so um, just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. So this is a council appointment. We typically do those by motion. So would someone like to offer a motion? Maggie Summer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I was not anticipating a motion, so had not sent one to Sandra, but it should be short or Chris, whoever's behind the, the curtain there. If you're ready, I move the council appoint Mr. Bob Etter as uh, a gap Pardon me, could you back up and replace A with the representative I'm sorry, I'm not good at this on the fly. Let's go back, uh, let's delete and go back to after editor. Yep, starting there, let's say to represent the gap. Perfect, thank you. Yep, good to delete gap also. Oh no, you're there, good. Uh, to represent the gap on the ground fish endangered species work group. At the 
G E S W April 2021 meeting. I think that looks good to me. All right, so if that looks good to you, confirming the language on the screen, I'll look for a second. Well, a lot of names went up there, but Bob Dooley won the race. Um, please speak to your motion as you feel necessary. Thanks, Chair. Uh, I don't think it is, but just want to, um, first of all, thank Mr. Etter for uh, his willingness to, to serve in this capacity and also to uh, the council members for the, the comments they provided on um, you, you know, the, the benefits he can bring based on his participation in a lot of related uh, forums. And thanks. All right, thank you. Any questions for the maker of the motion? Any discussion on the motion? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, aye. no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you very much, Maggie. And I believe that was the only action we had under the first bullet, but if I miss something, I'm sure, I'm sure someone will correct me. So let's go to the second bullet, and that has to do with the proposed changes to council operating procedures. And I see Maggie's hand up, so I will call on Maggie. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I would offer a motion for this one as well. All right, please go ahead. I move the council adopt the revisions to COP26 presented in H4A, CPSMT Report 1, April 2021. And since you authored that language, I assume it's correct on the screen. Uh, looking for a second, I see Brianna Brady's hand up. I assume that's for a second. Yes, yeah, thank you. All right, uh, please uh, speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you very much to the team for uh, pulling together the, the recommendations and the uh, strikeout modifications to the COP intended to uh, improve the process for considering methodology reviews um, and give everybody a heads up a little sooner about uh, what might be taking place at November meetings. Um, as well as some clarification on the process for initiating review of existing methodologies. Um, the, and I appreciate the uh, uh, input as well and the questions requesting some clarification on some of the terminology in there, uh, proponents and, and roles. Um, I, I think that those are relatively minor. I feel comfortable that it is uh, pretty clear from what's already in the COP. You know, I'll note that in the, the team's report where they provide COP language uh, at the bottom of page two, where there's a, a few bullets. Uh, it, the second one of those says the name of proposers, including researchers who will participate at the methodology review and will be expected to conduct analyses during that review. Uh, I think that that helps address some of the questions that were raised, uh, but I would uh, provide some leeway to council staff if there's some uh, a some additional minor clarifications that uh, they feel they could provide based on the, the council discussion today, um, that that would be acceptable as well. Thanks. Uh, are there questions for Maker of the motion. Heather Hall. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't know that this is a, a question, but I just wanted to, I, I support the motion. Um, also wanted to say I appreciate the work that the management team did to propose the um, changes to the CLP language. Um, and also appreciate the input from the SSC and, and 
the direction that Maggie's going with uh, giving the council staff the opportunity to add clarifying language um, here um, to help the, the issue around proponents versus analysts. Uh, we talked a bit about that in our morning delegation meeting and, and uh, so just um, support that approach for this. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Uh, further questions uh, of Maggie on the motion or discussion on the motion? I'm not seeing any, so I will uh, call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion, Maggie. Uh, let me ask uh, the council uh, if there's any further uh, action or discussion on this agenda item H4. And uh, not seeing any hands, uh, let me go back to Mike Berner and he'll tell us whether uh, we've done a good job or not. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think you have done a good job. I uh, appreciate the two motions. Uh, we council staff will move forward with arrangements for Mr. Edder to be a short-term representative for the April meeting of the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group, and we will work to uh, get a final version of COP26 as adopted and posted up on our website for everyone. So thank you. I believe you've completed your business under H4. I also agree with Ms. Summer's recommendation that if we were to look at long-term changes to the Ground Fish Endangered Species Work Group, that we do that uh, at your next meeting when we're scheduled to look at the composition of all your advisory groups. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mike. Well, that will conclude this agenda item. Uh, we've been at this for a while, so we'll take a break until <clears throat> 10 o'clock, um, and then we will pick up uh, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, so we'll see you back here at 10 o'clock.
<clears throat> All right, it is 10 o'clock. And so we are going to get started now on future meeting, uh, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. And I will turn to Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this agenda item is intended to refine general planning for future council meetings, especially in regard to finalizing the proposed agenda for the June 2021 council meeting to be held via webinar. Uh, the, your initial uh, briefing materials were uh, in the briefing, in the advanced briefing book were a year at a glance summary and a preliminary June 21 quick reference. Uh, those are attachments one and two. Those have uh, since been updated um, with uh, information that has occurred during this meeting. Um, so the year at a glance is now supplemental attachment three and um, the quick reference is supplemental attachment four. In a few minutes, I'll go over the, the summary of changes uh, that's occurred in those documents over the course of the council meeting. Uh, currently the June uh, agenda is proposed as a five and a half day meeting uh, with most days planned for seven hours of floor time uh, or less in keeping with council practice for webinar based meetings. However, all of the candidate items are shaded on the year at a glance uh, have uh, not yet been scheduled and those uh, agenda items also occur in the uh, the uh, box in uh, in the quick reference uh, as shaded items there, uh, which are yet to be uh, confirmed on the schedule. So um, again, I will uh, walk you through the, those two documents briefly. Um, and then uh, we've got some reports from uh, advisory bodies and some public comments, and then we'll have an opportunity to uh, discuss and uh, schedule uh, our workload uh, planning. So uh, just real quickly then, um, Taking a look at the year at a glance, which is now supplemental attachment three, uh, not a lot of uh, a lot of changes over the course of the uh, council meeting here. Uh, the upper left corner there, the NIFS report under CPS was one uh, that the council uh, requested uh, we consider. Um, it, it is, however, still shaded, but it has been placed on the June agenda. Um, and again, this was to talk about some of the anchovy business, I believe. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, no, that was to be a to talk about uh, an opportunity for the uh, Southwest Science Center to present from information on uh, stock assessments and surveys. Um, other than that, uh, the, I think the only other actual addition is in November where we scheduled the tri-state enforcement report uh, under other topics. Uh, so, so not a lot there. Um, moving on to attachment four for June. Um, just a just a couple comments. Uh, as you see, we did add the uh, NIMS report under CPS in the candidate agenda item box, um, and uh, we've changed a couple of the uh, uh, time estimates here. Uh, one worth noting is on Tuesday, June 29th. It's a fixed gear cut share review scoping. Uh, we're having a little bit of internal debate, I guess, amongst staff about uh, the length of that. We originally had it for three. Uh, we were getting some feedback that maybe four would be more appropriate, but uh, but again, I think uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind what the um, what that uh, agenda item is about. Uh, so it's it's about the review, uh, so it's kind of scoping the the uh, the scope of the review. It's not uh, at this time about considering uh, actions the council might want to follow on about. So so I, I think if we keep it to uh, to just the scope of the review, I think we could probably uh, revert back to the uh, lesser time uh, time allotment there, three hours. But uh, but I guess we can have that discussion uh, when we get to council discussion and action. Uh, so um, that's that's all I've got right now. Um, so I will pause there to see if there's questions. If not, then we can move into the uh, management entities and advisory body reports. Okay, I'm not saying any, so Mr. Chair, it's back to you. All right, thank you very much, Chuck. 
So we have a number of advisory body reports here, and I uh, will take them in the order I have them on my list here. We'll start with the four state report from Karen Braby. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and I will plan on um, summarizing the report, which has been in the briefing book for a couple days, rather than reading it into the record, unless I hear otherwise from you. Um, and I just want to uh, acknowledge that I'm uh, presenting this report on behalf of California, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho uh, Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Uh, and there was a very um, good collaboration on gathering our thoughts uh, for this report. And so thanks to, to the um, folks who helped put these thoughts down for consideration today. And the report uh, really is a further documentation of the council's discussion in March. Uh, at the March 2021 uh, council meeting on uh, both offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity area uh, planning processes and uh, the webinar that was hosted by the Habitat Committee and um, both that webinar and the March council meeting benefited from presentations from BOEM and NOAA on those two topics. Uh, we did discuss council engagement in both of these processes at that time, uh, but the four states felt like we, we needed additional council discussion time. And so this report is, is meant to stimulate that. And to uh, uh, cut to the chase, so to speak, essentially we're asking for additional scheduling of council time in June to discuss that engagement and we provide a brief proposal of items that we think need to be discussed uh, and make a request to the executive director for specific um, analyses, suggestions on, on options and alternatives for, for dealing with that engagement. So um, pausing on this, this concept of engagement in particular, uh, we wanted to thank BOEM and NOAA for the wealth of information that was provided both in the webinar and at the March meeting. Uh, we view this as, as great outreach activity uh, by those two agencies. And, and what this report is really looking at is how to then turn that around into an engagement process where we have structured time for uh, the council expertise to funnel into those planning, um, those planning exercises, uh, a full engagement process where there's listening and discussion back and forth around the mapping uh, that is going on, as well as around uh, the potential impacts and concerns um, of our fisheries experts. We've included both the advisory subpanels and the management team expertise in, in our intent here. So it's broad. Um, and uh, before I get into details of the proposal, I just wanted to also highlight um, the paragraph, the large paragraph on page two, which explains our view on the roles, the current formal roles of council bodies in um, uh, connecting with these planning processes, including our ongoing expectation and role for the Habitat Committee in being point on essential fish habitat process under the MSA, um, our uh, IEA team and Fishery Science Center roles in providing excellent science and assessment work uh, commenting on climate change and our response to that. Uh, but that we don't have that same kind of formal role for uh, getting our fisheries experts engaged in uh, the planning processes per se. And, and that's what the focus of this is, is trying to really strengthen that. 
So we propose four different models of engagement for consideration. One is is what we uh, used uh, in part for the February 24 webinar, essentially leaning on the, the Habitat Committee to expand their role to engage in this planning process and, and council engagement. The second is to augment the Habitat Committee uh, with additional expertise. The third is to create a new ad hoc advisory body, uh, either by pulling uh, representatives from each of our advisory bodies or by creating a, a brand new panel of, of individuals who would, would, would help with this issue. And then the last is, is simply engaging all of our advisory bodies in all activities. And these four different ways that we might engage on um, offshore wind and aquaculture opportunity areas and other offshore development issues um, have pros and cons. And we heard uh, a number of comments from our advisory bodies already on, on potential ways that these, these different uh, engagement models or strategies could be used. All of them bring with them workload and uh, the four states acknowledge that um, both for advisory bodies as well as for council staff time, um, as well as for council agenda time and, and floor time. So with all of this in mind, um, acknowledging that these planning processes are going to demand our time, are going to take council resources, uh, we have a proposal for uh, the areas that need further discussion and further um, alternatives um, brought to the table. First is, is what I've already described, the advisory body models. Uh, the second is the proposal from BOEM on working webinars, uh, and that was documented in the email uh, exchange that uh, Chuck had as an attachment to the call of order um, agenda item for this April meeting. The third is uh, how we can um, how we can add this workload to council staff uh, and concerns about capacity. Uh, and then the fourth is is ideas about how to schedule this for council time, knowing that um, that floor time is in great demand and there are many competing, uh, needs for that council agenda time. So that's a, a brief uh, run through of the report and the proposal. Again, we're asking for time on the June agenda, which is already very full. And uh, one point for discussion is that that uh, potentially could either be as a standalone agenda item or could be part of the uh, already scheduled COP and committee uh, discussion that's on the year at a glance. So with that, I will invite the other three states to make additional comments uh, or uh, certainly revise anything that I've, I've uh, misrepresented here, but appreciate the consideration and the time. Thank you, Corin. Let's see if there are any additional statements uh, in the form of reports from the other states, and then we'll take questions on th this report. Uh, seems the other states have nothing to add. Are there any questions from the council on this report? Thank you, Karin. Thank you, Chair. Oh, and of course, as soon as I say thank you, hands go up. So we'll have Louis Zim followed by Phil Anderson with their questions on this report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just wanted to thank Karin um, and the states for coordinating this in depth uh, look into the situation and that I, I really appreciate it and I'm glad that it is uh, 
risen uh, to, to a level of concern for the states and appreciate their leadership. Thank you. Phil Anderson. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Similarly, I just uh, appreciate the states uh, taking this on, uh, bringing this forward for consideration. I was given the opportunity to take a look at the, an earlier version and appreciate their consideration of my uh, comments and looking forward to um, uh, moving forward. Thank you. All right, thanks, Phil. So uh, that will conclude that one report. We'll now hear from the Scientific and Statistical Committee, uh, Galen Johnson. Thank you, Chairman Grelnick. Uh, again, Galen Johnson of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission reading Supplemental SSC Report 1. The Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed future meetings and workload planning during their April 6th to 7th, 2021 meeting. The SSC proposes a new one new half-day virtual meeting for the SSC Salmon Subcommittee prior to the June Council meeting. This meeting would scope a proposed SSC-generated report as suggested in Agenda Item D2A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, to summarize and clarify the role of the SSC in reviewing and endorsing forecasts and management models used in salmon management as described in the fishery management plan. The SSC notes the pre-assessment workshops for upcoming ground fish assessments were well attended and highlights workshop reports are or soon will be available on the council website on the ground fish stock assessment page. The full list of committee of independent expert reviewers for the stock assessment review panels were announced and dates were assigned for some upcoming subcommittee meetings. Uh, there's an attached table where you can see the meeting details. The Pacific Sablefish Transboundary Assessment Team public workshop to solicit feedback on the ongoing range-wide sablefish management strategy evaluation will be held Tuesday, April 27th and Wednesday, April 28th. Registration, agenda, and background materials for this workshop are available at, um, and we have the web address there. I'm not going to read it for you. The registration deadline is 5 p.m. Friday, April 16th. That's tomorrow. The SSC understands there is an intent to meet in person in September with an option for some to attend via a remote connection. The SSC reiterates the importance of having an option to meet via webinar given the uncertainties with the continuing pandemic. And that concludes our statements. Uh, thank you very much, Galen. Are there questions for Galen on the SSC report? Thank you, Galen. We'll now have the groundfish management team, uh, Mel Mandrup. Welcome, Mel. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? Uh, good morning. All righty. Uh, I am Mel Mandrup. I'll be uh, reading the groundfish management team report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The GMT reviewed the draft agenda uh, for the June Pacific Council meeting and the year at a glance contained in the advance briefing book and offer the following comments. June Council meeting. The GMT notes that both the team and the council are currently scheduled to meet on Saturday, June 26, according to the draft June agenda in the advance briefing book. This is a change to how the virtual meetings have been scheduled over the last year as there have been no meetings scheduled on weekends. The GMT is scheduled to begin on Wednesday, June 23rd. Additionally, many of the GMT members will be participating in the Scientific and Statistical Committee Groundfish Subcommittee meeting on Monday, June 21st and Tuesday, June 22nd, which will be focused on the data moderate stock assessments and catch only updates. Most team members will be scheduled for nine working days and in, in a 10 period, 10 day period, potentially disrupting attempts to balance GMT workload and personal and family responsibilities in the middle of an ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. So if you uh, take a look at table one, we've kind of sketched out for you um, in a visual format what our um, duties are going to be like for uh, the la latter part of June and through most of July, uh, attending council meetings and the um, assessment uh, work uh, panels. The 
Draft June agenda has seven ground fish items scheduled. The majority are high workload, including fixed gear catch share review scoping, in-season adjustments, planning for the 2023-24 harvest specification management measures, and adopting stock assessments. Two additional ground fish items are shaded, including the sable fish gear switching range of alternatives, which may be onerous for the GMT. Additionally, there are two administrative items that are shaded, which the GMT may be anticipated to provide comment on, the standardized bycatch reporting scoping, and the preliminary regional operating agreement. Based on the cumulative effect of the extended schedule, high volume and workload of agenda items, the GMT has concerns that this may not allow for optimal work performance and report output. Therefore, the GMT suggests the council suggests specific council guidance on which items to prioritize for discussions, analysis, and reports, and which items the council does not expect to receive input from the GMT uh, on the June council meeting. The GMT suggests removing the workload and new management measures update from the June agenda because prioritizing during this process earlier in the year, earlier this year, are being worked on. The GMT does not have the capacity to take on additional items, and therefore the council floor time may be better used on another topic in June. Additional GMT work over the spring and summer. Between the end of the April council meeting and the September council meeting, in addition to the six week period with a maximum of 11 unscheduled work days, which is seen in table one, members will be involved in the involved in and working on items such as analysis on items such as gear switching, non-troll rockfish conservation area, mothership utilization, et cetera, as directed by the council in preparation for the upcoming council meetings. Uh, the June GMT uh, Council meetings, the stock assessment review panel in May, and the two separate panels in July, with a possible mop up panel in late September, the RECFIN Technical Committee, the continued work on the biennial harvest specifications database, along with beginning the process to develop a similar uh, regulations database. Ground fish and danger species work group meeting uh, scheduled, scheduled later this month, uh, as well as the sable fish management strategy evaluation workshop, which is also scheduled uh, later this month, and starting to think about the 23 24 harvest specifications and potential new management measures. So, year at a glance, the GMT notes that any subsequent actions to agenda item F3 on the non-troll RCA item discussed at this meeting are not currently scheduled on the draft year at a glance. The GMT requests that the council not schedule additional action on the non-troll RCA item at the same time, the same meeting that the MS utilization or the gear switching items are scheduled. Each of these three topics have the potential to be a heavy workload for the GMT. So scheduling more than one at a single meeting would be difficult for the GMT and likely mean work on other items will be limited, such as in-season stock assessments and workload uh, and new management measures prioritization. The GMT also reminds the council that the 23-24 harbor specifications and management measure process begins in earnest in September 21. November 21 and April 22 will, will be very busy meetings for the biennial process, which has in the past been a council's been the council's priority. Care will be care will need to be given in terms of what other items get scheduled at those meetings. And with that, I end the GMT report and we'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Mel. Questions on the GMT report? Thank you, Mel. And thanks for all the hard work by the ground fish management team members. Uh, next, we have 
the gap report uh, have Sarah Nayani and Susan Chambers. Good morning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And um, just for the record, I will be reading agenda item H5A, supplemental gap report one. The gap reviewed the briefing book documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments. General comments. The GAP appreciates the NIMS groundfish reports provided at every meeting and sees value in representatives from the West Coast region and Northwest and Southwest Fishery Science Centers providing briefings to the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Moreover, the West Coast region and Science Center staff have made themselves available at recent GAP meetings to discuss issues pertinent to groundfish fisheries, such as surveys and rulemakings. The GAP is grateful for the information provided during these exchanges. We encourage council staff to coordinate these GAP, brie GAP briefings at each council meeting. The COVID-19 pandemic has been problematic for the seafood industry, fishery managers, and researchers during the past year. The GAP truly appreciates council staff's flexibility and management of online meetings for the council and advisory bodies. These technological advances have allowed some sense of camaraderie while allowing business to be conducted and move forward. However, given the growing number of vaccinations available, it may be possible for the council to indeed hold an in-person meeting in September currently scheduled in Spokane, Washington. The GAP supports this and would like to urge the council to do whatever it can to allow an in-person meeting in September. The groundfish workload and new management measures agenda item is scheduled for each of the remaining council meetings this year. The GAP suggests that we have a solid set of groundfish items prioritized and that if the council would like to save time on one or more meeting agendas, the groundfish agenda item could be removed from one or two meetings for the remainder of 2021. June 2021 Council Agenda. Referencing the proposed June Council Agenda, the GAP rep recommends the following. First, add an offshore development agenda item. The GAP is understandably very concerned about offshore development whether it's for renewable offshore wind energy or regarding aquaculture opportunity areas. GAP members have been engaged in OSW siting issues for several years and strongly recommend the council and NIMP stay directly engaged on this front. For example, the four state supplemental report one under this agenda item addresses the need for council and stakeholder involvement in a meaningful and helpful way. The GAP thinks this report provides important information for the council to consider, as well as prudent alternatives for council engagement. Therefore, as requested by the states, the GAP recommends scheduling this issue on the council and advisory body agendas at the June 2021 council meeting. Informational Report 9, a Department of Interior Officer of Solicitor Opinion, demonstrates why engagement by the industry and more importantly, state and federal fishery managers is crucial. The DOI opinion essentially reverses a December 2020 DOI opinion that gave existing fisheries priority when determining placement of offshore wind energy sites. The April opinion in Informational Report 9 concluded the Secretary of the Interior has discretion to determine the appropriate balance between two or more goals that conflict or are otherwise in tension, which suggests that existing fisheries and future OSW development have the same level of priority. As part of the larger examination of the appropriate pathway for optimal council engagement, preventing the disruption of council ma managed fishery should be a council priority. Offshore wind energy development should not come at the cost of displacing existing fisheries and cause disruptions to the communities they support, as noted by the GAP in March 2021 and other advisory bodies in the past. BOEM at this time seems eager to work with the council, as noted in an email exchange between BOEM and the Pacific Fishery Management Council. The GAP appreciates council and state staff encouraging BOEM to work with the council and NIMS for greater stakeholder engagement and to provide context to data sets shared between the council, NIMS, and BOEM. Number two, unshade the electronic monitoring um, agenda item for June. EM users would like to see the update on this issue and keep it moving forward. Number three, unshade Sablefish gear switching for June. The GAP reconvened to finalize the statement prior to the end of council discussion on agenda item F4, Sablefish gear switching at this meeting. However, the GAP expected several members would request this be unshaded for June. And I hope it's appropriate for me to add, um, the GAP members were emailing into the night um, and this morning about this. Um, number three, some wanted this issue to be taken up in June because they felt the issue has gone on for so long that it's important to keep moving. 
Others felt the issue should be postponed until later in the year since the GMT's workload is very full. So that's just me adding that in as <laughs> context for that number three. Okay, preliminary year at a glance. Referencing the year at a glance calendar under this agenda item, the GAP recommends the following. Number one, add the non troll RCA area management issue to the September 21 agenda. The GAP and council staff have worked hard to scope this issue and substantial public commenters have indicated this is an important issue for the non troll fleet. The GAP requests the council add this issue to the September council meeting agenda. Number two, the GAP requests the at sea whiting utilization FBA item be retained on the November 2021 agenda. The GAP would like to keep the momentum of this issue moving forward. However, if for analytical reasons there is a need to schedule the FPA for a later meeting, the GAP request this occur no later than March 2022. And that concludes the GAP report. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarah. That's a lot. Let me see if there are any questions around the table. I'm not seeing any, but thank you very much for those very specific requests. Uh, next, we have uh, the report by the CPS management team, Alan Serge. Yes, good morning. Good morning. Our, re our request list is a little bit shorter. I'll be reading the CPSMT report one. The Coastal Pelagic Species Management Team reviewed the Pacific County Workload Planning preliminary year to glance summary and a draft proposed council meeting agenda for June 2021. The CPSMT offers the following for council considerations. Preliminary year to class glance summary. The CPSMT recommends that the safe report and management recommendations agenda item that is currently shaded for the November 2021 meeting be deleted from the year to glance. Instead, that item can be more efficiently dealt with as an informational report that the CPSMT can pro provide in the November meeting briefing book. Draft proposed council meeting agenda for June 2021. In June, under the future workload planning agenda item, the CPSMT anticipates providing a brief report with a timeline on when a full CPSMT report on essential fish habitat phase two scope of work and scheduling will be ready for council consideration. The council should then consider when to put the full scope of work agenda item on its year to glance calendar. The CPSMT looks forward to meeting in person once that can be confidently done in a safe manner. The CPSMT encourages the council to allow remote participation at future meetings until there is more certainty regarding the pandemic and associated risks. That's, that's it for me. All right, thank you, Alan. Uh, questions for Alan? Thank you, Alan. And we have a report from the Salmon technical team, Michael Farrell. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll be referring to agenda item H5A, supplemental STT report one, uh, STT report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The Salmon technical team is supportive of, in of including the Sacramento River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective Review and Sacramento River Fall Chinook Age Structure Model Assessment items on the Council's September 2021 agenda. This work is of high importance to salmon management south of Cape Falcon, identifying a path forward that will allow for interagency collaboration and meaningful engagement in these projects is a priority for the STT. Although important to consider in the future, a review of the Klamath River Fall Chinook Conservation Objective is not as high a priority for the STT at this time, given the dam removals planned in the Klamath Basin. That concludes our statement. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Are there questions of Mike on the SDT report? Marcy Uremko. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mike. Um, traditionally, the salmon uh, technical team and the SAS do not uh, join us for uh, the September meetings. Um, but with this item uh, being scheduled, I expect there might be interest on the part of the teams. Um, did you consider that in, in this recommendation? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Yeremko, uh, we, we did not consider that. Uh, 
in this, um, and we do consider those sorts of things generally for other topics of you know interest to salmon, knowing that people are fishing and busy at that time of year. Um, you know, the, the consideration for us making this statement is just has to do with highlighting how we, the STT feels this is important, and it just happened to be um, you know shaded on the on that uh, on the September agenda potential agenda and uh, and so we wanted just to indicate our support for keeping this important item uh, moving forward. Any further questions of the salmon technical team? Uh, I'm not seeing any. So that uh, concludes all of our reports and takes us to public comment of which we have a several so i'll call them in the order we have here uh bill james welcome uh, i'm not seeing uh bill's name on the attendee list so um We'll come back to him. Uh, Mike Conroy, are you with us? I am. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chair and Council Members. Uh, my name is Mike Conroy, speaking on behalf of PCFFA with regard to Agenda Item H5. I wanted to start out by offering my appreciation for the joint report submitted by the states regarding marine planning workload. Um, I'm sure that this will come as no great shock. I, I would be supportive of the creation of a new ad hoc advisory body to address this. As you will recall, uh, Corey writings from the Ocean Conservancy and I worked closely on proposing a similar request during September and November of last year, and again during your March meeting. Um, I'm confident that she shares in the support for that option as well. Uh, having said that, the proposal contained in the written comments on this agenda item submitted by Mike Okanowski and Susan seem appropriate as well. I'm not here today to speak further on our past request. I, I appreciate the states pointing out the new demands which will be placed on council staff. Given that offshore development will impact all council managed fisheries in some form or another, those demands may be significant. Uh, regardless of the option chosen by the council, ensuring that sufficient staff time and expertise is available will be key. I think it was uh, Mr. Dooley that noted during the discussion under agenda item H2 that just over two weeks ago in a joint press conference, including the Departments of Interior, Energy, Commerce, and Transportation, uh, the federal government made it very clear that offshore wind is a priority. Um, last Friday, Interior revoked the 2020 legal opinion that found offshore wind cannot unreasonably interfere with fishing and issued a new one which finds the secretary retains wide discretion to determine the appropriate balance between two or more goals that conflict or are otherwise in tension. Uh, the appropriateness of that balance is measured by whether or not it was rational. And I'm pleased to see that that uh, DOI memo is included as supplemental information report nine. Last week, the BOEM New York Bite Intergovernmental Task Force publicly noticed a public meeting held yesterday and tomorrow. This area, along with Vineyard Wind, are likely to be amongst the first areas fast-tracked for leasing on the East Coast. As you'll see, I submitted to the briefing book a statement recently put out by the Responsible Offshore Development Alliance, which explains why East Coast fishing community leaders are not participating in that meeting. I think that statement does an excellent job of explaining the industry's concerns and frustrations with the current landscape of offshore wind planning. I would love to say that I'm encouraged by how the West Coast folks at Bone are taking a different approach to public participation, but I cannot. I would love to say that I'm encouraged that there is a more understanding of the potential impacts of a large scale floating wind farm with a footprint of hundreds of square miles on ecological function, marine mammal migratory patterns, fisheries, fishermen, fishing communities, seafood consumers, but I cannot. I conclude by saying I'm supportive of adding an item to the June meeting to discuss how to engage marine planning processes. This could allow the council to get a report on the May 12th and 13th BOEM Oregon public webinars. 
an update on the two pilot projects proposed in state waters off Port Aguelo, California, and other actions which we don't know of yet, but are likely planned or imminent. And thank you for the time, the opportunity to comment. Thank you very much, Mike. Let me see any questions for Mike on his public comment. Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you for testifying today, Mike. I um, I don't have a question on your comment, but I do have a question regarding to the HMSAS. Um, normally, you put in a, a comment as a group, um, and normally I would think that it was April and you guys didn't meet, uh, but you did submit a comment earlier on a different agenda item. So just wondering if you had during your conversations this week in the HMSAS any conversation or feedback about future workload planning, um, or any thoughts on that from, from that perspective, um, just to give us a little more feedback in terms of what HMS is thinking. Yeah, through the chair. Thanks for the question, Krista. Um, we got wrapped around the axle in our AS meetings over the letters. We did briefly have a discussion about future, lo future workload planning and whether or not what we submitted in March, uh, whether we had a different view this time around and we didn't. So um, we did not take time to write a statement on that. And, you know, in canvassing a few of our members, uh, we're still supportive of having the, the DGN items remain on the June meeting. Okay, thank you. Any further questions of Mike? Thank you, Mike. Uh, ben Enticknet, welcome. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. I'm Ben Enticknap representing Oceana. Uh, we do have a letter in the briefing book before you about future agenda item planning that I'll speak to. Uh, <clears throat> the two things that I want to address are with respect to forage fish. Forage fish are the backbone of a healthy ocean ecosystem. And as such, they're of great interest uh, to conservation. With respect to anchovy, right now the approach for anchovy catch limits is largely a set it and forget it approach that risks overfishing and has not stood up in court. But from what we've seen so far, the CPSMT is making some progress toward developing an anchovy management framework, including the use of annual acoustic trawl survey estimates, regular check-ins to ensure the ancho anchovy population is healthy, a biomass threshold that would trigger automatic and immediate reductions in catch levels if the biomass uh, estimate falls below a threshold, and periodic stock assessments to update the formula for setting OFLs. And so while the CPSMT appears to be making progress, we've not yet seen any options for how the framework, framework would be implemented uh, by the council or by NIPS. And so we request that the council direct the team to include a plan for implementing the framework specifically an annual harvest specifications rulemaking progress process like what is done with other actively fished coastal pelagic species. Uh, we, we request the council provide this direction to the team now so that the framework and implementation process can move forward together in June and with the upcoming CPS FMP amendment process that's on the year at a glance uh, for November. Second uh, to Sardine, uh, we've raised concerns for a couple of years now about the MSY factor used in sardine management for calculating the overfishing limit, ABC, and harvest guideline. This uh, EMSY value that's currently used is a function of sea surface temperature in the Southern California Bight, and this approach has been found by NIMP scientists in a peer-reviewed study to be invalid. Nevertheless, it's used in management to calculate a high exploitation rate and subsequently high catch levels as if the stock were in a productive state, when it's clear that the opposite is true. Sardine productivity and recruitment right now is at an all-time low. In order to prevent overfishing and base management on the best available science, we request that the council ask NIMPS to report back in June on options for how to correct the EMSY value. There seemed to be uh, a lot of agreement to this. Uh, it's referenced in the SSC report and the CPSMT report from earlier this week, as well as uh, in council discussion. In the CPSMT report, they recommended a reevaluation of the EMSY value because it no longer appears to adequately reflect sardine productivity. 
Uh, I do want to point out that this doesn't mean that you need to develop another complicated environmental proxy for sardine productivity. The Diemer and Zwinski study from 2019 uh, found that these environmental prox proxies for fish productivity might not always uh, prescribe the correct amount of fishing mortality, and they say that they should actually be avoided. Alternatively, uh, measurements of stock productivity to inform the MSY catch rate can be inferred directly from surveys or from the results of assessments based on those surveys. Um, so, so to close, if you would please uh, make sure that the request is clear to NIMPS to report back in June on a plan for fixing the EMSY value. So to ensure that you're using the best available science and avoiding overfishing for sardine uh, next time this comes up next April. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Are there questions for Ben? Thank you, Ben. Uh, Mike Okanevsky. Uh, can you hear me, Mr. Chair? Uh, good morning. Good morning, sir. Uh, just allow me one second here. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. My name is Mike Okineski. I'm testifying on behalf of myself and Ms. Susan Chambers on agenda item H5A, Supplemental Report 1, Four State Report on Marine Planning Workload. We commend and thank the authors for their report. I'm a co-chair on the CPSAS and Susan is vice chair on the GAP. Our CPS AS meeting was over before we were able to discuss the four state report on marine planning. Although the CPS AS has discussed marine planning, my testimony today is not intended to represent the CPS AS on this topic. The GAP has expressed their views in their report under this agenda item, H5A. Specifically, we would like to support the GAP report on H5 add an offshore development agenda item to the June meeting and strongly recommend the council and NIMFS stay directly engaged on this front as requested by the states and the GAP. Without going into detail, we have seen offshore wind energy, OSW, development become a major contentious issue amongst the fishing industry, offshore wind proponents, and Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, on the East Coast. The latest event portends the threat of lawsuits. Many in the East Coast fishing and ind fishing industry believe that the way offshore wind development is advancing constitutes an existential threat to their livelihoods. The process on the East Coast and the past encounters with OSW proponents on the West Coast has not engendered a spirit of trust with our industry. Without a voice in the process and, and the inability to monitor development in the offshore energy and aquaculture opportunity areas, AOAs, many of my associates and I believe offshore wind development on the West Coast could go down a similar road. Hands down, we believe the PFMC is the best organization to track offshore development and be a forum for stakeholders. We've spoken to our colleagues on a number of advisory bodies, ABs, after multiple discussions and evaluating several options, we believe a method that would be le the least demanding of the council, PFMC staff, and AB's resources and time is to have an ad hoc body, C, as listed in the four state report, composed of at least one member of each AB that would be tasked to follow offshore development and other related tasks as assigned by the council. We believe a concentrated work group that has broad-based expertise would be able to pro provide insightful perspectives while minimizing necessary personnel to deal with this important issue. Some, if not all meetings for this group might be scheduled between council meetings. Uh, Susan is, I'm not sure if she's on or not, but uh, thank you, we would be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mike. 
questions for Mike. Louis Zim. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Mike and Ms. Chambers, for this. Would you envision that this group of uh, one representative from each AS, uh, would they be reporting directly to the council or would each member go back and report to their AS and then the ASs would, would then approach the council? Uh, through the chair, Mr. Zim, that's an excellent question. I haven't thought through it that much yet. I, I think it could be structured either way or it might be that both on some occasions would be uh, a, a good way to do it. But I think we want to minimize the ex exposure of time or, or not take up any more time of a council floor than we would need to. So I believe just at first glance, uh, taking it back to the advisory bodies and seeing if they want to say something might be the appropriate step to do. Um, some issues might not be very uh, contentious or be that meaty as, as far as just a need to get involvement in it. And others might be just the opposite where they'd be pretty important to uh, get everybody's uh, perspective on it, including the council members. So I, I think maybe a screening or filtering through the ABs might be the better way to go, but I, I'm certainly open to suggestion on that one. Through the chair. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, you, you advise that uh, this meeting, the, this kind of meeting would probably not be advised to take place during the council meetings because it would conflict with uh, um, with the AS duties. Uh, when would you when, when would you see this happening? Uh, similar to to other uh AS meetings in the run-up to the council or, or separate or uh, what do you see on that? Through the chair, Mr. Zim, uh, thank you for the question. I, I think if I remember back some years ago, and my memory is a little dim as I get older, uh, we used to have some of our CPS meetings uh, before, you know, like weeks before the council. And it seemed like a, a good way to go in many respects. Not, I think if we still met at the council meeting, if I remember right, and, but we have some time, preparatory time, and might meet with the MT at, at the same time. That might be one option. Or as you said, we're taking some time now uh, prior to the council getting together. And so that might be another option too. I, I don't know if one or I, I'd say right now, maybe both options should be kind of out there. And uh, I consider myself somewhat of an expert in some fishery issues, but as far as administration of uh, the time and the council staff and, and uh, what's, uh, I guess, the best way for the council staff to operate, I, I don't consider myself very knowledgeable at all. So I think we need some input on that one before we, I would render a, a, an opinion. Thank you very much. Marcy Uremko. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Susan and Mike for your joint comments and writing. Uh, having them for us uh, in the record, I think is really important. And I wanna thank you for taking the time to put your heads together. Um, question on the very last passage, um, your description of the ad hoc group that would be comprised of advisory body members. Um, the phrase you use is at least one member of each AB that would be tasked. Um, can you tell me what fed into that phrasing, there must have been some discussion in the background um, that uh, led you to say at least one rather than one member. So maybe you can tell us a little more about that. Again, through the chair, um, thank you for the question, Marcy. I, 
I did discuss this with Susan and uh, actually some time back also. I don't know that we're necessarily locked in. It's it's more of a proposal, conceptual proposal, than it is that we're locked into one idea for how to tackle this. I, I think we'd be remiss if we did not take advice from the council and others on this, but it seemed like that was a reasonable approach, uh, or we came to that conclusion after we had talked about it. But again, I'm not uh, I'm not wed to that particular concept only. And if there's someone, one of you, or somebody else on the council staff that were to say this doesn't work for reason A, B, and C, and we don't want this advisory body necessarily involved or the advisory body themselves doesn't want to be involved. I think we'd have to take all those things into account. And uh, we might have find a composition that's a little bit different from this. Uh, maybe the gap has two members that they would like to see on there or the CPSA has for that matter. Or um, maybe we want to have an environmental rep come along with the fishery rep from say the CPSAS. I, and I, the, I, I know that um, you should mention this too, that the management team really wasn't in our process at the time because I thought that might be asking a little too much. And I think of advisory bodies and management team as set teams as two separate entities, but uh, but we certainly could use some expertise out of the management team. And I mean, it might be some instances where a management team member could do it for the, be good enough for the advisory body and uh, the advisory body would be fine with it. So I, I think it's premature to kind of fix in on just uh, what the uh, narrative there says even though I had to put something on paper, so that's what I chose. <laughs> so, um, or, or Susan and I, I should say. Thank you. Mercy. Uh, thank you, Chair Gronlich. Th thank you, um, Mike. That's that's very helpful uh, background. I appreciate you sharing the, the meat of those discussions with us as well as your thinking. All right, Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mike and Susan, thank you so much. I read your letter and I appreciate your testimony here today. Um, you know, in the context of workload planning, that's the agenda item here, and, and workload and understanding the clog we have on our agendas and trying to everybody clamoring for space, it occurred to me that potentially this ad hoc committee to collate and to uh, concentrate on many different uh, you know, capitalize on the disciplines of the of the and the interests and expertise and on the on the various advisory panels, management teams, uh, to form an ad hoc committee could potentially actually uh, bring to the advisory panels and to the management teams a cohesive, holistic view on a particular issue, whether it be wind or aquaculture. Or, planning however you want to, whatever is on the agenda and whatever is of, of concern. And it almost, it, it, I'm thinking about it, it could be a time saver to the advisory panels, management teams, and um, and ultimately the council to have a more holistic view rather than have several reports that hit the council floor and the council sorts it out. And so that, that occurred to me, and I was wondering if, if you've given that to any thought that this may ultimately this ad hoc committee save a lot of time for for everyone uh, i just it, it occurred to me and i didn't know if i was alone in that thinking uh th through the chair and mr dewey i we're certainly not alone with uh between the fact that susan and i both were thinking in those same terms it, uh, i think saving saving time and efficiency in this process anymore is we don't have much choice in the matter and, and the issues aren't getting any less. The mission for the council is not getting to be any less. And I think that finding the best ways to, at least where I'm involved in my subcommittee or sub panel, finding the best ways to get 
quicker answers and, and uh, good decision-making process is more important all the time. Uh, Susan was the one that caught this, your same exact thought first. She beat me to the punch and she did have to argue with me a little bit on it because I had a little bit different idea at first, but uh, I <laughs> subscribe to the, what you're saying right now. And, and that's why I guess I'd like to leave this a little bit, well, quite a bit open ended as far as how we would do that exactly. And I think we would need advice of the council. I know we'd need advice from the council staff uh, before we came up with any final conclusions. The chair and Mike, thank you so much for the comments here. And I, I think it's important and uh, probably missed the opportunity I did to thank Mike uh, Conroy as well for his comments. So thank you so much and thank you. One, one last uh, quick one, and, and that is Mike Conroy has been really leading the charge here, especially in California, and has kept a lot of us surprised of what's going on. And and so I, I have been working with Mike, uh, and it's it's been a good relationship in that regard, and I really appreciate the effort he's put into this. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, John Keppen, followed by Heather Mann. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'd like to speak to um, agenda item F3, scoping and prioritized non trawl sector area management measures. But before I make those comments, I'd like to take a moment and recognize the National Marine Fisheries Service and their change in regulations starting January 1, 2021, which uh, established a new management line at a uh, point arena and allowed the, uh, the RCA near shore boundary south of arena to go out to 50 fathoms. In addition, they, they added uh, retention of yellowtail rockfish in the uh, salmon troll fishery south of the 4010. And it, it, we, we deeply appreciate their, their listening to our, our pleas over the last couple of years in, in allowing um, so, some, some relief uh, and, and our ability to take part in those fisheries. Uh, moving on and, and point one and F3, uh, we want to, um, and I'm, tech, I'm speaking for most of the, all of the small boat fleet in California and certainly a large part of the small boat fleet in Oregon, I'm certain that we appreciate the, the council's adoption of the draft proposal uh, in need for, for which uh, allows open access participants entry into the non trawl RCA. Again, we're extremely grateful for that. Moving forward in September, uh, we want to reiterate that this is, uh, these are critical things in uh, developing bridging opportunities as our crab and our salmon fisheries uh, are more restricted and less productive. Um, on number, item number two, uh, we request consideration in 2021-22 council session to scope uh, retention of shelf rockfish uh, in the uh, uh, salmon troll fishery rather than in the 22-23 SAG uh, council session. Uh, again, the small boat fleet will need any and all help to uh, survive. Um, and this and the primary reason from the very beginning back two years ago at plus the primary reason for the request to retain those sand, those uh, rockfish is is this resource resource is being uh, wasted and, and we, we we'd rather keep them and sell them to the public than feed them to the seagulls thank you thank you john any questions for john Thank you, John. A Heather Mann, followed by James Stone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. My name is Heather Mann, and I'm uh, speaking on behalf of the Midwater Trawlers Cooperative. Um, our priorities for moving forward with council meeting planning are electronic monitoring, 
the mothership utilization issue, the gear switching issue, and cost recovery. Um, for June, we recommend that the agenda include the EM program update where the guidance and feedback requested by the council in March is received. There is a written public comment on behalf of all the EM EFP participants, and it lists out that uh, council's request uh, to the agency for information um, that you all uh, ask them to provide. The agenda item should be worded to allow the important conversation, which was cut short in March, which is if the information provided by the agency and industry results in a determination that a court's change decision needs to be made uh, by the council on the regulatory program. It could also include um, flexibility to request a possible delay in the effectiveness of the regulatory program that allows for time to ensure that the program, uh, as we've asked for, meets the goals and objectives laid out by all of you um, for, the, for the EM program moving forward. So we uh, support that on the June agenda. We also support unshading the gear switching issue for June um, and keeping that moving forward, support the gaps comments there in terms of the momentum and, and really it's been a long time in the process and, and needs to keep moving forward one way or another for, for all the participants. I think you could strike the workload planning issue for the June meeting. Um, I know it doesn't potentially save a ton of time, but the thought of having to argue once again for our priorities seems to me to be unproductive and kind of a time suck that we don't really need uh, for the June meeting. You know, MTC members continue to have some concerns about capacity and the length of time it takes to get things done. If you recall my testimony uh, under open public comment in March, it is incredibly expensive to participate in the trawl ITQ fishery. It is our sacrifices, such as the funding 200% observer coverage that has helped to create additional opportunities for the non-trawl ITQ fleets um, by reducing uncertainty in the stock assessments. And in addition to the monitoring costs that we pay everybody in the trial ITQ program, whether you're whiting, non-whiting, and even gear switchers, we all have 6.5% uh, of every fish delivery taken off the top right now. Uh, and that goes to paying for the outstanding balance on the buyback loan, which is $12 million, and then to fund uh, cost recovery. No other sector or fishery or gear type incurs the expense and monitoring burden that ITQ participants have. And as you know, uh, year round ITQ ground fish is the glue that helps maintain coastal infrastructure to support the pulse fisheries like crab, shrimp, salmon, and tuna. And so I continue to advocate for prioritizing action on items that assist the trial ITQ participants who are also uh, you know, striving to stay profitable during these unprecedented times. You know, the scale uh, of the operations may be different, but the need is all relative and, and uh, ITQ participants um, need assistance. You know, a few words on the cost recovery. As I reported last month, um, since 2014, the industry has paid over $11 million to the agency much of it for activities that we either didn't support, didn't ask for, or for activities that we don't necessarily believe, necessarily believe should be recoverable. And there was more detail in the cost recovery report that was provided earlier in the week, um, but there still is not a really good engagement between the agency and the council and the industry. Um, the brief conversation regarding the change to the cost recovery rule being recoverable is a prime example. So NIMS told the council it was recoverable. They did not engage in a conversation about why it was recoverable or take any input or perhaps um, discuss why it shouldn't be recoverable, even though Mr. Dooley did attempt to begin that conversation. The agency just said that they would not be doing the rulemaking if it were not for the ITQ program. And that was the justification. So even with the commitment from NIMS to work together with the industry on this, which is greatly appreciated, I'm not, I'm not, on a, um, I'm not saying it's not, but we still seem to be further apart than we've ever been in terms of mutual understanding and transparency. 
So MTC continues to advocate for a reconstitution of the cost uh, recovery committee. Lastly, I know there has been some discussion about pushing final action on the mothership utilization issue to early 2022. And MTC can support this if it allows the rule to be implemented before the start of the 2023 season. And that would include hopefully a season that starts on May 1st. Um, so having something in place by then, you know, I believe I probably represent all of the boats that have had to leave uh, millions of pounds of whiting uh, worth millions of dollars in the water in the mothership sector. And we're eager to get some relief in that sector, which is not performing as it was intended to under Amendment 20. So in closing, Mr. Chairman, council members, we support unshading the EM and gear switching items for June and ensuring the wording on the EM agenda item allows for recommendations to be made for rulemaking if appropriate. We support reconstituting the cost recovery committee and we uh, support scheduling the mothership issue for final action at a time when um, it can be implemented in 2023. And following these priorities, uh, Mr. Chairman, we do support our non-trawl colleagues and the process allowing them access to the non-trawl RCA. And at some point we would support having a broader conversation around monitoring and accountability for all federal West Coast fisheries. And so um, thank you for your work the last two weeks and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Heather. Other questions for Heather and the hands go up. Uh, Bob Dooley followed by Marcy Remco. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Heather, for your comments. I might've missed it. I hope I didn't. Uh, you didn't comment on the groundfish uh, shading of uh, electronic monitoring update uh, that I'd heard. And maybe maybe you did, I, I might've missed it. Um, but are, are you concerned about that being left off the agenda? And, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Julie, yes, I addressed that at the beginning of my uh, testimony. We do want to see EM on the June agenda and have um, that update be worded in such a way that the council can provide recommendations to take action if a course change is required based on the information that's provided. So to kind of continue the conversation that we started last month that was, um, veering into territory that wasn't uh, agendaized. And so um, like to make sure that it's it stays on the agenda and it's worded in such a way that you all can continue that important conversation and, and talk about whether the information provided in the regulatory program actually meets the goals and objectives that you laid out uh, previously for the EM program. Um, Mr. Chairman, th and Thank you, Heather. I, I'm sorry I missed that at, at the beginning with I was kind of distracted here. So I, uh, I appreciate it and I agree with you. So thank you. All right, uh, Marcy Remco and Krista Svensson had her hand up, but it's down now, but if it goes back up, I'll call on Krista after Marcy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Heather, for um, the... <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you, Heather, um, and thank you for your, your list of recommendations. Um, regarding cost recovery, uh, we had a bit of discussion uh, toward the end of that agenda item where NIMS suggested the possibility of us um, doing some work under our um, six-year, I guess, review of um, the ITQ program. Um, that uh, we, we took a look at the year at a glance at, at that time and noted that it wasn't yet agendized anywhere on the year at a glance. Um, but uh, there's been some discussion since uh, and some thinking that maybe uh, we start those discussions um, a little earlier um, with the idea of um, indicating some intention to uh, focus our review on topics, uh, including cost recovery, um, or maybe I should put it, you know, cost, um, re redu reducing costs to the ITQ sector. 
So I was wondering what you thought of that idea. Um, you, you didn't mention it here today in this agenda item. Um, if that is a pathway uh, you'd support, um, or if you don't think that would meet your needs. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Marcy. Gosh, I'm getting it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I did hear the conversation about that to some extent. Um, I've been going in between the Pacific Council and the North Pacific Council this week, which are completely overlapping. Um, and I, I do support um, something like that taking place under the five-year review. I do know that based on our first process there, um, I'm going to approach and encourage others to approach the five-year review process a little bit differently um, this time in terms of what we'd like to see and what comes out of it now that we have the experience of going through it. But I am a little worried um, about two things. And one is that right now, you know, we're paying several uh, million dollars a year um, to the agency uh, that we don't necessarily understand where that, that money is going or how it was determined to be recoverable. And, and that continues to be a daily, um, a daily concern. It's, it's a lot of money and it's not you know, a paperwork exercise. It's literally coming out of your paycheck for your fish. And so you know, we, delaying action to you know, understand these things is, uh, it's a little disturbing, I guess, for us. And you know, I understand it will probably be starting, I think, next year, but um, I'd like to see something sooner. The other issue I have around the five-year review um, and cost recovery is that you know, when we went through the five-year review previously, National Marine Fishery Service was sending 20 people to the CAB meetings and charging cost recovery dollars for it. So my concern there, Marcy, is around maybe mission creep or, you know, how do we, how do we really focus those conversations on reducing costs for ITQ fishermen and, and processors, um, which I think is an excellent idea. I just, uh, you know, am concerned that we're facing these costs right now as well. So I hope that answers your question. I didn't mention it only because I only heard part of the conversation, but the way you described it I certainly can support um, support that type of discussion. Through the chair, thanks very much, Heather. All right, thanks, Marcy and Heather. Uh, Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gorelnik, and, and hi, Heather. Um, so I was hoping one of my colleagues would have asked this before, but they didn't. Um, you have made the request to unshade two items, um, EM and the stable fish gear switching, which is a, forecasted to be 11 hours of time. Um, I, Recognizing you also made the request to um, take workload new management issues, which is an hour uh, potentially off the schedule. Uh, you're looking at just under four hours of time. Um, can you prioritize which of those two items um, for your user group would be their, their first and second choice, or, or is that an option to speak to? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ms. Svensson, um, you know, I'd have to say uh, from, I, I don't know that I could pick between the two. I think for, um, they both have importance. Um, I think from an, a timing perspective, the EM issue is very urgent because right now the regulatory program is supposed to become effective January 1st of 2022. So in that perspective, without um, reducing uh, the value of the gear switching issue, which several MTC members are, are very, and you heard from many of them this week, very concerned about, um, I would have to, I guess I would prioritize the EM from the timing perspective between the two, um, because I feel like if we don't have a conversation in June, September, November, maybe too late um, because of that train 
really barreling down the tracks. Um, but I, I just want to go on the record to say that it doesn't, it doesn't mean that MTC members do not care about the gear switching issue as much. They do. Um, but the timing, I think, just sitting here makes me think that EM um, would be what I would pick for June. I hope that helps. <laughs> it's, a, it's a hard, it's a hard decision uh, to decide what to do with limited resources, and you have so many people, so many groups needing assistance um, that I don't envy envy you that. And it was not lost on me that um, I only traded one hour for eleven hours of, of time. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Chair. I I. I do appreciate, Heather, that both of these are high, high priorities, and I do recognize that I just asked you to pick between two children. So uh, <laughs> I, I appreciate your honesty that both are equal value for your members, but one has more urgency just based upon timing, not based upon priority. So thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Krista and Heather. Uh, you. Sure. Uh, we have our last uh, speaker, uh, James Stone. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik, uh, council members. My name is James Stone. I am the executive director of NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association. We represent hundreds of uh, guides and charter boats um, in the inland waters east of the Carquinas Bridge in the Sacramento Valley, as well as <clears throat> other areas of <clears throat> Northern California. I'm uh, commenting today on behalf of NorCal Guides and Sportsmen's Association to further support the methodology review of the conservation objective of the Sacramento River for fall run Chinook in the future in council session, uh, preferably November or as soon as it's possibly feasible. I wanted to point out that our organization wrote a letter to Miss Bishop and copied many of you in, in regards in California about our grave concerns about the low spawning escapement on the Sacramento River over the past seven seasons, missing major uh, escapement goals five of those seven years and the necessary possibility to review those numbers and to move forward. And I understand that uh, this has been a working agendized, agendized item for the future and methodology review, and we would like to fully support at least having that discussion um, on the council floor as well as uh, in the SAS. I would like to remove my hat now um, as the executive director of NorCal Guides and put my hat on as the current California sport representative for the Salmon Advisory Subpanel, representing all recreational anglers as well as my fellow SAS California members from charter commercial, as well as our other sport. We've had on offline conversations about the methodology review, <clears throat> especially with the possibility of discussing age-based forecasting for the Sacramento River, uh, like the Klamath system is managed on. And I, we have come to preliminary full support to move forward and recommend to the council that we discuss and have discussion in November or as soon as feasibly possible to discuss the methodology review of conservation objectives on the Sacramento River as well as age-based forecasting. And we look forward to having further discussion and possibly maybe presentations that can help educate all on these matters. And I appreciate all of your time and thank you very much and congratulations on completing another uh, busy week and workload. Thank you all. Thank you, James. Any question for James? Thank you. And, and that will conclude uh, public comment. And uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna take a break here um, I'm not sure whether to make it merely a short break or a, an early break for lunch. We are going to be waiting on salmon probably for a bit. So it's not as if 
we're going to let everyone go home early anyway because we have to finish D6 before we leave. So let me see if there's any preference amongst the council members to come back after a short break or to come back after an early lunch. Virgil Moore. I'm good with an early lunch since it's lunchtime here too. So. That's right. We have to remember we're not all in the same time zone. Um, all right then. Uh, that with one uh, preference data, Phil Anderson and Brad Pettinger now have input. Please go ahead, Phil. Yeah. I'm I'm good with that, but are you talking about like an, an hour for lunch or something? I noticed that John Ugaritz just was suggesting a 12-15 uh, return, but I was just wondering what you thought in terms of length of break. Well, I, I figured we could break early for lunch and, you know, uh, we could come back at 12.30 or, uh, and, and, and pick this up. Okay. Uh, Brad? Yeah, I'll defer to Idaho. I think it's a, it's a wise move at this point. All right. Well, that being the sense of the council, um, and that way we don't break up council discussion with a lunch in the middle, because that we, the, these discussions seem to take a, a fair amount of time to give them justice. So uh, we'll take a break now. We'll be back at uh, 1230. And uh, John... John has asked that we return at 12.15. Um, John, can you please speak to that? Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, I have a, a conflict um, that begins around 1 p.m., but I can make do with whatever your pleasure is. Well, what if we go to you first on council discussion so we can address those, those issues and free you up by one o'clock, could that work? If we could take up HMS agenda planning first, that would be perfect, yes. All right, well, why don't we do that? And that way, um, and virtually your hand is up. Virgil, do you have something further or just wanna make sure I don't cut people off because sometimes I do that in my rush and I apologize. All right. So we, we will break until 12.30, and um, we will uh, try to make sure we conclude uh, any HMS issues before 1 o'clock uh, to accommodate John. And with that, we'll see you all at 12.30.
All right, it is uh, 1230, the anointed hour for us to uh, <clears throat> continue with uh, council uh, discussion uh, and some decisions on uh, agenda and workload planning. And as is traditional, I'll uh, turn to Chuck Tracy. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, before we get started on today's workload, well, on the future workload planning, I'll mention a little bit about today's workload planning and uh, just checked in with the salmon folks. It sounds like uh, they are still a ways out. <clears throat> so maybe uh, it's sounding like 3.30 uh, or so before they would be ready. So um, just, uh, just to let you know, we've got plenty of time to work on this. So, all right, well, um, as we agreed before we broke for lunch, um, we're gonna tackle uh, HMS planning right now. So um, uh, I will just uh, point out that we've, what we've got on the June agenda, uh, five items, um, none of them are shaded. So uh, if there's any changes to those or any discussion about those, I'd be interested to hear that. I guess in particular, uh, we've got a NIMS report for an hour, uh, international management activities for two, EFPs for an hour. Um, I would be curious to see if there's any discussion about uh, um, uh, if there's any thoughts about you know limiting that to uh, deep set buoy gear permits or no more deep uh, deep set buoy gears. Just uh, kind of curious where where we stand on that. Um, maybe we can get an update from Nils on <clears throat> on. Uh, the process for uh, approving existing permits on that. Um, <clears throat> then we have drift gillnet fishery bycatch performance uh, for three hours and GGN hard cap scoping for four. Um, so uh, maybe I'll just pause there and start with June <clears throat> and uh, um, see if there's any thoughts about any of those uh, any of those agenda items. John Egritz. John, you're still muted. There we go. Thank you for reminding me. You're welcome. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so I just I did want to start uh, briefly in discussing the June agenda with discussing the fact that we have a Saturday agenda item, two agenda items for HMS. Um, I, I really was disappointed in the decision to move forward with meeting on Saturday when meeting remotely. Uh, there was a poll that the executive director held and um, all of the state agencies and NIMPS recommended not meeting over the weekend when we don't meet in person. And while continuing through the weekend makes abundant sense when meeting in person to address travel and, and meeting costs, it, it just simply does not make sense when meeting remotely. Um, and I was even more disappointed to see that when I personally expressed a significant opposition to meeting over the weekend, that the HMS items I sit for were scheduled on Saturday. So I, I really sincerely hope that if September ends up being an online and not in-person meeting, that we continue uh, with our past practice over the last year of not meeting on the weekend. So with that said, I'm, I'm hopeful to limit the amount of time we spend on Saturday on HMS. And for the HMS agenda items, I would note the following. Uh, for international management, while we've always allowed two hours on the agenda for that item, it rarely, if ever, takes that long. And I'd recommend reducing international to one hour for this meeting. For bycatch performance, uh, this is a report from the team on the bycatch performance in the DGN fishery over the past two seasons. There's no direct council action needed that I see for this specific item. And I would suggest that no more than an hour and a half is needed for it. And with uh, 
hard cap scoping, um, this is perhaps the most important HMS item in June, uh, given the court decision and the council's specific stated desire to take it up in June at our last discussion on it. I, that said, I don't really feel like four full hours is maybe needed. Um, assuming we have good recommendations from the team on how we might adjust our original um, hard cap items, that uh, we would be able to conduct this in maybe three hours or less. So given those changes, I would recommend moving bycatch performance to Friday uh, because we would be reducing the amount of time for international and have enough time to do it on Friday. And then that would free up an additional four hours of time on Saturday for non-HMS items, which I understand there are some fairly significant ones trying to be addressed. And so uh, with those initial thoughts, I'll see if anybody has reactions. Krista. Yeah, thanks. Um, and I appreciate um, Mr. Ugaritz's comments. Um, <laughs> I will say that I am in the other category um, in terms of, I voted to attend for both days of the weekend. Um, I work full time, um, just to give another perspective. Um, this is not part of my day job. <laughs> and I am thankful that they allow me to participate um, in council activities, etc. Uh, but that does mean that I'm missing five and a half days, which is a lot more than I was missing before because we're not missing or we're not working on the weekends. So I will say that I'm very appreciative to have Saturday to work. It gives me an extra day back in the office. Um, there have been comments that this is significantly more than they thought it was going to be. And I've had to reassure them that once we get back in person, we will be meeting on the weekends um, like we historically have. So I, I absolutely understand from the state's perspective, um, but I do want to recognize that for those of us that are um, working in occupations that we have to go back to, um, that this is not a part of that scope, that, that sometimes the weekends is the time that we have to give um, that makes it easier for us as well. I, I think that in terms of international management, um, that's probably, I, I think that they're reasonable to cut down on most of these in terms of, of everything I didn't, here where we were going to put drift gillnet hard caps. Um, I heard that you wanted to cut it down, but I do think that this is a really important topic that we do need to keep on the agenda. Um, it's something that I've heard come up from other council members about, you know, we need to manage this fishery. Um, but I've also heard from fishermen, my phone blew up at lunch from, from guys calling and saying, <laughs> please, please advocate for keeping this on the agenda. So, um, just wanting to know if that were to go off of Saturday, may, I may have missed it, but where that would go if um, it isn't going to stay on Saturday. Thanks, Chris. I don't think there was a, a uh, call to move uh, DGN off of Saturday uh, yet, but um, John Ugaritz. Yeah, thank you, um, Chuck. And and while I appreciate Ms. Fenson's comments, um, I also work a full-time job. And while we are conducting council meetings, I often work extra hours on those council days. And if we work on weekends, that is additional hours. So I want to be clear that there is an extreme workload for the agency representatives on the council. And that while non-agency council members have agreed to participate on the council, um, I, I do strongly advocate against meeting on weekends. And yes, I concur uh, both with uh, Ms. Fenson and, and Chuck that we should keep and we do need to keep the DGN hard cap item on the agenda. I was just suggesting marginally decreasing the time, but keeping it on Saturday and keeping it on the agenda as it's stated right now. Thanks, uh, Ryan. <clears throat> there we go. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, I I, I want to uh, take a couple things here. Um, uh, first of all, I 
Uh, I share uh, some of the concerns uh, raised by John um, regarding the weekend. I was NIMS also uh, had put in a plug for maintaining our current um, agendas with weekends off, um, but I understand that that was in the position of, of others, but would share his point that uh, we um, take that into account if we are going to be virtual again in September. Um, regarding the HMS agenda items, um, I could support what John put forward regarding the reduced times. You know, we will have a report out on the international from the Tropical Tuna meeting at IATTC and, and some prep for the August meeting, but I still think we could do that in an hour, as well as his other um, proposed kind of a shifting and reductions. Um, regarding EFPs, uh, I do I would want to maintain that agenda item. I do believe we will have some, um, although I think an hour is fine. Uh, and to your question, Chuck, uh, in your overview, um, just as a reminder, you know, if we do get buoy gear ones there, they would not qualify under one of the limited entry tiers as, as was decided at the last meeting in March. Uh, but there could be um, council recommendations. It could be authorized at least. Um, until the formal gear authorization is implemented. Uh, and that's it for NIPS. Okay, thanks. Karen. Thank you. I, I just wanted to concur. I'm not gonna speak to the weekend uh, scheduling issue, although I, I uh, uh, prefer no weekend work, but I, I think that there are so many competing issues there. I'm not going to weigh in on that. Uh, however, um, I support the the estimation that that John gave for those items and, and think that we can be efficient with that uh, in June. So I, I support the movement of the bycatch report to Friday and three hours for hard caps. Okay, thanks. Uh, Butch. Thank you, Chuck. By sympathizing with the state and federal workers that just spoke, we'd like to remind this council that we represent people that work seven days a week, 14 to 18 to 20 hours a day. Don't stop working until the work's done have to have fish delivered for Saturday, Saturday markets uh, uh, to get to the public and what have you. So um, although I sympathize, you know, with the, with the time that people have to spend with their family, but I also am a little more sympathetic with people that uh, are out on the water, you know, risking their lives and, and working, uh, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day. So for me, um, the Saturday, you know, this one time June virtual Saturday works fine. Um, since, uh, you know, when we're in person, we work over the weekend and Sunday also, even Easter one time. So anyway, um, I'm sorry if I disagree with fellow, some of my fellow council members, but I would just like to remind people of that also. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks, Butch. Phil Anderson. Uh, thanks, Chuck. I'm just speaking in favor of the recommendations that John made relative to modifying the time um, periods allotted to the various agenda items. And um, I am not going to get into the other the weekend debate. Thanks, Phil. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, I guess I would also note that, uh, you know, what's on what day right now is uh, not necessarily uh, where, where we will end up. I don't want to get into it particularly, um, but, uh, <clears throat> but some of that uh, might still be in flux and uh, be dependent upon how we schedule advisory bodies and whatnot, so. Um, Okay, well, it does, is there any other comment on the uh, June HMS items? Mark. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I just, I mean, I, I defer to 
uh, John on, on the timing for these HMS items. If that does free up time on Saturday, uh, then the, the question will be, what do we fill it with? And um, I wonder if it does not, doesn't make sense to consolidate the HMS on one day or whether, I don't know whether that's a good or bad idea, but it, 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 it makes some, some sense. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, I, again, uh, you know, depending on where, where we end up uh, with our time estimates and what's on the agenda and when advisory bodies meeting meet, uh, council will be arranging the schedule to make it as efficient as possible. Bill Anderson. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I mean, just one other point. If, if, if we're going to shorten up the time frame and we are going to create some additional time on Saturday, from, from where I sit, I would want to use that day fully. I, I mean, once, once I give up my Saturday, I've given up my opportunity to, to work on my boat. And so I want to make full use of that day. Um, so I, I'm not sure which way or where the, the winds were blowing there as to whether we were thinking about having a short Saturday or not, but I just would put in my, my uh, support that if we're going to, if we're going to work Saturday, then let's make full use of the day. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> um, well, uh, so I guess uh, before I guess before we leave those uh, particular items, um, I I just would uh, also note that of course public comment can play heavily into how long agenda items take too. So um, I guess keep that in mind as as we go forward. But being that as it may, uh, if we accept those uh, estimates at this point. <clears throat> um, why don't we why don't we move on a little bit and uh, and then uh, maybe we can if we need to we can circle back uh, to those uh, time estimates uh, later. So um, so then I guess I would <clears throat> ask uh, instead of why, why don't we continue a little bit with the HMS theme here um, and just see if there's anything uh, on the out meetings that uh, the council uh, wants to deal with again. Uh, most things are are fairly set. The only shaded item is in November, which is the swordfish management and monitoring plan. Um, and just kind of curious if there's any thoughts about uh, uh, about those um, out meeting agenda items. Okay, I'm not seeing any. Ryan. Thanks, Chuck. Just, I was just going to say that from NIMS perspective, we, we support the year to glance at the way it is structured already, uh, currently for HMS things. Okay. Very good. Thanks. Okay. Well, <clears throat> then why don't we, uh, um, I guess if, is there, maybe I'll just ask John since he's got a conflict, if there's anything else he needs to discuss, uh, before we just kind of move on to our regular business here. No, thank you. And I appreciate you and the uh, councils accommodating that. So I'm good with what's been discussed. Thank you. Okay. So um, Chris, maybe you could put up a attachment four now uh, just to help people out. But uh, so we're, so why don't we just tackle the, the June meeting itself? Um, so uh, we've got uh, <clears throat> um, the the things that are you know scheduled. Uh, I, I guess if there's any uh, thoughts about what we uh, might be able to um, dispense with, if there are anything, we've heard some uh, some testimony along those lines. I think from the gap in GMT, um, particularly associated with the ground fish workload. <clears throat> um, I don't know if there's any other uh, subtractions, I guess, at this point is kind of what, what I'm looking at, uh, looking at doing so we know what we've got to work with when we go to add things in. 
Bob Dooley. Yes, thank you, Chuck. Um, I, I'm I'm looking to talk about an addition, so I just I'll stand down until we get to that point, but I'll probably leave my hand up. So, okay, uh, Ryan. Uh, uh, given Bob's comments, maybe I'm unclear. Are we? What What would you like to hear from now? It's things we want to. Exactly. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's if there's anything that we can, uh, you know, uh, eliminate from the June agenda, you know, and I guess I'm thinking particularly about the ones we've heard uh, testimony on from advisory bodies, uh, which was specifically the ground fish workload, new management measures, <clears throat> but anything else that's on there that people um, think we could uh, uh, trim up so that uh, we know exactly how much time we're going to be have to work with when we go to add things in. Okay. Um, well, I'm happy to start with subtractions then, at least ones that NIMS would support. I mean, we would support the advisory body recommendations that we heard in public comment of um, uh, removing the workload and new management measures uh, for a, a lot, a, a, quite a number of the reasons that we've heard from those advisory bodies and, and public comment. So we would support that. Um, we are uh, still looking. I'm not. I'm not 100% certain we will have a lot under the groundfish nymphs report. Um, we are still running that to ground right now, uh, but it's possible we could submit our rulemaking um, document as as an informational item. Um, I should have more for you on a moment on that in a moment. And just wanted to note, um, at least from. NIMS perspective, we've we've started the clock on the fixed gear catch here review. Um, so should the council want, no, I'm not necessarily advocating moving it, but at least from NIMS perspective, if the council was looking for time, that uh, we, that's something at least that could be, um, in our view, potentially postponed. Uh, and I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Uh, Marcy. Yes, thank you, Chuck. Um, yeah, certainly echo the support to remove the workload and new management measure item uh, that was recommended by the GMT in the gap. Um, I guess I am curious to hear, I, I think, well, the other recommendations I might have for June are kind of contingent on um, the readiness of certain items. Um, do we have input on Sant Coho and its readiness? And maybe you can refresh me on whiting utilization and its readiness. Uh, thanks, Marcy. I, I think I'll let uh, Ryan uh, speak to the Sant Coho business. Yeah, thanks, Chuck, and thanks, Marcy, for question. This would have been number one on my list for for additions. Um, yeah, we will be ready. Um, you know, there there is some some significant work to do uh, still a little bit, but um, the work group will be able to focus on that just prior to this meeting to complete that. Um, there really is one additional council meeting between June uh, and our decision deadline for November for final action to, for the council to provide revisions and, and additional guidance uh, on this. So we, we do believe this will be ready. We would like to see this um, restored to the agenda. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> and um, Marcy, did, it, <clears throat> did I, was, was the second one you asked about the, uh, was it the mothership utilization yes. or was it? Yes, thank you. <clears throat> um, well, uh, we we don't have that scheduled for June, and it was not on the uh, candidates list. Uh, so right now, we've got it in September, uh, not shaded, for a range of alternatives and pulmonary preferred alternatives. So that that's that's where we stand right now. Um, I I'm not sure where uh, you know if that's. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if moving it up is an, is an option. I, I think I would have to have some more consultations with staff. And sure, thank you. I, I was just curious. I had seen it underlined. Um, and so I just was wondering if there was new information available. Um, I, I, I guess I should uh, I speak to EM. Um, 
I, I think we have heard loud and clear that we need to hear EM. Um, June is probably the best choice uh, that will give the council time to formulate recommendations uh, in time for NIMS to um, think about them uh, in advance of uh, their scheduled implementation date of January 1, 2022. I think we've uh, seen broad support for that. Uh, I appreciate the letter that we received from uh, representatives of every uh, EM, EFP, uh, supporting scheduling mm -hmm. this item. So I, I feel that um, we certainly need to hear it and I think June is probably the best time. Um, I, <laughs> I think you were just asking about uh, items to remove. So I think I'm gonna just stop. Thank you. Thank you. And so I, I and so did <clears throat> did you uh, express the uh, workload management, the brownfish workload management measures? Are you uh, did you express an opinion I, on I that? I did at yeah, the so. onset. Absolutely, yes. Thank okay. You. Um, well, maybe let's just focus on that one. Is there anybody that uh, does not uh, would, would like to preserve that on the June agenda, the ground fish workload management process? So if there are, just open your mic and tell me. Chuck, this is Heather. Um, I, I did want to talk about it. I, I mean, I support removing it in the traditional sense that we consider groundfish workload and, and uh, new management measure priorities, um, but also was thinking back to the discussion earlier in the week on cost recovery um, issues and the idea of potentially moving up the scoping of the, the five-year review um, to include total program costs and and similarly, the idea of um, reinstating the cost recovery committee, which we've heard from NIMS, they would want to do um, in the scope of groundfish workloads. So um, just wanted to make sure that if there was a place for those discussions um, to happen, even if we you know, remove the workload and new management measure traditional <laughs> agenda item. So I just wanted to offer that thought. Thanks. Yeah, well, uh, thanks. I appreciate you bringing those up because those, I think those do bear on whether we have this agenda item or not. Because in my, uh, my opinion, uh, I, I think that, that if we're going to talk about <clears throat> adding uh, ground fish workload at the June meeting, that we should preserve this agenda item and do it under there. Um, otherwise, we, you know, we could drop it, but then we'd have to add something else in to do it. And so uh, that was that's the purpose of this agenda item. So, if the council wants to have a discussion about <clears throat> uh, about keeping it on to serve that purpose, then uh, that, that's I guess what, kind of what we're here to talk about. So. Um, well, I'm going to go keep going down the list, uh, I think. Um, Bob? Yes. Thanks, Chuck. I, um, it's, still, it's, a, it's really reinforcing kind of what Mar uh, Marcy had talked about on EM, and I just want to make a point on that. And I would, uh, I would say that it's really important to put that on the agenda, keep it in, in, and elevate it, unshade it. I think that... Uh, we heard earlier in March about the, the importance of, uh, of of understanding where this where this EM is is developing and what and and uh, and whether there's a a decision that needs to be made in June that may come from new information that we will be receiving in the in the bigger context of of how EM is developing in other regions and may inform us. So my concern here is that we craft, if it's elevated, I'm totally supportive of that, and I, I think it's important. Um, if it's elevated, that we craft the agenda item in such a way that the council is able to make a decision, should we need to delay implementation or any of those things, I'm not saying we will, but if we do need to, that we have the ability to make that decision 
because I remember in March, I believe Phil had a motion and we didn't have it crafted correctly. And uh, I am, I'm, I'm worried that we, if, if the, if, if we have information that, that, that comes forth that uh, suggests we need to de delay implementation, we need to make that decision in June so that regulatorily it can be in place by January. At least that's what happened last time. So I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I want to make sure that we do have the tool in our toolbox to make that happen. So um, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Um, Heather, you guys still have your hand up. Uh, Maggie? Thank you, Chuck. Um, this is back to the issue of the ground fish workload and prioritization item. Um, and I, I, I'm sorry if I, I missed something, even though I was listening, I, I heard your recommendation to, uh, to leave it if we were going to consider adding something to ground fish workload. Um, and I, I thought that the discussion had been around um, talking about, uh, I guess, when to say that we would like to include addressing total catch share program cost in the scope of the um, next five-year review. And I guess I, I don't see that as adding anything, and that could probably be done under a maybe another agenda item. Um, but did I, can I just ask for some more clarification on that? Did I miss a, a piece? Thanks. Uh, well, yeah, so and, and maybe it's me that's missing a piece, but, uh, you know, I guess, I guess based on what I heard earlier in the week, there were some thoughts about maybe starting the uh, next five, next uh, catch share review early so that that topic could be included or, and, and so I, you know, I'm just, uh, I, I guess I'm just, like I say, if there's, if there's thoughts about adding something that's going to, you know, affect the priorities already established, um, then I think we should be, you know, doing it, doing it through the workload planning agenda item, the groundfish workload planning agenda item. So, you know, so I'm, I'm not sure if, if there is a, you know, as you said, another agenda item that we could do this under, or, you know, if it's, um, you know, so I, I, I don't know, is it something that would, um, you know, I don't know where it would come in under the NIMS report, and that's not a council action item specifically. So, um, workload planning, I, I don't, I'm not, I guess I'm not sure where, where it would come if, if we didn't have, we got to have something for it. We have a home for it, <laughs> but I'm willing to, you know, listen to what uh, council's ideas are. Certainly. Thanks, Chuck. That was really helpful. Um, it, it, I'll say my my impression of the discussion we had earlier in the week uh, would not be to move up the start of the next five-year review, but simply to give an indication that total program cost is going to be an, you know, one of the important topics we want to address in the review, uh, primarily to maybe give a heads up to staff that uh, we would like to get you know, as, as soon as we do start, we'd like to hit the ground running with information available on that. And I would say perhaps the discussion at this meeting has accomplished that part of that objective. Um, and I would leave it maybe to your direction and council discussion if we need to do anything more formal for that. Um, I, and I guess one other part, I'll just acknowledge that if there is separate discussion about also reconvening the cost recovery committee, um, then I would certainly see that as appropriate for a discussion in the context of a, a holistic look at ground fish workload priorities because of the possible implications for other already prioritized items. Thanks, Th thanks Maggie. Yeah, yeah so uh, 
appreciate that. And, and I don't know, perhaps, perhaps that is sufficient. I mean, perhaps that's enough for uh, council and then staff to talk about uh, talk about that when we start planning out the next, they're actually six year reviews so that they fall outside of the spec cycle. Um, so, uh, you know, and I think they're, it's scheduled to start up in 2022 and we've already starting to see uh, 2022 meetings on our year at a glance. So, um, you know, I don't know, we'll, perhaps, perhaps that was sufficient, but, but, uh, but also a point well taken that uh, depending on the, the scope of what's being suggested, we may need to think about uh, how we schedule that. Marcy. Yeah, um, thank you. I I had thought that possibly because the five-year review is already on our year at a glance, though it may not appear because it's we don't have it actually created that far out, it's, it's required that we conduct the review. So we know that agenda item is going to commence in 2022. So my thought, looking at what we have on the year at a glance uh, in front of us, which um, isn't very far forward into 22, but we have an initial look at least at a few meetings. Um, March is traditionally a light, lighter ground fish meeting. Um, there does appear to be room in March. Um, I had kind of envisioned that where we were going with this would be to schedule something like a pre-scoping or a scoping part one of um, the five-year review and possibly, um, you know, at that time we identify uh, the interest in focusing um, one element or the major element or um, something like that on the topic of um, reducing costs. So anyway, that was sort of how I thought um, we might look at that moving forward. And I feel like um, because it is a, a standing item that will appear on our year to glance anyway, I, I didn't feel like um, we'd need to discuss that uh, again in workload prioritization. Um, and so that's why I'm, you know, certainly comfortable removing workload prioritization for June um, and then signal now that that might be our intent for March. And then, you know, if there are comments on that, um, we take take those comments and think about them. But um, I guess that would be my suggestion for a path forward. Okay, um, that's fine. And so maybe, maybe the answer here is to, instead of wrestling about June, is to just put something uh, even shaded on the year at a glance in March for get your plan uh, review scoping. Does that sound like a solution and that way it's there it's in our it's on our radar screen if we need to move it out later we can do that thank you yes that's that's what i was proposing okay thanks okay so uh i, I think what i've heard then is that uh most people are okay with eliminating ground fish workload and new management measure update in June, which gives us one more hour. So is there anything else that people want to uh, um, trim, I guess? Okay, not seeing any, then, um, then let's take a look at what we've got in the, uh, candidate box. Uh, again, we've got two administrative items, standardized bycatch reporting. Um, that's a uh, requirement that if we need to amend our uh, fishery management plans, we need to do so by February of 2022. So that would be the first of a three meeting process uh, to do that. Um, there's staff, well, we had a, a preliminary look at that uh, with the advisory bodies, um, I think, back in March. Um, uh, so our council and the staff have been reviewing uh, the results of the sort of uh, running through the checklist as to um, whether our plans comply or not. It does look like um, there's a likelihood that 
uh, at least some of the plans will require some changes uh, either through an FMP amendment or perhaps some other mechanisms such as uh, changes to the safe documents. Um, it does not appear that the ground fish plan is one of those, but uh, but again, I think those uh, that's that's sort of the preliminary status of things. I think there's still some discussions that need to occur between uh, council and the staff before that decision is finalized or, or before those, you know, the appropriate pathways uh, are identified and those sorts of things. So, um, so that that's what I that's what I know about that one. Um, the preliminary regional operating agreement. This is a, our document that uh, talks that sort of lays out our um, agreement between the region, the science centers, general counsel, OLE, and uh, the council staff on how we um, uh, accomplish um, moving council actions through the through the process. And um, we've I think 2017 was the last time it was updated. Uh, so that this is something that's been on our radar screen for a year or so. Uh, this would be the first of two meetings uh, in June. Um, electronic monitoring update. Uh, we've had a little bit of discussion about that and the scope of that. Uh, I think Mr. Anderson's guidance in March uh, um, is relevant here. And I think that was what was originally contemplated. It sounds like there's maybe some interest in providing some additional flexibility for council action, depending on what occurs there. Uh, Sablefish gear switching, uh, range of alternatives. Um, again, we just uh, just uh, identified the uh, a, a limit, gear switching limit at this meeting that would uh, help inform analysis of the alternatives. Uh, that's uh, thought to be a pretty substantive issue uh, to deal with, uh, basically a full day. Um, Coast CPS uh, NIMS report, that's something that came up during the course of this council meeting. Again, it was um, something that Science Center, uh, Southwest Science Center, I think, um, had a desire to, uh, to report on. Um, so we added that in. And then uh, the Salmon Sonk Co ESA consultation, again, a uh, process driven by uh, litigation, the need to update uh, um, ESA consultations um, on that, uh, ostensibly by November of this year. Um, and then uh, the one other thing that uh, came up during, um, during the reports was the four state report and consideration of uh, adding uh, some marine planning, an opportunity to discuss uh, marine planning or perhaps plan for marine planning. Uh, how, are, how are we gonna move forward um, with that? So I have some assignments to staff to bring back some uh, analysis of, uh, of what it would take to, to uh, do that and uh, some of the models suggested. Um, and uh, whether that's a, a standalone item or uh, is something that uh, might be considered under membership appointments and council operating procedures. Uh, uh, we can have that discussion, but I think re regardless of where it ends up, uh, it's gonna take more time than we've got on the agenda uh, for those things right now. And I guess I would also add that, uh, you know, it's, I suppose it's possible we might have um, some other business uh, under marine planning. Again, we've, um, been uh, you know discussing things with uh, with Bohm in particular about uh, uh, perhaps having some um, workshops and seeing what activities are occurring uh, in their uh, in their world and if something comes up we may uh, find a need to have something on the council agenda to deal with to deal with that so uh, that's a, anyway that's a possibility I, I think we should. Uh, plan uh, at, at a minimum for an hour for that uh, for that item. Now, again, whether it's standalone or incorporated into something else. So those are the things that we've uh, kind of got to uh, to move up. I mean, if you if you add up what's there, uh, that's uh, 2, 3, 11, 14, 15, 16, 17 hours. Uh, we've got about two, 
about eight hours, eight hours uh, of time if we want to keep it to a five and a half day meeting. So I will pause there and uh, see if there's any uh, additional thoughts about what's in the candidate box. Ryan. Thank you, Chuck. Um, yeah, a few thoughts. Uh, you've already heard my uh, recommendation on Song Coho. Um, I think that's very important for NIMS to have that restored, the ROA PPA discussions, and we will be, the working group uh, report will be ready. Um, regarding uh, SBRM, yeah, I, I agree with your points, Chuck. I, I do think it's important to have this on the agenda. Um, as I believe folks are aware, uh, this was established by rule published in January 2017. That provided five years for us to develop and implement this by February 21, 2022. So I, I really don't think we can, we can delay any further uh, on that. Uh, and we need to get that process started. Um, regarding the CPS NIMS support, NIMS would support putting on the NIMS report for CPS for the purposes that was discussed earlier in this meeting. Uh, I have confirmed with the center that they will be ready to report out on the, I think the research priorities from the SSC that was prioritized by the MT and, and discussed last Friday, as well as a potential timeline for addressing those. So, so I, they will be ready to report back out in June. Um, we would, NIMS would also support having the regional operating agreement uh, on the agenda. Um, as you know, Chuck, we've had some, some good discussions with you and, uh, and council staff on, um, on this issue. It's, it's, it's relevant in my opinion. Um, it, it will be ready for at least a preliminary discussion. It's relevant actually very much so for workload planning uh, and, and, and future conduction of council business. So we would support that. Um, and then I wanted to talk about EM since there's been a number of comments already. Um, you know, NIMS, uh, per my recollection, my notes here from the June council meeting, we had um, a number of, of, of information updates uh, that was requested by Phil. Um, and I'm looking at the document now, would request us to provide the council with the following types of information. It had, and it had a number of things on there, increased cost information, cost per C day, um, completed video protocols, update on the provider application process, et cetera. And so it's NIMS perspective, we were planning to do it, prepare for as much of these as we can. Obviously a number of those requests uh, that were made to us in March require us get um, information from the providers. So well, we, we don't control that, but we are working with them and we're, we're doing the best we can. And we should at least have some updates uh, for June. I believe we now actually have costs finally from Pacific States. And so we at least have some updates that will be ready for June. We were planning to um, provide that the, the updates requested by the uh, Phil and others here in workload planning in March under the Groundfish NIMS report. Um, I struggle to support an, an, an EM standing agenda item on its own separately, um, as uh, uh, you know, NIMPS would not be supportive of any additional delays to this program, and, and it's, it's very challenging for me to understand what type of action, um, considering third-party implementation begins in January of 2022. Um, that would be that would be something we could support. So our preference would be to just provide the update that we requested, the information updates that were laid out in Phil's um, uh, document that he showed on the screen in March, as well as some of the other requests that came in on discussion at that meeting shortly there afterwards. And I'll stop there. That's NIMS overarching comments on June. Do we lose Chuck? 
Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Can I ask the same? Sorry, I had my mic pointed up. Um, uh, so, uh, Phil, um, are you able to join us? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. That that was that was my bad. <laughs> Here I was calling for you to, to fix your tech, and it was my tech that was the problem. <laughs> oh, well, Thanks. for once it wasn't me. Um, <laughs> I, I have just a couple um, thoughts here on, on these. Um, I don't want to get into a big um, argument over whether EM is an up, uh, on the NIMPS uh, report or a standalone, because I'm not sure it matters um, at the end of the day, um, unless um there's a we are totally precluded from taking any kind of an action and i'm not sure what that would be if it were simply included under the nymphs report and there's no opportunity for council action um so that's the one concern i would have there and and i totally understand where ryan and national marine fishery service is and and i i get that um and I think you totally understand some of the concerns and apprehensions and questions that, that we have and, and the people that are going to be affected by it have. So uh, I want to make sure we have an opportunity for public comment, comment from our, our uh, in particular, the gap in the GMT is appropriate um, uh, relative to, to the report. So the, 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 that's my reaction to those uh, thoughts. My regarding the sable fish gear switching, um, I don't know exactly when the June, the deadline for the June briefing book is. Uh, Chuck, do you have to have that, Andy? And and if not, I I I don't. It's probably not very far off. Um, and I'm just, and, and I think your eight hours, you know, I could argue whether it's seven or six or eight, but it's a long time. There's, there's no two ways about that. Uh, uh, so, so I am thinking uh, that it, and I, and I, it's a high priority for me, um, you know, I, as well, I, along with a bunch of other people and my colleagues around the table have a lot invested. Uh, but at the same time, I want to make sure that that we have adequate time uh, to take that up. And we also have adequate time to make sure we're ready uh, to identify the range of alternatives. And that leads me to think that uh, September might be a better option for this. Um, and I, I'm sure some people are, are gasping that, oh my goodness, we've been at this so long, how can you suggest such a thing? Um, but, you know, as I see what's going on in the fishery right now, um, partly due to the pandemic, um, we have some increases in, in ACLs, uh, all those, those things we talked about the other day, that whether a three-month delay in identifying the range of alternatives at the end of the day is going to make a, a difference, I, I, I'm questioning that. So rather than try to shoehorn it into this June meeting, which is already full, I'm just, I would put out there uh, uh, at least a consideration for having us take that up in September and give us time to be sure we are ready so that we can take the next step when we, after we uh, devote this kind of more time to the topic. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, Heather. Well, thanks, Chuck. I, um, I'll say I contemplated taking my, my hand down after hearing um, what Phil offered. Um, I was just going to express my support for um, making sure we got the electronic monitoring update um, that Bob, Bob brought up earlier in this conversation and, and appreciate the input from Ryan on that. And then also uh, share my thoughts on um, the gear switching and, and whether or not 
um, there would be enough time in June. I just saw a lot of flexibility, not a lot, um, more flexibility in the September agenda to to cover that and, and thought we could do so without maybe losing the, the momentum um, on it and give give time to get a, a really, um, all the anal analysts and, and folks together so that, that we have um, an efficient discussion in September. So um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Maggie. Thank you, Chuck. Um, and thanks to those who preceded me with comments. Um, I, I agree with those. Um, I, I have been <laughs> moving puzzle pieces around all morning on a, a list here of upcoming meetings and ground fish items. Um, and thinking not just about council agenda time, but also about GMT time and capacity as well as uh, industry and gap and it's it's um, it, you know it's it's Im impossible to to think about it in in isolation um, we I just wanted to pick up on a comment earlier that it would be possible to postpone the fixed gear program review scoping item um, However, I, I will say that following on a, a, the discussion we've been having about uh, potentially not feeling ready to take up a gear switching range of alternatives until September, then just in terms of, of timing, I think it would make sense to keep the fixed gear program review scoping in June. Um, it, you know, I do want I am just worried about, you know, in, in talking about uh, potentially not and to potentially postponing a gear switching range of alternatives beyond June, I'm, I'm really struggling uh, because I'm, I'm just worried about the pileup ahead of us at future meetings. Um, so if folks are feeling like it would be possible to keep that in September uh, while also retaining the mothership utilization preliminary preferred alternative in September. And I know this is getting out beyond us and I'll stop in a second so that we can talk about the year at a glance, but it's, they're all connected. Um, and then making sure we can take up non-trawl RCA in November, um, then I, I, I guess I would be okay with postponing gear switching beyond June if necessary. I, I will say, just offer my thoughts. Uh, specifically on what needs to be done before the council is prepared to consider adopting a range of alternatives for gear switching. You know, we have the, the, those developed by the SAMTAC committee, uh, plus I think one other uh, that had been proposed for our consideration last November. Uh, certainly there is some more, uh, a little bit more that could be done with them now based on the guidance we provided earlier at this meeting. Uh, but I, I am not seeing a big need for any uh, or much further analysis before we get to the step of adopting a range and just specifying the, the types of mechanisms that we want to be able to consider for potentially limiting gear switching. Um, I, I think there would, you know, the significant analytical lift would would come after adoption of a range, both for Jim and Jesse and for the GMT. Um, but I, I certainly recognize that we do need time to understand what is being proposed for selection of a range and, and to make sure um, that everyone's prepared to do that. So I, I, I was hopeful for June, but I, I am hearing the, the concerns around the table that we might not be prepared in June. Thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Uh, Bob. Oh, sorry, Phil, you're up next. Just real quick. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Maggie, for those those thoughts. Um, I just had a question and, and I'm I don't get me wrong. I'm not I'm not trying to suggest I wouldn't support trying to do this in June. So um, but 
in in your thinking, were you thinking about the potential of moving the fixed year catch air review to September, make for trying to create some space to do the gear switch piece in June? Yes, that had been my original thinking. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Bob. Thank you, Chuck. And Phil and, and Maggie both, thank you for um, thinking about a little outside the box there on the on gear switching. I, I would, in the interest of, or in the spirit of trying to think about what's already been done, it, you know, from being part of the SAMTAC and being part of the cab and all of that, there's been a lot of analysis and a lot of on the options that I believe was done. And, you know, uh, that we have, a lot of that work is, is, is there. Maybe it's not in the right format. And I think now that we have decided this week on a cap that are max, that maybe that could be, uh, you know, could adjust the, alter the, the alternatives that have been brought forward and the council has seen, and uh, that maybe this lift isn't as large to get the range of alternatives as we think that there, you know, there has been, and, and there are some adjustments that need to be made, but I'd be interested to hear from Phil and, and, and Maggie both that whether that gives a different lens on, on the workload to actually develop that range. Uh, if, particularly if it was, I hate to even think about this, but if it was preceded by maybe in, um, some, some work on trying to adjust the alternatives that are there, maybe by the SAMTAC, maybe. I, I don't, you know, not, not wedded to it, just trying to think here. Um, then maybe we could come with a more um, cohesive range of alternatives that fit the decision yesterday. So just, to, just thinking outside the box and trying to get a better picture and maybe be informative to people that aren't as steeped in this as, as the three of us are. So thank you. Thanks, Bob. I, uh, I, I think it's, I think this, this is a good discussion going on about uh, about sable fish and the fixed gear review, um, you know, and and I guess as I kind of look out a little, you know, a little further beyond September, we obviously get into the specs business and um, and schedules start to you know, get uh, get full, and um, uh, there's there's other priorities that come into play. So, um, so I, I think I'm, I'm interested in maybe exploring this idea a little more about uh, kind of moving the catch your review scoping out and uh, doing some uh, some business on on uh, the gear switching uh, sooner rather than later I think there might be some merit to that <laughs> but I I think one thing that um, we need to find out and I, and I think I think from a council staff perspective uh, we I, I haven't talked to my staff specifically about that trade-off but i think it's i think it's probably um within our capacity to do that but but uh we're, we aren't the only ones uh, that need to have some time to put into this so i don't know if, if uh, how nymphs feels about uh their ability to participate or, or frankly their need to participate at the alternative development stage but uh but i'd like to hear what they have to say about that. Ryan. Chuck, I'm sorry, five minutes. Later. Are you talking about whether we would be ready for a gear switching discussion in June? Yes. Yeah. Um, we're, we're, I didn't put that in my opening co comments because uh, we're, we can do either, really. If, if, if the council wants to schedule gear switching, um, we're, we can support that discussion, at least at the ROA level for June. Um, I had similar thoughts to Maggie, um, thinking that in order to do so, something that with a rather large chunk of time would have to come off, which is why I raised the fixed gear catch air review as a, as a possibility. 
Um, but again, uh, happy to go with the council's preference on, on the, either one of those. I, I would also support Maggie's comments, if, if we don't put gear switching on June, that we should go ahead with the catch share scoping so that it doesn't add to, to further things uh, for future agendas. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Phil. Yeah, after thinking about this a little bit more and, and also looking at the dates of the June council meeting, which is toward the end of the month, uh, giving us at least a, a week or more than than I had in in my head in terms of when it usually is, um, but I just put out there that let's uh, let's try to accommodate our gear switching item in June and move our fixed gear catch fixed gear catch share review to uh, September. Okay, uh, Krista. Yeah, um, and just a question, I guess, or, or something for all of us to think about. Um, and that is that um, come September, we may have um, a different council makeup. I mean, nobody knows what the future is, um, but we are in the process of having nominations. And I don't know if it matters that we start down the path um, and may have new people, or if it, if it would be better to have a range of alternatives and just have those folks work all the way through. But I did, um, want some feedback from folks that have been through this process more than myself um, in, in terms of kind of what that looks like for something um, that we have spent a lot of time on and I would think would want to have continuity um, as we work through the process. Uh, thanks, Krista. I'm not, I'm not sure I totally, uh, so are, are you referring to the council member appointments that are going to be occurring this, this cycle? Correct. Yeah. Uh, and I, it may not matter, do you know what I mean? It, it may not matter at all, but I just, in terms of bringing people in, bringing them in in the midst of the process versus having them start out of the process, um, just wanting your thoughts or others' thoughts on that. Well, so council members appointments is something I try and stay as far away from as I possibly can, but, uh, but I will make an exception at this time. And, you know, I think it's just, it's something that, uh, that we have to deal with every year. Uh, there's, there's turnover, turnover pretty much every year, uh, issues, uh, are in various stages, uh, all the time. And, uh, frankly, I, I don't think we could, uh, I don't think we should expect to try and, arrange our uh, uh, workload planning, our agenda planning, based on who's who's in what seats. Um, we just have to trust that we will have good people there and they'll make good decisions. And uh, um, regardless, uh, everybody's welcome to be part of the process. So uh, I guess I would not think that that's something we should not be too worried about. It. Great answer and, and wise man, thank you. Okay, uh, Maggie. Thanks, Chuck. Um, <laughs> I kind of wanted another bite at the, the apple I put out there when I suggested a preference for June, which, which remains, um, but realizing that uh, when, when we went through this process of scheduling a gear switching range last fall and, and I advocated for it coming up sooner than some others and then we found that the council was not ready to take that step, um, I guess I would, I would be really looking to my colleagues around the virtual table here to uh, express any reservations they have. I, I, do, I don't want to set us up for the same situation in June. So, you know, I, I have an expectation that there is not a lot of, of analysis or work needed prior to adopting a range of alternatives, but um, others may have different perspectives and, and maybe better, better appreciation for that than me. So I, I wanted to make sure we had some thorough discussion of that. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Um, <clears throat> And I'm just getting, I'm kind of catching up with some of my uh, staff comments here. Um, 
it looks like uh, there's no, nobody's, uh, have any, uh, or my, my staff doesn't have any problem with the switch either. So that that's, that's good. We have that flexibility there. Uh, Louis Zem. Well, thank you, Chuck. And uh, thank you, Maggie, for being hopeful and trying to uh, move this subject along. I still have fears, and other people expressed it, that the involved parties uh, are, so, are still so far apart that uh, I'm not sure if you're going to see very much success or support um, for any, uh, any real progress. Um, I hope they will. And that is why I was thinking about September for this, uh, hoping that in the ensuing months that we gave extra, there'd be time for negotiation. Uh, however, I do recognize that it may not matter how much time there is for negotiation. So that's what I wanted to impart is uh, my fear that there's a, going to be a lack of negotiation. And I sure hope that people get together and come up with something that the whole industry can support. Thank you. Thanks, Louis. Brad. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, great con conversation here, discussion. Um, I like the way this is going. I think the, the rationale has been pretty solid for maybe for uh, keeping gear switching in June or moving into June. Um, I don't know if waiting is going to make people closer. I think you, you need to move ahead and people are going to at some point in time um, come to the table. And so um, delaying it isn't going to help that issue. Um, so um, I know this is... A, yeah, the, the workload is always, uh, it's, it's a, it's a zero-sum game. It's always hard. A lot of people have a lot of needs and, and wants, and uh, uh, but I like the way it's um, it's going, and I, it'd be nice to clear some of my stuff off the table, get it done sooner than later, and so we could um, get to other things um, uh, in the future or so. Uh, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. Um, well, I think it sounds like we've, we're coming to um a desired approach to have stable fish gear switching on in june to consider a range of alternatives and then moving out fixed gear catch your review to september um so uh there's uh, two things i want to say about that one is uh so that's a net cost of adding four hours um, um and then um so uh, well, before I do the, do the math on how many hours we got, I also did want to circle back around to the electronic monitoring discussion that we have been having. Um, so uh, I, I think when we left that, there was uh, a couple things I heard. Uh, I heard from NIMS that they were planning on providing the informational update uh, based on what was requested in March during their NIMS report on groundfish. So, so if I've got that right, that to me, I guess that would uh, explain why that's an hour, uh, hour long uh, agenda item. Um, and then uh, what I also heard from some council members were that they were interested in um, having that uh, discussion um, around electronic monitoring uh, have the potential for, uh, for, that, for the council to take some action. Uh, under that on that topic. Uh, and so that would not be possible under the NIFS report. That's a non-council action item. So um, so I guess I would like to circle back around and see uh, one, um, you know, what, again, what, what the scope of that agenda item is, you know, is it expanding beyond what was requested in March? If it is, I think it needs to be um, a standalone item and, uh, you know, and uh, obviously longer than the, than the, uh, just the uh, update from NEMS on, on, on those requests. Um, so, um, 
let me let me pause there and because uh, because I do I do want to make sure that we are all on the same page for this one. So, uh, Brad, is that is your hand still up or is it new newly up? Okay, Phil. Yeah, thanks, Chuck, and and just again, I I understand and um, respect um, Ryan's comments and and how NIMPS is proceeding. Um, and I, you know, I I, I get that. Um, at the same time, we're we're hopefully going to be receiving some information and. We may want to um, provide some recommendations, guidance um, to National Range Fishery Service based on what we hear. If it and I, I, you know, I have gotten caught. We, you know, or the council or I or whatever, gotten caught where we have wanted to make some sort of a recommendation um, through a motion, but uh, the item um, was agendized such that a council action was not possible. And so I, um, my desire is to, to agendize this in such a way that we can receive the information, we can hear from our GMT and our GAP and our public, and if the council has some direction, guidance, recommendation to National Marine Fisheries Service that we're able to do it. And I, that's, I'm trying to avoid getting caught in the situation where we are, we are hand, we've handcuffed ourselves from uh, providing uh, guidance rec or recommendation or whatever it might be to, to NIMPS based on the information that we receive. Thanks, uh, Marcy. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I guess I, I I don't feel that a NIMS report or combining this with the NIMS report meets our original intent back in March when we added this candidate item. Uh, our intent in March was to follow through and have a more thorough discussion uh, at the um, recommendation of the participants um, who found themselves in March wanting to talk about a number of things. And, um, you know, I, I think the situation we were in in March was somewhat unfortunate, and yet I understand entirely uh, the bounds of our uh, agenda. But um, I feel like uh, we owe it to uh, the participants in this program to continue the discussion and have the ability to make recommendations um, on the full suite of um, topics that uh, involve EM. It's, it's a, a lengthy um, and detailed topic, and we certainly look forward to hearing new information. And I think uh, cutting it short uh, in a NIMS report and having um, basically, uh, only an ability for information to come out and not in, not recommendations to come back is is uh, falling short of what our intentions were in adding this item back in March. Thank you. And and so just let me let me be clear. I I I'm ho I hope I didn't put words in them's mouth as to what how they intended to do this, but that that was my understanding. But I guess I would ask for. Uh, for some clarification from NIMS on, on, on if that was their intent to address this under their NIMS report. But that's what I thought I heard. Ryan. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Um, what my intent behind that was to state that if there was not a separate agenda item, we would still be planning on providing the update that was requested in March to the best of our ability with the caveats I previously acknowledged that a number of the requests from the council um, were for things that are not in NIMPS purview, such as specific estimates from providers or further refined estimates from providers. So we will do the best in our ability. If there is not a standing agenda, item, we would have reported out during the groundfish NIMPS 
report. Um, Thank you. But I'd like to respond, if I can, mm -hmm. to to points earlier. I mean, I'm, 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 if the council wants to schedule a separate agenda item on this, I'd like to have some clarity today before we leave this meeting exactly what that action is. Um, because it, uh, it's unclear to me what recommendations are as a council action. Um, and, you know, is in, from what Phil was saying, I mean, I'm wondering if, if recommendations was really what an, the action was, or is this um, pro being proposed to be the first of a two meeting process for a regulatory change? If so, I would imagine that would have to be noticed quite clearly in, in the action item. And I'm still very unclear as to exactly what the request is from council members here for that action item. Excellent question. Mercy. Yeah, thank you, um, Chuck. Thank you, Ryan. I, I, I guess I fall back on the uh, quite excellent letter we received in our briefing book materials um, with the um, interest and um, list of items that's uh, that the group of EFP participants um, is wishing to continue uh, discussing. So um, I feel like that um, that was what I was uh, intending we contemplate in our discussions. Um, again, I think they follow um, squarely from our discussions in March. And um, while I, I should clarify that, there are six items that are contained um, by number in their, um, their letter. Uh, that they are expecting that NIMS provide, but then the, their recommendations follow in the next paragraph that would allow the council to have a thorough discussion on the information, but also allow for the council to determine if the proposed program does meet the EM program goals and objectives created by the council. The council shall also have the ability under the agenda item to make recommendations to NIMS for a course change if the council determines that the proposed program is not meeting the goals and objectives previously identified. So that was my thinking of the content of the agenda item that we go through in some detail and then decide if we need to do anything further. So that uh, to me sounds like a uh, sort of program review sort of uh, approach. We're gonna take a look at the program, uh, look at the objectives of the program and, and see if they meet them or not which frankly is something I, I thought was done in, in March. I, I think there was, if I recall incorrectly, there, there were some uh, statements addressing those, uh, those aspects. So um, so, I still think it's a, I think that's, and I guess based on what, what you just recited, Marcy, it, it seems like <clears throat> this may not be the first of two meetings, but it could kick off the first of two meetings, but, you know, obviously timing's pretty important when it comes to, comes to the program implementation. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's, I'm not sure, I am totally clear as to what the actions being contemplated are and how they would play out. Well, if I may, I, I, I think generally these agenda items usually culminate in a council action item that says provide guidance to NIMS. So um, I think I'm um struggling with trying to offer you more detail at this time 
but I'm just hearkening back to the March meeting where new information was received. Uh, I think in the gym pack, some discussions ensued. We found ourselves to be beyond what we had agendized, and I understood a council intent to continue those discussions and that we needed to agendize them. So um, that's that's all I'm looking for. Okay, Bob? Yeah, thanks, Chuck. <clears throat> I agree with Phil and Marcy. I couldn't say it any better than either one of them did. And I think that trying to figure out exactly what the decision will be in June, if this is put in the agenda, is pretty hard to predict because we have information coming. And I wouldn't think that all the information is just coming from NEMPS. We're going to probably have a lot more information that's coming from various, you know, uh, advisory panels and public and, I think we need to consider all of it to understand what the decision might be. Uh, and I do really think about the inability to make that decision in March when, when Phil proposed a motion. And I don't want to be stuck in that position again, like Phil had reiterated here. And I, and I, am, I, I think it's important that we set this up in a way that considering the information received, and the advice we receive, that we can make a decision. And um, <clears throat> I don't want to see it be, we take the information and reschedule it in September to try to make a decision, if uh, that, to me, could be devastating to the program and the industry. So uh, I'll stop there, but I, I support what Marcy and uh, Phil were speaking to. Okay, thanks. Ryan. Yeah, I'm still struggling with this. Um, I'm fine if, if the council wants to have an action that provides guidance to us, um, but I want to be clear that there, you can't change the current regulations or the program through guidance or recommendations. The regulations are in place. The previous council action is still valid regardless of what guidance we get. So I just wanted to be clear on that. Hey, thanks. Bill. Um, thanks, um, thanks, Ryan. Um, I think we are very clear on that. I think uh, we were made, you know, that was emphasized um, repeatedly uh, in March. Um, but that that doesn't mean, as a council who has and, and who who represents a large group of individuals that are affected by this regulation, that we're going to turn into a potted plant and just it can just receive information as the implementation of the regulations are done. And not have the and not maintain the ability to provide our comments to you to National Marine Fisheries Service. And, and I, I'm struck by the reluctance, or seemingly reluctance, to to accommodate the council as the regulations move forward as the program is evolving, as the, the, the costs of the program are evolving, and we're learning more about the costs, and we know that the cost of the program is a significant issue for our constituency. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, that's all, that's, as, as long as I am going to sit in a seat and and I, I and and the and the and this council has taken action that has been followed up with regulatory action by NIMS, 
um, that we continue to monitor the decisions we make and be able to provide information, guidance, recommendations, whatever it might be, or it subsequently recommend a change in a regulation somewhere down the road, uh, that I'm going to absolve that as, as a responsibility. So um, I, I'm, I am respectful of, of where we are. I am respectful that the regulations are in place. Uh, but, but at the same time, with all of the uncertainties that have been associated with the implementation, particularly as it relates to cost, I want this council to be able to keep our hand uh, on some portion of the steering wheel. Thanks, Phil. Uh, for for a call on Ryan, just let me say, I, you know, uh, I, I, from what I've heard, uh, NIMS is not uh, precluding the op option or the opportunity for the council to to provide its uh, comments and, and guidance and recommendations to NIMS uh, on this topic at the June council meeting. Um, and I realize that I've kind of also been pressing a little bit on what the council action is because I have to write up what the council action is when I do the agenda. So I just wanted to be clear. So, uh, but but I think I've heard clearly from Ryan that they're willing to to listen to that. But uh, Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Chuck, and thanks, Phil, for the point. And um, I apologize if you feel my comments have come off as reluctant. I'm, I'm very consistent with what Chuck said. I'm, I'm happy to have the discussion. It was just very tough for me to tell from your comments and Marcy's comments if the recommendation was for the first of a two-meeting process or for a regulatory change or something that would need to be in noticed in this council action or not. And that was really all I was doing was trying to clarify that for the purposes Chuck just stated that we'll be working on the action items and situation summaries but after this meeting. Um, but I have no reluctance whatsoever to have the discussion and I completely respect you and, and other council members and the public wanting to um, continue to comment on and have the ability to provide guidance and your recommendations on the information that we will be prepared to present in June. Okay. So um, let me just kind of circle back and uh, kind of do some math here um, and see where we stand. Um, so uh, get, given what we have, uh, have uh, started with, what we've uh, moved off the agenda or trimmed, um, I count that we have uh, uh, 12 hours uh, to fill um, if we're going to keep our meeting at five and a half days. Uh, if we add in um, the uh, standardized bycatch, the regional operating agreement, the stable fish gear switching, the CPS NIFS report, and the Sant Coho business, that's 13 hours. So that would put us uh, one over uh, where we're at. So what that doesn't include would be the electronic monitoring and the topic that we haven't discussed yet, which is the marine planning agenda item. Now, again, I don't know if there's any more to be uh, trimmed from the from the NIFS report. I, again, I think maybe I was uh, sort of, maybe it was misunderstanding that that, that, that included some EM business, but so uh, do, do we think that an hour is um, appropriate for the, for the ground fish NIFS report without reporting on the EM business. Um, Karen. Chuck, I, I didn't quite hear you. Did you call on me? I did, yes. Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt the ground fish discussion, but I did want to speak to the marine planning item. If you're ready for that, why don't we why don't we hold off on that for just a bit? That's fair. Okay, uh, Maggie. Thanks, Chuck. Um, well, I was going to also mention that I I would like us to have some discussion about the um, regional preliminary regional operating agreements item. Mm -hmm. Realizing that's going in the wrong direction on time. 
if while we're sticking, <laughs> never mind. We'll leave it at that for now. Thanks. I'm sorry. I, I think this is where, if we were in person, some some conversations at break might smooth this along, but we'll muddle through. Thanks. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, so again, so I, if we're if we're, so we're slightly over uh, five and a half days uh, right now, uh, but then we need to consider adding. Uh, some time for electronic monitoring, which it sounds like a standalone agenda item is the desire of the council on that one. Um, so we've got we've got three hours for that uh, penciled in here. Um, so if that seems, uh, I don't know. I, I I'm I guess I'm wondering if if that's uh, if all of that time will be necessary to. Get the update from uh, from National Marine Fisheries Service and uh, the reports from our advisory bodies. Public comment. Um, I mean that, that we tend to get uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of input and a lot of discussion about that agenda item. So um, just want to see if uh, three hours is the right amount there. Uh, if we were to add that, then that would essentially take us to six full days. And uh, once again, we haven't really addressed the marine planning topic yet. So um, I can either ask if people, what people think about six full days, or I can go to uh, Karin, we can start talking about marine planning. Bill. Um, well, yeah, how was going to question whether the CTC report, you know, could be in our informational packet and we could read that, um, and, or you might hit a highlight or two during your ED report. I was wondering about having the preliminary regional operating agreement also in an informational piece so we could look at it. Uh, and and discuss it um, at a subsequent meeting. Um, well, uh, it's I mean it's possible uh, that we could um, you know find some efficiencies on day one. Um, But I think even if we find some efficiencies, uh, I think we are uh, looking at uh, eating eating into or, or approaching uh, six full days. Maggie. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I, a suggestion for consideration. I um, <laughs> I feel. Well, uh, I, I'm noticed looking at again at the the, front, the year at a glance and noticing that we would not have any opportunity to take up a possible gear switching PPA until next March at the very earliest. Um, and recognizing that can, taking up gear switching range of alternatives in September might allow us to fit more items in June, since the fixed gear program review would take less time. So uh, I wonder if it makes sense to table ground fish for now with um, and discuss some other items still remaining for potential scheduling in June and, and then come back and see where the pieces fit best. Uh, I, I would be amenable to that, uh, Mark. Yeah, I just wanted to briefly touch on the, the notion of going six full days. I'll just note that we're now into our sixth hour of a four hour day. Uh, we still have work to do on this agenda item. We have to come back to salmon. Uh, and I'm trying to remember a day last. I'm, I'm sure there have been some that were 
right on schedule, but it's, it's always seems to me that's our uh, pressure relief valve in case things go long uh, earlier in the meeting. So um, I'd like to see the preservation of that relief valve to the extent we can. So I would caution against um, going uh, uh, to the full seven hours on day last. Good point. Okay, well, uh, taking Maggie's suggestion, uh, why don't we talk about the marine planning issue then, how we want to uh, address that. And Karin, I think uh, you had your hand up once upon a time. Thank you. Uh, yes, I did. And um, your introduction of that item uh, in talking about the shaded the shaded portion of, of this uh, June agenda uh, clarified something in my own mind that um, we do have this ongoing process with BOEM established where at the pre-council period of time, a couple of weeks before each council meeting, we agreed that we would check in on the phone, see what items might need to be addressed at the upcoming council meeting, and then take action um, on that by building that into the agenda somehow. Um, and that, that process, along with Bohm's outstanding offer to work with us on working webinars, uh, which presumably would occur this summer, make me uh, not only want to recommend to the council that we have a, a marine planning item, but that it be a standalone item to allow for uh, decision making um, separate from the membership appointment and, and council operating procedures agenda item. Um, Chuck, you recommended an hour for that agenda item. Uh, I, I hesitate <laughs> to think that we could get through that in an hour. Um, I think it's more likely an hour and a half. Uh, and so that's my current recommendation and thinking on what would be needed to, to bring that into uh, the June schedule. <laughs> Okay, any other thoughts on that one? Louise M. Thank you, Chuck. Um, I wanted to support Karin's statement on that. I think you're gonna have a lot of interest. Things are moving along really fast. I get in my mailbox almost every day, something going on with wind, and as Maggie pointed out, we're not looking at, a, I guess it was a final on gear switching until next March. Uh, the industry may be much more concerned with this wind thing through the fall. So uh, I, I really, my personal feeling is that this rises to the top. Um, if we were scheduled for Final on uh, gear switching in September or November, I, I would say yes, we have to get at it. But as to what Maggie pointed out, I, I, I agree with her. Thank you. Thanks, Louie. Yeah, you know, I, <clears throat> I guess I will just reiterate my concern, I guess, about, you know, pushing stuff off until uh, November or later, and that you know that that's really when the spec starts coming into play. Um, we're already uh, talking about uh, you know some uh, finalization of uh, the Etsy Whiting business, some uh, progress on non troll RCA in that time frame, um, and I think we also have to. You know, if you listen to what the GMT said, they, they don't want any, any of those things doubling up on any particular meeting. Um, so, um, 
yeah, so it, it's it's tough to get everything done, and uh, you know, some, something's going to have to give, I guess. So, um, I'm not sure I've got any good suggestions uh, at at this point, but I but I do know that when the specs roll around, um, some people get pretty busy. So, um, Phil, uh, I I may have lost track here <laughs> where we are. So, um, based on Maggie's observation and looking ahead, um, are we? Are we coming around to moving gear switching ROA piece until September? Is that is, is that kind of where we are? Well, that, I think that's uh, I think that's under consideration again. Yes. Okay. And and how about what what does that where, where does electronic monitoring how how are we fitting that in or have we yet? So if we put everything in the box, including marine planning, uh, we would be at, uh, well, uh, we'd be over, slightly over six full days. Um, so that's a seven, and then eight if hours. We pull, sorry. Yeah, if we pull gear switching to September, then we're about right. Then so we're, right? we're about right, yeah. So why don't we do that? So then we would have both fixed gear catcher review and um, gear switching and at sea whiting uh, ROA in September, all three of those. Well, I suppose that's possible, but we haven't. <laughs> yeah. Got to the okay, I'm just saying that's what <laughs> The year to glance is next. <laughs> uh, Maggie. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that it probably will be helpful to look at the year at a glance, um, but we'll, um, looking specifically at you, and I think we we need to well we we should try to either have gear switching or the fixed gear program review scoping in june um, so they don't both just start adding time to our fall agendas mm -hmm. so if we moved uh, sablefish back to september and brought the catch air review uh, fix your catcher review back to June, then we will be and added the marine planning, then we would be pretty close to six full days. Uh, yes, that, that's not, <laughs> yes, and I don't mean I, I am concurring with that recommendation for six full days. I recognize the problem and the wisdom of Mark's uh, comment earlier about the relief valve. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> I guess at this point, um, well, I'll see what Brad has to say at this point. Well, I'm just thinking about this meeting here. We had, uh, we're just hopefully finishing up here pretty quick. Um, you know, we, we were ahead of a, a schedule a number of days um, because of lack of not much public comment. So I'm just looking at the list here and just trying to, you know, anticipate you know, how much public comment or interest in public comment might we have 
and I don't see, you know, with what you have right now with the with the, putting the um, fixed gear catch show review um, back in June, I, I see two things that really would have a lot of public input to testify where you had 20 or 30 people, which we really could drag out a day. So I just thought I'd just put that out there. Well, um, yeah, I see, I, I think there's, I think there's some there. Um, CPS, uh, Northern Anchovy Management Framework, just filling out hard caps. Uh, possibly, I mean, I, 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 you know, I don't know if planning for the specs would have a lot, but uh, catch your review might. Um, electronic monitoring probably will. So, yeah, there's a few things that could uh, extend, you know, public, public comment could extend things. But I guess I would say that, uh, you know, I think uh, it, I'm thinking that we could probably come in around five and three quarter days on, you know, uh, based on seven or seven and a, seven to seven and a half hour days. Um, but as you point out, um, yeah, we got off early some days, but some days we didn't. Some days we went late. So that's the way that usually goes. Um, But absent uh, somebody being willing to cut something, I think that's where we stand. Brad, I, I hope that's a new hand up. Dang. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I'm not seeing any other comments. So at this point, I guess. Uh, I guess I'm going to take a look at that and uh, see what we can do. Maybe uh, <clears throat> maybe we should move on to the year at a glance. Um, maybe I could uh, uh, or maybe we could take a quick break and uh, come back to the year at a glance. We've been at this for uh, an hour and 40 minutes, I guess. Um, we could uh, take a few minutes for uh, Mike and I to kind of look at the June agenda and see what, see what we think and uh, maybe come and report back to the council and then tackle the year at a glance. How, does, how do people feel about that plan? Love it. Makes sense. Okay, and then I'll switch my headgear. Sounds like I'm break, starting to break up a bit. Okay, Mr. Chair, the, the gavel's yours. All right, so it sounds like we're gonna take a, how, how much time do you and Mike want? About 15 minutes. I think we can get some business done then. All right. So it's close enough to 225 right now. So let's come back at 240. All right. And um, and I'd be curious to hear uh, if Salmon is making any progress, but I guess that's not important right now. We still have uh, this planning in front of us. Yeah, I think I think it is making some progress. I think the SDT is done with their analysis. So assuming that the, uh, uh, that the states and tribes are as soon as they're prepared to give uh, final guidance, I think um, we should be ready. Hopefully that'll occur. All right. Well, 240. We'll come back to a year at a glance and. If we're lucky, uh, we can move from there into salmon. Okay. 240. 
and hopefully we won't have to do any more on, on June. But uh, but again, we'll take a look at that and, uh, and let you know if there's any problems when we get back. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.
All right, it's uh, 240. Hopefully, um, Chuck and Mike have had a chance to look at uh, the June schedule and uh, can give us give us an update. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> yep, um, I can give you an update. So uh, we took a look at the June quick reference and the changes that were uh, that have been proposed, and I think that we are uh, reasonably close to. Uh, not being six full days, uh, getting five and a half, probably slightly over five and a half, but uh, still having a little bit of your pressure relief valve uh, with most days coming in around seven hours uh, thereabouts. Uh, so I think I think uh, we're all right. Uh, I think we're all right for June. Um, I would caution that uh, we will be uh, seriously rearranging things, so don't count, even think about counting, you know, which agenda items are in which days yet. Um, so we'll have to rearrange things quite a bit <clears throat> to work this all in. So, uh, so that's good news, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I see Bob's got his hand up. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. Could you recap just real quick which candidate items were unshaded for June, just so we got yeah. it clear before we move on? I appreciate it. Yeah, so if you're looking at the uh, everything in the candidate box, um, the standardized bycatch, the regional operating agreement, electronic monitoring, the CPS NIFS report, the Sant Coho ESA consultation and uh, marine planning, which is is not displayed in the box, but uh, is also included. And then sablefish gear switching has been moved off till September. Thank you, Chuck. Okay. Okay. Um, so if there's no more questions on June, then uh, we should uh, take a look at the year at a glance and look a little further out. Thank you, Chris. Um, so um, what we've got in attachment, supplemental attachment three, uh, just looking at September is uh, 4.8 days, but um, we've added with, um, sablefish gear switching to that. So that would bump that up by a full day. So that's, um, would be 5.8 days. Uh, I will note uh, this is September, and we are uh, at this point planning on uh, meeting in person uh, to some extent. Um, so that that's our plan is to at least have at the at the bare minimum have the council itself meet in person. So um, if there, uh, we might want to have a. a we're still planning on how we will uh, hybridize the, the meeting. Um, we're certain that there will be some need to do that, uh, certainly for the advisory bodies. Um, and then we are still talking about the council meeting itself, but, uh, but we are hoping that the council members themselves will be able to attend in person. So that's just, uh, just for your information, that's our current plan. Um, I don't want to get too deep into that though here today if we don't have to. Um, so uh, that's 5.8 days, uh, including sablefish gear switching with all of the uh, shaded agenda items unshaded. So uh, so that's that's pretty close. Um, so we'll see what uh, what uh, what we can do there. I guess as I kind of look across and wonder if there's um, some uh, things that we might be able to trim. Uh, I, uh, I guess I first look at um, the ground fish box, which is uh, over full at this point when you add table fish to it. Uh, but I look at <clears throat> a couple things. Uh, one is the strategic plan review scoping. Um, I 
that's that's been a placeholder uh, kind of creeping up on us uh, each time we have an iteration of this. So I guess I'd be interested in the council's thoughts about that uh, about that topic. And um, haven't really dedicated any uh, staff resources to that uh, yet. Um, and then the other thing I think, and uh, we don't necessarily have to make this decision today, but uh, also ground fish workload and new management measures update. Um, again, if we are fully subscribed, I'm not sure the utility of uh, scheduling that, but uh, that we will probably know more about that in June. So that's maybe something to look forward to. But um, other than that, uh, that uh, oh, I guess I would note that the uh, for salmon, the conservation objective review uh, would just just be Sacramento River Fall Chinook, and would not include Klamath River Fall Chinook. Um, yes, and everything else uh, would would stay. Uh, I think that uh, by moving ahead with a standardized bycatch methodology report, uh, we should uh, probably plan on unshading uh, those in September and November if our intent is indeed to meet the statutory deadline for um, complying with that uh, new rule. Well, a five-year-old rule. Um, then uh, moving on to November, uh, not a lot to talk about there. Uh, we're at 5.3 days uh, before um, uh, making any modifications. Some things I've heard discussed are uh, moving the ATSI whiting final action to March. So that would free up some time there, but uh, perhaps replacing it with some, um, some business on the non-trawl uh, RCA uh, item. So maybe that would be a push there. I'm not, not really sure about that. Um, and then uh, looking further out uh, for March, again, pushing Etsy, uh, the, the whiting utilization, the final action would bump that four days up. Um, we've also talked about uh, possibly adding the catch share plan review scoping item there, uh, perhaps as a shaded item, just to make sure it's on our radar screen. And uh, if we are able to uh, fit that in in March, we, we could do that. Um, may, maybe, and then uh, I don't really have anything for April, uh, but maybe one other topic uh, that we will need to consider, and again, we might know more about this in June, is uh, is what we are going to be contemplating for the marine planning uh, process as we, as we go forward. The four state report uh, is contemplating some, uh, I think, more activity in that on a regular basis than our, uh, than our existing once a year marine planning meeting. Uh, certainly we've been engaged with BOEM and have had uh, have expectations that uh, things will come up. Uh, and, and also when you consider uh, the aquaculture aspect of, of that, uh, that topic, um, that we should probably start planning on including uh, that somewhere in the year at a glance. Uh, and I guess, again, maybe we'll know more about where those uh, agenda items might appear to when we have a discussion about it in June. So I think I will uh, pause there and see if there's any thoughts about um, what I've laid out or any additional considerations for the year at a glance. Brianna. Good afternoon. Thanks, Chuck. Um, I would just note for November under CPS that the management team requested to remove the safe. And so you could put that up for the chopping block. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, uh, that's a good uh, good point. I did uh, want to circle back to that. So I saw their recommendation. Um, 
I, you know, we, we put this on the agenda because, um, I mean, this is something that's, that is, uh, in our, uh, it, it is supposed to be brought to the council and based on the FMP and we have a COP that dictates that it's brought to the council. And, and frankly, uh, not just the safe report. I mean, under, understanding the safe report is, uh, might be a good candidate that for that, but, uh, this is also the, the opportunity should be the opportunity for the council to consider the management, um, recommendations, which would include the opportunity to change uh, stocks from uh, monitor to actively managed. So we have a process uh, available to us to do that. And we haven't really uh, put that in front of the council so um, or often um, or on a regular basis, but we thought it would be important to um, to bring that to the council's attention and give them the opportunity to uh, to consider that and and to and frankly I think to get a periodic update on the status of the fisheries uh, through the, through a report on this on the safe report. So, uh, but that that was a that was a staff uh, suggestion. So I will uh, um, be curious if there's any other uh, thoughts by other council members about that. Ryan. Uh, thanks, Chuck. Um, I was going to make some comments on on your some of the points you made on the ground fish in particular. Just a couple comments on the ag. Um, <clears throat> so for the uh, let's see whiting utilization in September. Just a, a quick note. I, I I didn't know if you said this, Chuck, but obviously we've already done ROA, so that should just be noticed as PPA. Um, and I, I would, well, I, I'm a big fan of strategic planning in general. Um, I'm not sure this is the right time to start giving all of our discussions on groundfish workloads. So could support that being, being moved off. Um, we, uh, for November, we would prefer to see the widening utilization final preferred alternative moved back to March. Um, we have a lot of work that has to be done on this regarding salmon bycatch issues, and, and I think that additional time will will help us. Um, but while while recommending that, I do think on the flip side we could support a range of alternatives discussion for non trawl RCA of for that action in November. Mm -hmm. um, I did want to write one other issue that's actually not on here, but. Um, I wanted to flag it for to find a placeholder somewhere uh, on the year at a glance. Um, I do have a request from NIMS headquarters uh, to present the new Marine Recreational Information Program Survey and data standards um, for states that receive federal funding for surveys at a, at a future meeting. <laughs> They're pretty flexible when that might be, but uh, they would like to present that to the council. Um, and but. Not not a specific request here, other than to maybe just add a add a shaded um, placeholder somewhere uh, for future discussion. And I will stop there for now. Thanks. Uh, so, is there a uh, is there a time frame on that MREP update or discussion item? Uh, no, they could be ready to present as soon as September, is my understanding. Um, but it's it's really the council's discretion of when they would like to fit it in. So perhaps we could consider a shaded item under other topics uh, in September, and then we'll see when we get there if we need to move it out. That would work for me. Okay. And is uh, how much time do you think that? would be a good estimate for that. I think just an hour. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Maggie. Thanks, Chuck. Um, on the mothership utilization, PP, uh, pardon me, uh, final preferred alternative, 
Um, I, I would support moving that to next March uh, based on information, uh, you know, based on NIMS's recommendation and understanding that that would provide more time for the protected resources folks to uh, really consult and weigh in on potential salmon impacts so that the council has all that information to consider before we select a final preferred alternative. Um, you know, again, it, I think we all have the objective of making sure that uh, these can be implemented by the start of a whiting season in 2023 and that uh, one of the alternatives would be for a May 1st start. So it sounds like um, this change can still meet that time frame. Um, so I would support that. And then I would support putting a non-trawl RCA range of alternatives on the November meeting. Um, and while I'm at it, maybe I'll, I'll remind us all, I forgot when we were on June that the GMT had a plea for specific uh, uh, council prioritization for them for June. So when we're done with the YAG, I'll just come back around with a quick comment on that and others might as well. Okay, thanks. Any other thoughts about the year at a glance? Mercy. Thank you, Chuck. Um, like to start with salmon. Okay. Um, we can support uh, the layout here on Sunk Coho of the ROA PPA in June and then the November FPA, um, noting that state of California staff are heavily involved in this Sunk Coho work group exercise. Um, regarding both the SAC and Klamath Fall Conservation Objective Review item um, and the SAC Fall Age Structured Assessment Update, I recommend removing those items or at least scheduling them out to March or later. Um, CDFW will obviously need to be greatly involved in any discussions about um, particularly the conservation objectives um, and any age structure assessment uh, for Klamath Fall. And uh, we need to um, circle the wagons back at the ranch and see what um, support and engagement we can get from our inland counterparts. Uh, I heard James Stone's testimony earlier and um, certainly um, agree that this is something that we're interested in doing. Um, it is certainly important to our council business. Um, but uh, right now, uh, I think we are fully occupied with the Sant Coho business, and um, I'm really not feeling like we're in a place to uh, seek um, additional resources from our inland functions to support new work. Um, I think Brett spoke to this uh, topic in some detail earlier in the week, um, but just as a a reminder, um, you know, these, the way we're organized, we, we just, we have to, <laughs> we have to coordinate with other functions in our department um, mm -hmm. on all of these um, uh, activities that cross uh, inland and ocean um, discussions. And so that means we will need a commitment from our inland functions to uh, engage in the planning. And I, I think a, a dedicated work group effort is going to be what's necessary to look at um, any of these topics. And um, our recommendation is that we not consider any work group formation until we're done with Sant Coho and that one's been put to bed. Um, you know, we've, we've just gone down the path of these, you know, repeated work groups, starting with uh, the winter run harvest control rule moving uh, into uh, Southern Resident Killer Whale and now Sant Coho. Um, and, you know, we've had uh, rebuilding plans to contend with uh, on the site as well. And so um, I think we're just asking for a, 
a pause and, and let's wrap up Sant Coho before we kick off these discussions. I, I realize that the intention here was just to get the discussion going, but we're not ready to get the discussion going. And we're really not ready to get the discussion going in Spokane. Um, so I guess with that, I'll move um, over to Groundfish. Uh, just want to um, support uh, NIMS's recommendation for the non troll RCA uh, ROA item being in November. Um, sounds like that's when their workload can accommodate uh, development of that ROA uh, in a way that um, has their engagement. Our motion spoke to the need for NIMS technical uh, assistance on some topics uh, that are <laughs> very deeply rooted in our groundfish regs. So um, we appreciate NIMS help with this. And if that's the timeline that works for them, it certainly works for us. And we look forward to keeping that uh, item on track. Um, as for your question regarding strategic plan, um, scoping or discussions, I, uh, oh wait, that's, yeah, that's groundfish. Um, scoping, yeah, um, I, I agree. I think it is, um, the calendar's jam packed. And, you know, I, I too would love to take this up, but um, not seeing how we possibly can uh, at this time. Um, I, I like having it on our year at a glance and maybe moving that out toward uh, March or April as a placeholder and keeping it dated um, might be a good idea. Um, I want to speak to the GMT report. Um, just for a second, they they are really doing the right thing, reminding the council of their stock assessment priorities and the workload involved in participating stock in the stock assessments to ensure that we're getting the, the best possible products. And that goes for all of the folks that participate in the STAR uh, and STAT um, work. And it really um, isn't lost on me how heavy their summer schedules are. And I also think that um, it's important for us to recognize that specs is going to be the priority when we get into November. And, you know, we, we will be needing to prioritize uh, incorporating that new stock assessment information. So um, I just appreciate their um, admonishment of um, their work and their priorities. And I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. Um, yeah, I actually uh, kind of want to circle back around to Sant Coho as well. <clears throat> we don't have anything on the September agenda for it. Um, I, which I'm, I might might have been my, uh, might have been our own oversight, but uh, um, you know, I think uh, that's something that we should consider. Um, I, I think it is important to give. Uh, the SAS and members of the public an opportunity to uh, play with the alternatives. Uh, I know that that was very successful, kind of in one of one of those more original uh, uh, work groups that you were talking about, which was the uh, um, uh, the Thule work group, um, which uh, you know looked at a similar sort of risk assessment and um, some control rules. Um, and uh, I think it was really helpful for the SAS to get a chance to play with those. So I, I guess I would uh, be uh, curious to hear if, if other people feel like including something like that in September to give the uh, give the SAS sort of a, one more iteration before the, uh, you know, essentially the risk assessment comes out in June. And if, you know, the final, uh, finals in November. Um, I'm just not sure that they would provide adequate uh, opportunity for feedback. So I'll, I'm sure what the uh, council has to say about that. Chuck, if I may. Yeah. I just want to make sure um, you understood me. I I was supportive of the way the YAG looks with Sonk having ROA and PPA in June and FPA in November, and then meanwhile removing the two uh, shaded items that appear for September. 
Yes, yes, I, okay. I, I got that. I, yeah, so my, but my point was that uh, I, I think that it might be uh, good to add a Sant Coho uh, step in September, uh, for, primarily for the purpose of uh, giving uh, the SAS and, and the industry a chance to, to uh, look at and provide some feedback and sort of get another iteration of the uh, control rule options and how those um, could be, you know, uh, or, may, or maybe how their application could be uh, incorporated into into the management framework. So that was that was my suggestion, and and, and frankly, with the uh, Sacramento and Klamath business getting moved off, there, there's I think some time there. Thank you, Chuck. If I may, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I just received word from Brett that he thinks that's a good idea as well. So um, I, I guess I would flag that um, not sure what the plans are for the STT and the SAS in September. Um, I know they're busy. They tend to not attend our September meeting. So just noting that. Yeah, that's always, that's always an issue. Uh, but I, again, and I bet Butch is going to tell me the same thing. Uh, I remember the September meeting here in Portland uh, to talk about the, the Thule um, matrix and uh, how well attended uh, and instrumental that was in, uh, in getting SAS buy-in. But uh, Butch, why don't you go ahead and tell me I'm right. Uh, thanks, Chuck. You, you, you are very correct. Um, that Thule and Coho matrix deal that the council put on um, you know, it was under raised beef stores, probably for as salmon goes, it's probably one of the best, uh, um, processes that I've ever been through as with the SAS all, uh, working with all parties and, and it was refined and, and understood by all at the end. And there was no surprises. And I, I I'm in full support of that. And we did, uh, and I know Marcy, it is hard for salmon. Uh, folks to get uh, to the September meeting, but um, uh, one thing about it, we're, we're able to have alternates on the SAS, and and uh, I know this is an important uh, important subject, and uh, uh, pe people will come, um, even if it needs to just be for a day or two. So, I, I am very supportive of this process. Um, anyway, thank thank you, Chuck. I I fully agree with you. Okay, uh, any other thoughts about the year at a glance? Uh, not seeing any, maybe I will uh, suggest that um, we, uh, uh, with regard to Brianna's uh, comments about the CPS safe and management recommendation agenda item. If uh, it might be helpful to um, put that on the, the management team and the advisory sub panels agenda for June and uh, have make sure that that's, <clears throat> I guess I would like to make, uh, make sure that that is uh, the direction that we wanna go and uh, maybe just have a little more discussion about it in June, if that would be uh, amenable to folks. Brianna. Thanks, Jeff. That works for me. Okay, great. Okay. Um, well, uh, I think that's all I've got for year at a glance. Um, uh, look around the table, see if there's anything. Might also ask uh, Mike Berner if he sees anything that he would like to bring to our attention. Bob Dooley. Thanks, Chuck. Um, kind of not particularly on year to glance or any of this it, particularly, but it pertains to it. I just wanted to, while we're all kind of have a little time here with the salmon looming, to discuss something that has been on my mind and, and maybe we could, uh, might incite some discussion. This 
this whole process of, of workload planning at the end of the meeting happens last day. And, you know, it, it seems to be, you know, a, a competition of getting things on the menu and trying to fit it all in. But the underlying problem is never really discussed by the council. And I think we're at a point with all of the workload that's been gathered as we as we move forward through the water here that I mean it's it's almost time to do a haul out and scrape some barnacles and maybe get a new fresh paint job and maybe a new look at stuff. And it's hard to do in the council process in our meetings because we're agenda driven and we schedule driven. We never have time to sit back and uh, look at the big picture and perhaps look at how we might do things differently and streamline the process and maybe figure out how we're going to deal with this because the train's full and, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of capacity, but we keep adding things. And so I, I've been thinking about it, talking with a few people about it and looking for maybe a, a thought process to get, get away from the council agenda, council meeting part of this and maybe step back and take a, a cumulative look of how we might improve this and what we can do to streamline this and and not put put our agenda so impacted and not get things done that we need to get done. There's so much that's on the list and I know we I know COVID has created it, but it's it's been a, a growing problem in my mind. And I think it's it's time to maybe perhaps think about a dedicated couple days to not come come at it from an agenda item perspective, but come at it from a process perspective to figure out how to how to approach these things differently, what we can do differently to make this work better and get more work done, absent <clears throat> adding more time and more work for all of us. So I don't see, you know, hope is we've hoped for many years and from the omnibus to all of these different things that we've, we've made, we've tried to chip away at it. But it seems like to me, there's just way too much to do. And it, it isn't the time day last and in this format when we're really focusing on specific agenda for specific tasks to think about process. So it's been in my mind and I just wanted to bring it up and see if anybody was uh, thinking that might be something we'd approach and something to do to hopefully alleviate some of this, this workload and stress and everything we hear, hear about all the way through the whole, the whole process from our advisory panels to our staff, to the agency, everyone involved and our council members. So I'll stop there and thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good, uh, good discussion to have. Uh, Maggie. Thanks, Chuck, can you hear me? Oh, yes, there we can. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I have a lag. Um, yeah, well, I would agree with Bob. That's a good discussion to have. Uh, I was, and if there's more discussion to have on that now, I'm I'm happy to wait. I was just going to uh, offer a, a couple separate thoughts. Um, I will note that I need to leave at three thirty. So, uh, what did you proceed then? Get mine out now. Um, one was to respond to the uh, GMT's request for. Uh, specific council guidance on which items to prioritize for their attention in um, in June and which we don't expect to hear from them on. I will say that the ones I would um, think are GMT priorities. Stalling now I have too many things open. Uh, would be the spec scoping in season uh, and stock assessments. 
Um, I, in particular, uh, I, I would say that I think we do not need to um, ask for any GMT engagement on the electronic monitoring discussion we will be having in June. Um, and then the other, you know, with the terms of the ESA work group report, I, I think we need to see what comes out of that and that the GMT can take a look and decide if they, there's need for them to weigh in at that point. Um, and then separately, my other comment was going to be that uh, I would support the request that Ben Enticknap made in his public comment that the NIMS uh, Southwest Science Center report to the council. I, I believe we're anticipating some information on uh, plans and, and potential timing of uh, related to some of the sardine and, and other CPS uh, related science activities that the council is interested in. I think we're anticipating that in June and that that include uh, some thoughts on addressing the EMSY issue and the need to up update that or, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Maggie. Um, uh, I guess one other thing that was on the uh, GMT's list of uh, what should they prioritize and what should they not um, was uh, about the standardized bycatch reporting. <clears throat> I think at this point, um, I think it's unlikely that they would need to weigh in on that. So again, there's still some ongoing discussions between uh, council and staff about uh, the status of the evaluation of uh, whether uh, any of our uh, FMPs need to be uh, modified or and uh, again, groundfish came away uh, fully compliant, at least in the preliminary assessment. So if that sticks, and that's another one that they would not have to uh, weigh in on in June. Okay, uh, Virgil. I guess I just wanted to second what Bob said. I believe uh, we owe it to you, Chuck, to spend some time together looking at the bigger picture stuff to help you prioritize uh, everything that's being done. And so I want to second that, and I would look forward to an opportunity to have that kind of uh, thought process discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Virgil. Okay, anything else for workload planning then? Uh, I, I guess maybe just to uh, circle back with Bob and Virgil, yeah, I, I, think, it, I think it would be good for uh, to have a discussion about how to uh, take a fresh look at, uh, at workload planning and welcome um, the opportunity to do that. Um, so perhaps we'll uh, have, to, Perhaps we can discuss it at our chair vice chair call over the course of the next couple months and uh, come up with some ideas and maybe have something to uh, report back to the council on in June and see if there's see if we've got any wisdom to impart or not. Okay, so uh, not seeing anything else. So Bob. Yeah, thanks, Chuck. I appreciate your response to that. I think that that would be a really good approach. And if uh, you guys could come back with something, I'd appreciate that and a thought process of it. And just, I think there could be some benefit to that. I think we, we're all, I think we're all feeling the, feeling the stress of, of how much everyone is putting into this and, and leave feeling like you haven't done enough. At least that's my, my feeling. And I just, uh, I, I know we can do, I know we can, we can come, we can figure this out and we can get a better, a, a better approach. And that's not saying that anyone's doing anything wrong. It's just a, a, <laughs> it's just a product of where we are. And I mean, I really appreciate all the hard work everyone's doing from, you know, from our advisory panels all the way and particularly the council, council staff and your, you know, all your group and, and council members, everyone is, working their hearts out here. And I think that uh, it's just a, 
the train's overloaded and we need to figure out a way to either build a bigger train or or streamline some of the items that are on the train. So I appreciate that and I, I appreciate you coming back. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, uh, again, if there's nothing else, then uh, we are uh, done with this agenda item. Um, I don't have uh, a real recent update on the status of salmon uh, and when we might be ready, other than to say that the STT report is done. So their analysis is done, but again, we're still waiting for um, folks to be prepared to give guidance. So um, if anybody out there knows more than I do, uh, you're welcome to chime in here. Um, if not, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm not exactly sure what to do right now, um, other than perhaps kind of like we did yesterday, uh, adjourn for a period with some check-ins, check keep your eye on the reader board, and hopefully we will not have the same result as we did yesterday, uh, that we will be able to get to D6 final council action. Well, we call this day last for a reason. So I'm hoping we can um, uh, can get this done uh, sooner rather than later. I did take a look at the STT report and I did see some numbers in bold. So um, yeah, I'm not sure how or when those are going to get addressed. Um, but, um, and I guess you would, You've got the hotline to the folks who know when they'll be ready. So I'm going to suggest we take like a, a 20 minute break. Perhaps that's, do you think that's too optimistic, Chuck? Um, well, what do we have to lose? <laughs> well, at least in 20 minutes, maybe the picture will be clearer. Uh, I see so, he has his hands up, hand up. He might have some insight. No, he chickened out. <laughs> well, speak now. Well, <laughs> Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm texting right now with Kyle over an, uh, an outstanding issue, right? whether or not it holds up our process here. I'm not sure, but I'm working on it. I know that doesn't help with how long do you break, but certainly nothing less than 20 minutes. Well, let's break until 345 and focus all of our psychic energy on, on helping uh, folks uh, conclude what they need to conclude so they can come back and we can conclude this agenda item and therefore our April meeting. So. We'll be back at 3.45. Okay, and uh, uh, oops, no, I guess I'm still unmuted, I think. Um, yeah, so just keep an eye on the reader board. If uh, we get any updates, we will change the time the council is going to reconvene. So if that, uh, if that works for folks, uh, we'll do that. I'll also send out some uh, chats on the Rink Central meeting platform as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right, 345, keep your fingers crossed.
enjoyed being on. When I got out of high school, I jumped on dad's rig and it just gets in your blood. And I didn't have a problem getting up and going to work every morning. I enjoyed being on the water. And when I found that the fishing regulations were so complicated, I was angry. It is really frustrating to not have a say in what is happening to you. It's not just will the fish live or die, it's will the fishermen live or die. Well, why is this happening or why is this or why is that? Or they just want to shut it down and... Am I going to be able to survive? It's hard. I first heard about MRAP from two fishermen. Got a hold of me and said, hey, I've got this great opportunity for you. It's a program that, that's by and for fishermen. I was very skeptical going into that meeting and uh, very enlightened coming out. MRAP gives you the recipe. Where does the data come from? How do people use the data, the laws, and the steps that one goes through to translate into a regulation? I was afraid of the rulemaking process, but I think they listened to what everyone there had to say, including myself. MREP was really helpful in how I can be an active participant in the management of my fishery.
my thoughts exactly.
All right, it's 4.45. Welcome back, Daylas is still with us. Uh, we're going to go to D6 here and I'll turn to Robin. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, yes, agenda item D6. This is the 2021 Management Measures Final Action. So the Salmon uh, technical team does have a brief report for you uh, to review the analysis from the tentative measures and answer any council questions. Final adoption of the manage management measures will follow the comments of the advisors, tribes, agencies, and public. Any season structures considered for adoption that deviate from the salmon fishery management plan objectives will require implementation by emergency rule. I don't think that's the case, but if it's necessary, you have attachment one and two to guide you under that situation. And the action under this agenda item is for submission to the US Secretary, Secretary of Commerce and the final motions must be visible in writing to avoid unnecessary delay and confusion in proposing final regulations, minor edits may be, may be made to the STT analysis and other documents provided by staff. Council members should be prepared to provide a written motion. So your action under this agenda item is to adopt the final treaty Indian troll, non-Indian commercial and recreational ocean salmon fishery management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce and identify and justify any regulations that might require implementation by emergency rule. So for your reference materials, you do have, um, again, the uh, STT report one under D6A. We also have uh, two tribal reports that are submitted, and I believe we have Casey Baldwin and Wilbur Slakish to provide um, each one of those reports. Um, and I think you have some uh, public comments signed up. So with that, I think if you're ready, we can turn it over to the STT. All right, thank you, Robin. Uh, any questions from around the council? All right, uh, Dr. O'Farrell, please uh, go forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will be referring to agenda item D6A supplemental STT report one. And just going down to our tables here, 5A and 5B. Um, just, just would like to note that the Chinook results are identical between tables 5A and 5B and within the two alternatives that are in tables 5A. Um, but going back to table 5A here, um, we see, and this is the case with table 5B as well, there are a few uh, Puget Sound Chinook stocks that have bolded values um, indicating that there is work to be done there. Um, Moving down uh, to the Columbia River, <clears throat> Columbia River uh, um, natural tules um, uh, meets their 38% uh, exploitation rate limit. So, uh, and all of the alternatives, of course, they're the same across the Chinook, uh, for Chinook. And um, that's about it for Chinook. Um, as far as Coho is concerned, um, we do see that um, both the, well, we see that the uh, Queets Coho is still below the FMP um, spawner, adult spawner estimate, um, but it does meet the agreed to estimate um, that was dis uh, discussed, I believe, yesterday. Uh, I think that hits the high points of uh, the STT analysis, and I can try to answer any questions. All right, thank you, Mike. Are there any questions of Mike on the STT report? All right, not seeing any questions of, of Mike. Thank you very much uh, for that report. So um, we do have two travel reports. I was, uh, Joe o Oatman, shall I go to you first? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So for the travel report, uh, I have uh, one 
which is identified as Supplemental Tribal Report 2. This would be the testimony of the Clem River Treaty Tribe. And I would like to call up Wilbur Slockish uh, to the virtual table to provide that. Of course. Welcome. Uh, good day, everybody. Good day. All right. <laughs> Long day. Okay. Good day, members of the council. My name is uh, Wilbur Slockish Jr. I am member of the Yakima Nation, a commissioner for the Columbia River in the Tribal Fish Commission, and a treaty fisher on the Columbia River. I'm here to provide testimony on behalf of the four Columbia River treaty tribes, the Yakima Nation, Warm Springs, Umatilla, and Nespers Tribe. As the council works to finalize this year's ocean fisheries, the tribes would like to remind every one of a few issues important to the tribes. The Mid-Columbia Basin ecosystem is out of balance. We reminded the council of predation issues in March, but there are also issues with the general river environment that benefit predators and harm fish. High water temperatures and excessive nutrients in the Columbia River have caused increases in the abundance of aquatic vegetation, much of which are not non-native. This vegetation not only interferes with tribal fisheries, but also undoubtedly impacts the food chain for our salmon and steelhead. Siltation has caused has also become a concern. Many tributary mouths are filling in because silt is not transported downstream due to the hydro system. The shallow river mouths leave juvenile fish subject to high levels of predation and make it difficult for adults to enter tributaries at low flows. Funding will be need to found for dredging and other restoration efforts around river mouths. In this modified environment, introduced fish species such as walleye and bass can thrive and threaten another food force, juvenile lamprey. There are also increasing numbers of introduced organism that we know little about such as Siberian prawns, and there continue to be threats from invasive mussels that are found regularly with inspection on boats coming from other parts of the country. If we care about salmon, steelhead, and lamprey, we must do more to restore a properly function environment for these fish. In the 1850s, Isaac Stevens and Joel Palmer made explicit promises to the tribes as representatives of the United States. They promised that the tribes would always have access to their food. These promises were not kept as development occurred and fish runs were depleted. Dam building in the Columbia Basin began with dams and diversions in the tributaries in the late 1800s. These early dams, along with mines, logging, and grazing, destroyed and blocked fish habitat. With the construction of large mainstream dams beginning in the early 1900s, people turned to hatcheries to mitigate lost production. Even though the promises continued to be made to the tribes, they would always have fish. The large majority of early hatcheries were constructed downstream of Bonneville Dam. Tribal fisheries are place-based fisheries within the tribes usual and accustomed fishing areas. Village sites and spawning beds have been lost which displaced tribal people and the fish. Tribal fishers don't have the opportunity to move around like the sport fishers 
who can fish anywhere from the ocean to Idaho. We depend on fish returning to our areas to provide for our needs. Ocean fisheries need to be managed conservatively to ensure enough fish return to tribal fishing areas and also meet escapement needs. Many of our hatchery programs are underfunded and many hatcheries have been poorly maintained. There is a good deal of current discussion about fishing, fixing the nation's infrastructure. If we are going to work on infrastructure, we should also include the infrastructure needs of salmon. This means not only dealing with the uh, needs of hatcheries, which serve as recovery tools and produce fish for harvest, but improving habitat can also be considered infra infrastructure. Even though we have made important strides in addressing various habitat concerns, habitat restoration is complex, expensive, and time consuming. And it is critical work and more funding and support are needed. We bring these statesmen because of the need to address the needs of salmon throughout their life cycle, or there won't be fish for anyone to harvest. We also appreciate the efforts made by the STT to report unexpected escapements for the Spring Creek and pub stocks. Uh, this concludes our tribal statement. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilbur. Are there questions on this tribal report? Come Again, on. thank you very much, Wilbur. All right. And uh, Joe, I think that concludes the report of the any treaty tribe. Uh, to my knowledge, that is correct. All right. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So we do have another tribal report from the Colville, and um, is I received a text that maybe Casey Baldwin will be providing that. Uh, yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, it's loud and clear. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Casey Baldwin. I'm a research scientist for the Colville Confederated Tribes. Um, and uh, unfortunately, uh, Chairman Costin, uh, Chairman of the Business Council for Colville Tribes, couldn't be here today. Uh, he did submit a letter, uh, and I'm going to uh, read that into the record. Uh, the importance of salmon to the Confederated Tribes of the Colville Reservation and the Upper Columbia region cannot be overstated. Colville Tribes have participated in many salmon recovery forums and are actively engaged in salmon restoration actions and have commented in a variety of venues about the importance of the fisheries and how they occupy a central role in the lives of tribal members. Salmon fisheries also form a key part of regional culture, history, and identity and provide tremendous economic benefits. Colville Tribes includes 12 tribes and approximately 10,000 enrolled members. The reservation is located at the terminus of anadromous salmon migration on the Columbia River in north central Washington. Our waters include both healthy runs of summer Chinook salmon and sockeye salmon, as well as ESA listed stocks of spring Chinook salmon and steelhead trout. The salmon runs that used to support our subsistence and cultural needs were nearly lost and are currently a fraction of what they were due in part to the construction and operation of Chief Joseph and Grand Coulee Dams. <clears throat> the hatchery operations from Chief Joseph Hatchery produced approximately 3 million Chinook for the system when at full production. We appreciate the time PFM PFMC granted to the Colville Tribes and our UCUP partners to speak with you about fish passage. We also appreciate the council's support for continued studies in the Upper Columbia. Current fisheries for the Colville tribes are constricted to a very limited area in the Icicle River within the Wenatchee River Basin, at the tail race of Chief Joseph Dam, and in the Okanagan River. Summer Chinook and sockeye salmon comprise the majority of our harvest, and in recent years our harvest has improved from a few hundred fish to a few thousand fish each year for our tribal membership. 
We have part been participating in your advisory body meetings and tracking the 2021 PFMC process and the resulting Cobble Tribes harvest allocation for summer Chinook. With a relatively healthy Upper Columbia summer Chinook run forecast for 2021, we're looking forward to a good fishing season, at least by recent standards. However, this still does not meet the cultural or subsistence needs of the Cobble Tribes. We do not have a commercial salmon harvest because the basic ceremony and subsistence needs of our tribes are not fulfilled by contemporary salmon runs. Although some of the salmon runs this year are better than they, uh, than they have been in recent years, more work needs to be done. And we look forward to continuing to work with you to achieve our common goals of increasing the Columbia River salmon runs. The Cobble Tribes wishes to thank the other co-managers and members of the Salmon Advisory Subcommittee for their willingness to work with the Cobble Tribes towards common goals and taking the Cobble Tribes views and concerns into consideration. This was a tough year as we worked to come together and make these important decisions without meeting face to face, but in a way that still allowed for meaningful discussion and coordination. We appreciate the way that the PFMC and your excellent staff handled the webinar meetings, given the situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Cobble Tribes appreciates the opportunity to provide a perspective to the PFMC. Sincerely, uh, Rodney Costin, Chair of the Cobble Business Council. And uh, that concludes my testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Casey. Any questions for Casey? Thanks again, Casey. Thank you. Uh, that uh, concludes the reports that I see and will take us to public comment. Uh, there are two uh, folks who have turned in cards, uh, Dave Johnson and Ryan Johnson. So Dave, why don't you go first? Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Can you hear me okay? Good evening. Good evening. For the record, my name is Dave Johnson. I am the Washington State Recreational Rep for the SAS. And I just want to do some public testimony to show my support, along with Michael Sowen, the charter boat rep, and Ryan Johnson, the trolling rep for the SAS, for the trade and the deviation of the FMP. That concludes my statement. All right. Thank you, Dave. Any any questions for Dave? Thank you very much, Dave. Uh, Ryan Johnson, were you, uh, in case you have your own comment here. Just like to follow up uh, what Dave said, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, Ryan Johnson, the um, <clears throat> troll representative on the SAS and the troll sector also supports the trade. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ryan. Any questions for Ryan? Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, that concludes uh, public comment and takes us to uh, council discussion and action. Um, action here is uh, final recommendations. I'm probably not quoting that correctly. I don't have the um, sit sum in front of me. So we're to adopt final treaty Indian troll, non-Indian commercial and recreational ocean salmon fishery management, measure, management measures for submission to the Secretary of Commerce. And if necessary, identify and justify any regulations requiring implementation by emergency rule. So the floor is open for any discussion or any motions. Kyle Eddix. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you again to the council for your patience this week. Um, you know, we've been working through some difficult issues with North of Falcon Fisheries. The big one on our radar has been um, Queets Coho working into the early morning this morning. We found a fishery package that, that solved that issue, met our um, co-manager objectives and PSD obligations for that stock. We worked through the day and have, have inside fisheries that will resolve the remaining issues that were flagged in the SDT report for Puget Sound stocks. Um, we ran into a, a late snag on a question over a PST obligation for Grays Harbor Coho and have been working through the afternoon to try to resolve that. So 
at this moment, I don't have a motion to bring forward for the for the fishery package that is in front of the council. Um, we have meetings scheduled in within the next hour to try to resolve some of those issues. Um, so I don't want to um, stop South of Falcon motions from going forward, but would ask the council to consider um, one more last dose of patience here um, this evening as we try to work through the final issue for North of Falcon Fisheries. Thank you. Thank you, Kyle. Well, it doesn't sound like we'll have a North of Falcon motion at the moment. Uh, any further discussion on North of Falcon or any discussion or motions for South of Falcon? I can call on the states individually if you like. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I, I do have a motion for California. However, uh, and, I'm and I'm happy to offer it if it pleases the council. Uh, I'm just noting we'll need to return uh, at least it, it would appear so uh, for the purposes of final adoption north of Falcon. So I'll look to, to yourself and others if uh, for an answer to whether or not you'd like to entertain motions for the South Falcon area now. Um, well, I might seek the wise counsel of our executive director. I just, I'll just note that I've lost count of the number of times we've moved, moved the goalposts here to try to get a solution. And while it's very important that we do conclude North of Falcon, um, I also appreciate how valuable everyone's time is. And, um, you know, if we move the goalposts one more time and we have a solution, we'll all be happy. And if, if we don't, um, there may be a request to move, move the move the goalpost again. So, uh, let me ask Executive Director Chuck Tracy if he has any suggestions here. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, well, um, I guess my suggestion would be to actually uh, punt to uh, National Marine Fisheries Service and see what they their assessment of the status of. Uh, of the situation is and what uh, what they would like to consider uh, in terms of options for completing uh, this action. Okay, um, Susan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Tracy, could you repeat the the all, the choices? I guess I would say that you see on the table at this point. Thanks. Well, uh, so I think our I think we have. Uh, I guess the way I see it, we could uh, right now uh, adopt uh, for the final action on. Um, areas south of Cape Falcon, and then um, we could um, either come back at some point later this day uh, or night, uh, but uh, to take final action on North of Falcon if there's a likelihood that resolution can be achieved. Um, we cannot come back uh, with Council meeting after. Hey Chuck, your your audio is cutting in and out. Uh, what you're saying is really important. I want to make sure we catch all of it. Okay, thanks, Mr. Chair. Sorry about that. So, um, so we we so the options I see we could adopt uh, fi take final action on fisheries south of Cape Falcon now, and then come back. Uh, if there is an opportunity um, to come back to today sometime to wrap up north of Cape Falcon. Um, we cannot come back uh, after midnight under this uh, noticed council meeting. 
So if we uh, are going to fail to do that, then um, I, I guess the option that I, well, I guess another option would be to then schedule a, a, an emergency council meeting essentially to conclude action north of Cape Falcon. Um, so I guess those, <clears throat> those are kind of the options I see. I, I'm not uh, that intimately familiar with the issues or the uh, discussions that have been occurring. Um, so I, I would defer to others uh, on their thoughts about the probability of, of being able to uh, find a solution uh, today. Um, and uh, I, I guess I would be um, well, <laughs> disappointed, I guess, at the very least to, uh, you know, try and wait this out and uh, for a long period of time today. And certainly uh, even more disappointed if we did that and still were not able to uh, reach a conclusion uh, on this today. So that that's uh, that's about all I can uh, suggest at this point. It looks like there's some other hands up. Yeah, so Susan followed by Phil. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I will defer to the uh, other council members and um, then I'll, if there's anything left to say, I'll offer my perspective. Phil? Uh, well, I, uh, I, <laughs> I guess I would have appreciated if Susan has a perspective that she provides it. Um, I have one, but uh, I might be further informed by knowing what hers is. Susan? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, it seems to me that we have the pieces to get at least part of the puzzle put together and offer certainty in that area. Um, so I would say, I, I mean, I would suggest or propose that we complete the business with regard to South of Falcon. I remain optimistic that we will be able to find an agreement North of Falcon, um, but that we come back later and, um, uh, address address that one. I, I do have a question about quorum, um, making ensuring that there are, are enough people for us to take action if um, we're collectively successful at doing that. Be interested in others' perspectives. Thank you, Susan, that's helpful. So we could we could adopt South the Falcon now where we certainly have a quorum and then perhaps set a time one more time later this evening to see if sort of one last shot here to get north the falcon done but i want to know what the sense of the council is uh, because if we go too late we may lose quorum and that would be that would not be good. So, Susan, your hand is up. Do you have, I don't know if I cut you off or not. Susan, oh, hand is down. So let me, uh, Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, first of all, let me just say that I, I uh, very much appreciate um, everyone, my colleagues around the virtual table, as well as everyone else that's um, here to, to see what the council's decisions are about our 2021 salmon fisheries. And I appreciate uh, the uh, um, extreme patience that we've asked you to endure uh, from a North Falcon perspective. Um, uh, I am 
I am hopeful um, that you you will be willing um, to give us another chance, one more chance to try to wrap up this last issue. Um, I am fair. I am fairly knowledgeable about what it is, and I believe there is a solution um, to be had. Um, so, um, uh, again, I, I, I appreciate the patience. I'm hopeful that you'll give us uh, one more chance here to try to wrap this last one up. Um, there's lots of lots of people uh, in in the North Falcon process, just like there is in the South Falcon process. This has been working really hard on this, got a lot of time invested in it, and um, um, and it, it it would be I know they would all appreciate the council uh, giving us uh, just a little bit more time to see if we can resolve this last matter. Sure, thanks, Phil. Chris Kern. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, I don't have any great wisdom to offer on how to um, how to how to get to the end point here, um, but recognizing that there has been so much work and so much investment in this trying to bring this to resolution so far, uh, from my perspective, just for myself, uh, I'm committed to seeing this through as much as possible so the North of Falcon folks can get a, a fishery season wrapped up. Uh, with the current process, if at all possible. So I just thought I'd offer that. Um, thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Joe Oatman, followed by Brett Cormos. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think I'd like to, to echo um, comments from Phil, as well as uh, what Chris just provided. I think having uh, just a bit more additional time, I think would be really appreciated here for Dr. Falcon and trying to work to get that one wrapped up. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Brett Cormos. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> well, speaking for myself, I, uh, I'm hearing a couple of uh, bits of wisdom here that I think we should combine. Um, one is that uh, adopting south of falcon now does offer some certainty uh, for those fisheries or that area of the co council area of fisheries uh, going forward and i don't expect that will take a great deal of additional council time now uh, and in addition to that uh, i also am hearing and agreeing with our commitment uh, to seeing this through for the entirety of the coast and in particular in, in the north of Falcon area. And I echo that commitment and share that commitment and uh, certainly will uh, uh, commit to uh, being present at whatever point we choose to move final adoption for that portion of the coast uh, later this evening. Um, so uh, I think we could do both. And, uh, and that strikes me as maybe the, the best path forward. Uh, I'll look to others in the council to agree or disagree since I'm the one who originally posed this question, but I think that's where I stand at this point. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Bob Dooley. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks, Brett. And all the others that came before. I I agree. I mean, uh, I feel a responsibility personally, in my opinion only, that I'll be here till the till it take till it's done. I would hope that, you know, regardless of where a problem exists and the council has the ability to aid to get fishermen fishing and people to be able to do what they their lives depend on, that I mean, for the long run. So whatever it takes, I will be here and just tell me when and where. And I just, that's my opinion. So thank you. Thank you, Bob. Well, um, I have to say, I agree with everyone um, that we, we have to uh, provide an opportunity to get this done for the entire coast. Um, 
and that's sort of our job. Uh, but you know, we do need the the input um, that comes from the North Falcon process. So I, I'm prepared to set any time uh, to to resume to come back for North of Falcon. And well, I, I, I would expect we would adopt South of Falcon now, uh, but it it sort of becomes a a uh, the later we make it, the more time we provide for a solution, but the more likelihood that we may lose council members for purposes of a quorum. So I'd like to ask the council, maybe I should first ask, um, well, I'll, I'll go to Krista Svensson here in a second, but then I'd like to hear from uh, Kyle, perhaps, uh, about what time he thinks would be appropriate to come back for this last shot at getting it done. Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as I said, we've got a meeting scheduled pretty quickly here to, to dive further into this. And I know it's a balancing act of give us more time versus losing people. Um, I might suggest eight o'clock would be a, a time to reconvene and either we've reached a resolution and move forward or we figure out where to go outside of this meeting. Okay, um, let me ask around the table and see if people uh, make sure we, we have enough folks to accommodate that. Is there anyone who has a problem with that eight o'clock time? And I'm mindful of the fact that it's an hour later in Idaho. Okay, I'm not seeing any hands. So we will uh, uh, in a moment here uh, proceed with South of Falcon, but then we will um, have any other discussion folks want to have on this agenda item, and then we will break until uh, eight o'clock Pacific uh, to, as we hope and pray, to conclude the uh, North of Falcon process. So, um, any any discussion before we get motions from California and Oregon? All right, well, then I'll look to those states to raise their hands. Uh, Chris Kern, you want to go ahead? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I um, appreciate it. Being the state that's in the middle, it's very rare that I get to go first, uh, whether it be starting in the north or in the south. So I figured I'd get my hand up and take advantage of it. Well, we got to fix that. <laughs> uh, so I do have uh, a motion if, that, if you're ready for it. Uh, I think we're ready. So uh, hopefully Chris has it. Yes, there we go. Thank you. My move to adopt the non-Indian commercial and recreational salmon management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for the area from Cape Falcon, Oregon to the Oregon-California border as presented in agenda item D6A, supplemental STT report one, dated April 15th, 2021. All right, and the language on the screen there is accurate and complete? It is, thank you. And uh, God, we need a second. Brad Pettinger, thank you for the second. Please speak to your motion as necessary. Uh, not much necessary. I'll briefly say, given the time, um, uh, as we've already kind of reflected on, everybody's been working extremely hard this week, including the SAS, uh, other folks, staff, uh, council, and, and everybody, and uh, coupled with the difficulty of remote meetings and a difficult uh, process, um, thanks to everybody for making it work. Uh, so I will leave it at that in the interest of time. Thank you. All right, any uh, questions for Chris on his motion? Any discussion on the motion? Or I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, Brett for California. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, I have a motion as well, and we'll wait for it. There we go. 
I move the council adopt the 2021 non-Indian commercial and recreational salmon management measures for submission to the U.S. Secretary of Commerce for the area from the Oregon-California border to the U.S.-Mexico border as presented in agenda item D. 6A Supplemental STT Report 1, dated April 15, 2021, including the commercial and recreational requirements, definitions, restri restrictions, or exceptions. All right, and the language there is complete and accurate? Yes, it does. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For a second, seconded by Bob Dooley. Please speak to your motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, it has been a long week and a difficult process. Uh, we have stocks uh, south of Falcon that uh, are usually our bread and butter that are uh, relatively low abundance and have been for some time. In particular, Klamath River Fall Chinook was the most constraining stock in this year and certainly presented challenges in our area of the coast. Uh, thanks very much to the SAS, the STT, uh, our colleagues uh, in Oregon and in the north of Falcon area uh, and council staff for uh, putting together a fantastic meeting yet again. And uh, that, that, that is all. All right. Thank you, Brad. And I, I think I'll insert my thanks, the hard work of the STT and the SAS here. Um, any questions for the maker of the motion? All right, I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Brett. So there's South the Falcon. Um, as we agreed, uh, a few minutes ago, we're going to take a break, but before we do that, I want to see if there's any other business the council would like to discuss under this agenda item. Butch Smith. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you can stop me if I'm too far off the base, but um, just while we're on salmon, there was an important bill passed uh, yesterday in Washington State uh, recognizing Billy Frank to have a statue in the Hall of Statues in Washington, D.C. Um, I was proud I, I, I was asked to testify in, in one of the hearings, um, but I think it's a, it's a good, good day recognizing a, a person who worked so hard in Salmon uh, for, his, for the tribes, and then when that was all done, you know, reached out his hand and said, now how do we work together? So I'd just like, like to recognize that to the council and, and report that. I, I uh, think it's uh, not only a proud day for the tribes of the Northwest and maybe the United States, but but certainly a, a, a proud day for the non-tribal people too that uh, work so hard to to uh, build the relationships back up after after all the all the stuff that happened in the in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So I just wanted to recognize that and give a shout out that uh, this is a this is a good deal. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Butch, for that. Uh, anything further from the council? All right. Um, before we take our break, uh, Chuck, well, first let me go to Robin and see if we're missing anything aside from what we hope to get at 8 p.m. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, I think you have done what you can do at this point. So thanks for checking in. All right. So Chuck, any, uh, any words of uh, wisdom for us before we take our dinner break? Chuck, we're not hearing you. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, no, no particular words of wisdom. Just uh, wanna thank people for their dedication and willing to stick this out. <clears throat> And, uh, and make it happen the way it should. Um, so uh, I guess we'll just look forward to seeing you back here at uh, eight o'clock. All right. All right, thanks everyone. Uh, go have dinner, but don't have too much to drink. We got some business to finish up at eight. We'll see you then. <laughs>